entitled Fentanyl Strategies and Treatment. My name is Jim McGreevy, and on behalf of the New Jersey Reentry Corporation, I just want to say thank you for being here today, and thank you for your patience in navigating New Jersey's traffic. And now, at this time, it's a great honor to introduce someone who is senior advisor to the provost. Um, Dr. Pritchard has been a long member of the Seton Hall University community, and I ask him to join with us to call us into prayer. We welcome you all to the uh, Seton Hall campus this morning, and we pray that indeed our gathering will yield some very positive results. We know that there are many uh, perhaps faith traditions in the room, so what I normally like to do is as I open a prayer, I open with silence, which allows each of us to seek your sacred space before I begin uh, my prayer. We will now observe a moment of silence before I start my prayer. Oh, Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning as humbly as we know how. We acknowledge you as the author, the creator and sustainer of the entire universe. It is from your vivid imagination that indeed everything that we see, everything that we can feel, Everything that we can utilize has come from your vivid imagination. Both man and woman have cometh from you. You made our bodies to function with ease. But the clouds of darkness have come across the land. Fentanyl stands like a mighty giant. And you call us to the battlefield, just as you did little David, who with his humble tools and his skills, he was able to knock down that major giant. So we pray that as the dark shadow is cast across the land, you will equip, you will empower, and you will provide for us associates and the skills necessary for this journey into darkness. Our brothers and our sisters who are impacted are relying upon us. We are the beloved community of the Dr. Martin Luther King. We are those who can pull people out of the pit of hell through our collaborations, our skills, and our resources. So we evoke your presence. We ask you to come into this room through your spirit so that indeed we become empowered. We become laser focused and we will not be defeated. You have told us that indeed there will be moments in life that we'll be walking to the valleys of the shadow of death but you will walk with us. You will provide us with that which is necessary. We call upon your strength, your insight, and your guidance as we step upon the battlefield to save, to restore, rehabilitate, and return these citizens to their rightful place in our society. We ask for your blessings. We ask for your love, we ask for your grace, and we ask for your mercy. We send this prayer forward in your name, amen. Thank you, Reverend. And I, I, I just wanted to say thank you to Reverend Pritchard because when after he prayed, then everybody started walking in. So, um, but in a special way, you know, for the New Jersey Reentry Corporation, approximately seventy-seven percent of the people we are privileged to work with have a history of alcoholism and addiction. About forty-two percent co-occurring mental health disorders. But fentanyl has been a radical game changer in our work. And how do we approach this? 
So what we will see today is that you'll have an opportunity to hear from leading experts in the field, not only medical, not only physicians and legislators and treatment providers and people on the front lines. And so I'd like to call upon our Director of Operations, Robert Carter, who will share with you his own sense of the importance of this event and what it means to him and to our clients. Robert Carter. Good morning. <clears throat> My name is Robert Carter and I would like to uh, thank and welcome everyone to the New Jersey Reentry Corporation's First Addiction Conference. Uh, as Jim stated, I serve as a director of operation for NJRC. And uh, when we first spoke about creating this event, I, I was hesitant. I had never undertaken anything like this before, but um, the more we discussed it over the next few weeks, the, the sooner I realized that it needed to be done. Um, first, uh, let me share with you, I, I, I've struggled with addiction my entire life. Uh, as a youth, it was a lifestyle, but it quickly graduated to using. And in the end, I was shooting heroin and cocaine every day until I was locked up for the turned out to be 60th time. Um, I grew up with a great family. My father was a North fireman. My mother was a teacher's aide. Uh, there, I had no reason whatsoever to live the life that I did. But um, like I said, at the end, you know, by the time I got clean, I had racked up over 60 arrests and nine felony convictions. You know, the sad part is that my story is no different than so many of the people that have come before and after me. Um, I was one of the fortunate ones, you know, to get clean and to make it out alive just, just for today. And when I, when I was using, you know, it was a while ago, so we would occasionally hear about people overdosing. You know, sometimes they, they, would, they would pass. But truth be told, I, I can tell you the name of every single person that I knew that died when I was using, you know, of an overdose. Um, what I can tell you is the last time I went a week without hearing about someone that, that passed away from this addiction, whether it was a friend or someone from a 12-step fellowship, work, treatment, you know, a, a family member of a friend. <clears throat> the only thing I knew about fentanyl back then were uh, I would hear about patches, you know, and that, that was it. No one was using fentanyl regularly, you know, when I was using. Uh, but the truth is now everybody knows that fentanyl's in everything. Uh, marijuana, cocaine, crack, methamphetamine, and of course heroin. You know, dealers are mixing it with everything to become, you know, to make it more addictive, to create more addicts that are dependent on it physically. As a using addict, you know, when I was using, like I said, you didn't overdose all that often, but you would chase those bags that had the good dope. Nowadays, you don't know what you get, and you don't know if what you're going to get is going to kill you. And when you work in treatment, that individual that walks in and wants treatment, they can't even tell you how bad the addiction is that you needed it, that you need to, to treat. Like they don't, they don't even know what it is they've been using or how much of. It. In, 2000 and, <clears throat> in 2006, at the age of 28, I was fortunate enough to get clean, you know, and I watched it as fentanyl has drastically changed the landscape of addiction. I worked in treatment, and, and I watched the effect that it had on our population physically, mentally, and spiritually. Now, I would do intakes with, with guys that would come in off the street, you know, for detox, and, you know, Physically, it took a toll on you out there using a lot of the guys, you know, they were homeless or whatever. But the time it took them to come back mentally was something I had never seen that before. You know, like, they, they weren't even there. And they wanted to come back, but they didn't know how. And they, I would sit and I would talk to them in detox, and they would tell me, like, Rob, I, got, I, I don't know. It's like it, it's, it messes with my brain. Like, and these are guys that I, I knew some of them I used with. You know, usually three, four days, you bounce right back. But that's just not the case anymore, you know. The process of detox and treatment has, 
has completely changed since the synthetic opioid became so readily available and the overdose deaths continue to rise significantly every year. And for 2015 to 2020, over 15,314 individuals died from overdoses in New Jersey. 9,500 of them were from opioids, were from fentanyl. So I'm fortunate, uh, uh, along with being the Director of Operations for NJRC, I also serve as a Director of Addiction Services. So I, um, I'm fortunate enough to have the opportunity to place people in treatment within 24 hours. Anybody looking for detox, residential, medically assisted treatment, whatever, we can place you within 24 hours. Um, being involved in a 12-step fellowship, you know, having many friends who still work in treatment and doing the work I do with the population we serve, I continue to hear and experience the struggle of serving the broader treatment for those who suffer from addiction. You know, despite the best efforts from government bodies, treatment facilities, doctors, therapists, counselors, and I would say most importantly, family members, the overdose numbers continue to rise at an alarming rate, and we need to do something more to help prevent this from occurring. Addiction touches everyone from all walks of life. It doesn't care who you are or how successful you may be, where you come from, and whether or not you even want to use. Like I gotta remember using it against my own will at the end, you know? That so once it has you, it doesn't let go. You know, and it's up to that individual to make the decision to ask for help. Now I talk about it all the time, like this window of willingness that we see with the clients that come into NJRC. Sometimes it's a day, sometimes it's a week, sometimes it's hours when they make a decision to turn their lives around. And it's up to us to be there to support them in the best way that we can in that moment. Because if you're not there to support them and we can't do the best we can for them, there's a good opportunity you're gonna lose them. The reason why I wanted to create this conference is to bring everyone together to hear and discuss all the obstacles we face every single day. From all facets of treatment, you know, the medical field, legislative, and to just, you know, and, and to better assist the people, you know, every single day that, that we, we, choose to, we choose to serve. So I, I mean this when I say I want to thank everybody, you know, for their passion and dedication you know, they bring to the field that they serve. And um, I don't know, my, my hope is that, like, you know, we can all learn from each other today and, and help save as many lives as we can. You know, like, you know, my, my brother currently is um, he's incarcerated. He's coming home soon. He suffers from addiction, mental health, you know. And, and sometimes if I could give him what I had to start over, I would. You know, I mean that. The reality is that I can't. And a lot of the times he doesn't want to hear from me because we're used together, you know? So the only people that could help him are the people that are involved in his life. And whether it be counselors or outpatient or, you know, he's going to be a member of a recovery court. And, you know, I don't know. But thank you everybody again for coming out. And that's it. So, I, I just want to say thank you to Rob and thank you for what he does every day. We're really proud of NJRC and I see James out there from Patterson. I see a lot of friends. But what we try to do is within 24 hours, we will get anyone into detox, into residential treatment, into IOP or induction and medication assisted treatment. And I just wanted to let everyone know that Rob got a special haircut for today. And Rob, in addition to Dr. Bachman and my sister, it was the Reverend that was standing for you. So it's pretty good company. Um, you know, part of, part of this challenge is to have great partners. And one of the things that's really special for me is on the state level, we have someone who not only shepherded the state of New Jersey and helped provide for leadership during the pandemic, but also as commissioner of the Department of Human Services, oversees perhaps the widest 
breadth of government operations in our state, whether it's childcare, older adults, individuals with disabilities, and of course, mental health and addiction services for which we are here today. But Sarah Edelman has not only done a tremendous job in terms of leading the Department of Human Services, and previously served as Deputy Commissioner, overseeing a realm of departments, but she also previously served, as her biography states, as Vice President of the New Jersey Association of Health Plans, Chief of Staff of the New Jersey Healthcare Quality Institute, as well as her philanthropic work. So what the Commission of what Sarah is committed to is not only service, but best practices, and looking longitudinally as to what works and what doesn't work. And so we're blessed in the state of New Jersey with the leadership of the governor, but particularly here today, the commissioner who's willing to engage in these challenges to understand that fentanyl in many ways is different than heroin and requires a more nuanced approach as the treatment and quick and rapid addressing of the crisis. And we're gonna hear that shortly from a great panel of physicians. But spearheading the government response to this is our commissioner of the Department of Human Services, Sarah Edelman. Good morning, everyone. While I set up my slides here, um, I want to just begin. Trauma, pain, poverty, a failed war on drugs, growing up in a community where it's easier to find illicit substances than fresh fruits and vegetables how our brains are wired, diagnosed and undiagnosed mental illness, lack of affordable access to care and medications to treat mental illness, a medical system that communities of color fear and mistrust because they feel the scars of history, a medical system that prescribed people into this crisis, pharmaceutical greed, an injury at work, a high school party. There are countless ways, countless pathways to substance use, misuse, and addiction. So it is reasonable to agree that there are also different pathways to recovery. There are different methods of effective treatment and that people's goals and motivations are different. But there are some universal truths that we acknowledge in this work. One life lost is one too many. Every person's life has value. Every person is worthy of dignity. Shame is a noisy and heavy burden. And our systems don't always work well for people. And as a leader in government, I think it's really important that I say these things out loud it's also really important to me that it's more than just lip service. So this morning, I want to thank each of you for being here, for your compassion and commitment to this work. It is not easy work. You are frontline heroes in your own right. And I thank you for being a part of this shared mission to save lives together. So let's get started. Next slide. I'm going to just start with a, a bit of a look at overdose data. So we're all working from the same data points this morning. Uh, next slide. In 2020, which is the last year where we have complete uh, data, can you guys hear me okay? Is this better? In 2020, the, there were over 2,800 drug-related deaths in New Jersey. And you can see in the map, on the left here, the highest number of deaths are understandably associated with our most populated cities, um, Jersey City, Newark, and Camden. 
But if you look at the per capita rates of drug-related deaths in the map on the right, you'll see this epidemic is more harshly impacting our southern region and more rural areas throughout the southern counties. And we know there are a variety of reasons for this, smaller communities, greater distances between access points and treatment, lack of widely available public transportation, um, a number of things contribute to this disparity. In the next slide, you'll see annual suspected drug deaths by month. It's important it, as we think about solutions um, that we monitor trends over time. And this month to month um, data shows that totals have oscillated throughout the pandemic. It is encouraging to see that while there may have been slight decreases um, throughout, throughout the last several years, we're beginning to see um, consistent decreases in month over month totals of suspected drug deaths. Um, and we are seeing potentially lower annual trends for 2022. Next slide. Here in this chart, I'm sure this is challenging to see, each of these lines represents a county in New Jersey. Um, this was in 2015. What you see in this data is that heroin and cocaine were the leading substances causing overdose death in 2015. And fentanyl was present, but was a really distant third across the state. When you fast forward five years later, next slide to 2020, we see that fentanyl is the leading substance causing overdose in every single county uh, and, and uh, by a significant margin. Um, in the next slide, you'll see that data presented a little bit differently just to, to really drive home the point that fentanyl overdoses have um, rapidly outpaced all other types of overdose and have increased the level of overdose significantly. We know fentanyl is much more potent and lethal. Um, it is 50 times more potent than heroin and 100 times more potent than morphine. So we see um, in the next slide here that these drug-related deaths are affecting every age group uh, and demographic across our state. What you don't see here, but what is also true is that overdoses have continued to climb um, more acutely in communities of color. And here in the next slide, you just once again see illustrated the quick rise of fentanyl in the last few years. Um, and according to the New Jersey Medical Examiner's Office, fentanyl is far away the leading substance to monitor and address in the state and uh, across the country. And so I wanna talk this morning about what we're doing to address this um, throughout the state and in our response throughout the state. So you'll see in the next slide, uh, Governor Murphy and our administration have really tried to tackle this in a whole of government approach. If you could hear me in my opening remarks, um, there it is a whole of government, whole of society. Many issues lead us to this challenge. And so it requires a whole of government response to address it. Uh, and so the the governor has brought together state agencies that have not historically been part of the solution to be a part of the solution going forward. And knowing where we are, um, there's a lot of work to be done, but we at Human Services are working with departments across the state really around uh, a few core goals. Number one, increasing access to treatment, harm reduction, and prevention programs in our communities and reducing barriers to all of these things enhancing the recovery uh, process and enhancing recovery supports, implementing robust law enforcement to stem the supply of illicit drugs, and strengthening data-driven work and system-wide infrastructure. Um, our goal is to meet people what, where they're at and offer a no wrong door approach to care. And we're working hand in hand with our law enforcement partners to strengthen um, our our data and evidence-based work to help curb this epidemic. So next I'm gonna go into um, some highlights of the work that we're doing. And you'll see in the next slide, um, there has been significant funding for this work. We are fortunate in New Jersey to have both federal and state funds to commit to um, all of our efforts. And you'll see here in FY20 and 21, we had additional COVID related federal block grant dollars um, to help us bring more funding to the crisis in, uh, throughout the pandemic. 
Um, so we have been, as many of you have been, strong advocates to the federal government to help keep this funding coming. Um, and we have certainly had the support of the governor and the legislature to maintain the state dollars for this important work. Um, these are the funds that fund many of your organizations and the interventions that I'll talk about this morning. So in the next slide, I want to, if we can, if technology will be our friend, I want to give you a sneak peek here. We're in the midst of launching an updated campaign to promote Reach and J. Um, Reach and J is our addiction treatment helpline here in New Jersey, 1-844-REACH-N-J. It's a central call line for New Jersey residents who are looking for help with substance use disorder, for family members and friends who are looking for assistance, for their loved ones. Each call is answered by a live trained staff, a person who will screen callers to identify their needs and help provide referrals to support services and treatment. And this is available 24 seven uh, to New Jersey residents of all age and regardless of insurance status or ability to pay. And one of the things that we've seen a meaningful impact in access to treatment is just making sure that people know about it. These government programs are, um, are only as helpful if people know that they're here. And so it's important that we, um, that we get the word out. And so we've put a lot of money into marketing and helping reach people across all platforms. So um, you all are getting a sneak peek of our latest campaign, which is launching in the next month, if, if this works. Um, Lacey, and if you can try to play the first ad on the left. I need someone to talk to. All parents are seeking so much for me. Addiction. I need someone to talk to. All parents are seeking so much for me. Addiction is putting me and my baby at risk. Then I heard about 844 HNJ. I tried following the dosage, but needed more of a feeling of relief. I'm getting the help I need to take my life back. 844 HNJ was the call I needed to make. I'm glad I made the call. I made the call. I made the call. Thank you. Um, part of the what we are bringing to this marketing campaign is to try to reduce stigma around addiction. I think a lot of the market research that we've done in this effort has really been about helping people understand the faces behind this crisis in new and different ways. And so um, each of the ads that we're launching uh, in the next month will, will sort of bring different faces to this um, conversation and, and hopefully raise awareness. And we receive thousands of calls a year to this helpline and have been able to connect um, uh, thousands of people to services over the years that's been operating. In the next slide, I wanna talk a little bit about naloxone. Um, for those of you in this work, you likely know naloxone, or sometimes that's referred to as Narcan, is one of the most effective harm reduction interventions that we have today. And so we have been focused and committed to expanding the access to naloxone and getting it as, in as many hands as possible. So um, under Governor Murphy, we have been able to um, create a new naloxone distribution program, which launched earlier this summer. It's a, it's a website portal um, that we've launched in partnership with the Department of Health and the Office of the Attorney General. And this allows eligible agencies to request direct shipments of naloxone nasal spray at any time they need it. Um, and it ships automatically from the manufacturer. And this, in the um, just a few months that this has been up and running, we have distributed thousands and thousands of doses that are getting out to the community through many of the organizations in this room. So we thank you for your partnership in this, and we're glad to be able to provide faster, um, uh, less barrier access. Uh, eligible agencies include first responders, harm reduction centers, um, community partners uh, that, are part, that are contracted with our department, um, like peer recovery centers, county prosecutor offices, libraries, OTPs, reentry programs, and shelters. Um, and as I said, we've distributed over 162,000 uh, two-dose kits of naloxone um, just since, just in the last couple of months. So this new relationship and is funded through federal grant dollars and will allow for year-round supply 
of naloxone for participating eligible agencies. In the next slide, you'll see that we're also doing work to bring naloxone to communities. Um, we, just as an example, earlier this uh, summer also uh, partnered with the Trenton Thunder to bring the first naloxone giveaway um, event in, in MLB history. So this is just one way that we are showing as an example to the rest of the nation that um, it makes sense to bring naloxone to communities across the country um, uh, exactly where they are. In the next uh, slide, I'll talk a bit about some of the, the things we've tried to do in the FY23 budget to help stabilize the um, treatment providers and agencies and the workers in our community. I mean, not unlike the rest of the country and other parts of the world, we are facing really challenging, uh, a really ch challenging labor market. People, especially the frontline workforce um, in this room, in your agencies and in this work, were at the front line putting their lives at risk all throughout COVID and burnout is real. Um, we are all facing our own challenges coming out of the pandemic and people have decided to um, uh, take a break from their work, to move on to other things, um, to, to sort of deal with their burnout. People early in COVID left the workforce and haven't returned. There are a variety of challenges that have um, exacerbated what was already not a, a robust enough workforce to meet all of the needs that people have, both in the mental health and substance use space. We do not have the workforce to meet all of the demand and this um, pandemic has only further exacerbated that. And so as a state, we are trying to help stabilize the industry as much as possible and bring um, innovative approaches to bringing new people into the workforce. Part of what I'll highlight this morning is that our budget included nearly $40 million in state and federal funds for salary increases for uh, direct care staff for community-based mental health and substance use disorder providers across the state, both those contracted and, uh, and uh, with our Division of Mental Health and Addiction Services um, and those paid through our Medicaid program. Next slide. We've also launched some other exciting initiatives I want to highlight for you all um, this year. So the first is that we launched a new incentive program, a contingency management initiative for individuals who have addiction to stimulants um, uh, like cocaine, crack, and methamphetamine. And this program provides um, incentives to participants in the program to keep them, to help keep them in treatment, things like gift cards, for instance. Um, and we know that these kinds of interventions work for some individuals. And so we have awarded uh, five agencies with grants to pilot this program. In the next slide, we also launched an, uh, two new programs using our state opioid response grant dollars around cultural competency and peer recovery support. So the first program is a cultural competency training program that where we provided grants to develop and provide training, coaching, and consultation services to leadership at o OTPs across the state to help narrow the treatment gap that we very clearly see in data um, for, uh, for persons of color who are diagnosed with opioid and stimulant use disorder. We see um, that the Black and Hispanic populations are accessing treatment less, and when they are accessing treatment, they're leaving it earlier. And so these, these kinds of training programs can help address um, uh, gaps in cultural competency that can help address these challenges. We've also uh, launched a new program with nine agencies for startup of small-scale recovery centers to provide peer-to-peer -peer recovery support services to prevent the recurrence of substance use and to help promote sustained recovery. Next slide. Mobile outreach continues to be an incredibly important strategy. I talked earlier about meeting people where they're at, and often in this work we mean that figur figuratively, but we also mean it literally. Um, the program, this program is designed to increase access to medications for SUD, um, buprenorphine, naloxone, naltrexone, methadone, and others. 
Um, and this program is through OTPs that are offering mobile case management re and recovery support services and um, uh, really using mobile vehicles, mobile vans to go to people where they are in the community um, to target communities that may not otherwise traditionally be able to access treatment services. And we have a program with two agencies um, where we're working with OTPs to expand their reach through, through mobile targeted specifically at homeless individuals and those at risk of homelessness. Next slide. We're also working to increase accessibility for individuals who may not be able to access treatment traditionally because of um, language barriers, including uh, sign language. So we translated this year the ASAM Opioid Addiction Treatment Booklet into American Sign Language to increase access for deaf and hard of hearing individuals. And we believe this is the first place in the country where this has been done. Um, we, next slide. We're also working, many of you may be aware of a pilot program we launched with law enforcement, with the Attorney General's Office and the Department of Children and Families. This is a new pilot program to help train law enforcement officers and community stakeholders on how to recognize and interact with children and families affected by addiction and to, to help connect them to care. There is often um, something we don't focus on in addiction is how, especially for, for parents and guardians with addiction, how this impacts um, uh, children in their family. And so providing services to support children um, who may experience trauma from, from addiction. And next slide. We also launched this year um, in partnership with Shatterproof and Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, Atlas. Atlas is a free confidential online tool that connects New Jerseyans in need with appropriate addiction treatment care and delivers user-friendly information about the quality and the services available through a provider. And this, if you haven't had a chance to go to the Atlas website yet, I really encourage you to do this. This is a phenomenal resource. Um, if you are a provider in the room that has not yet begun to participate with Atlas, I really encourage you to do that. This was really born out of the fear and frustration of a family who needed to access services and didn't know where to start, didn't know who the, the best provider was, didn't know which providers could offer which services to best support their loved one. And so, um, so we were very grateful for this public-private partnership to bring Atlas to New Jersey and to make this a resource for uh, individuals and their families. We also, next slide, continue um, uh, to distribute medication lockboxes around the state, which we know help um, decrease the risk of misuse of prescription medications. Next. And we continue the work that we've been doing over the last five years to uh, reduce and eliminate barriers to medication-assisted treatment, um, including removing prior authorization from insurance for medication-assisted treatment, um, requiring residential treatment facilities that receive Medicaid payment to provide access to MAT, and launching a county jail initiative to provide MAT for opioid addiction and to connect commu uh, community treatment during reentry. This is, again, part of our whole of government, no wrong door, all hands on deck approach to connect folks to treatment um, using medication to treat OUD. Next slide. And for all of the pain and trauma of COVID, one thing I will say is that it helped launch government uh, forward probably by decades in some respects. And in one of those, it was that we needed to adjust our programs to ensure that continued access to counseling and treatment was available. And we did that through technology. And sometimes government is slow to adopt new technology systems. Sometimes our systems are built in old legacy mainframes, and this was a huge um, win for us. We were able to make access through telehealth and, and virtual treatment available to New Jerseyans, and um, as long as we are continued uh, to per and permitted by the federal and state government to continue this, we will continue to make it available. Um, next slide. We also continue to fund our centers of excellence um, 
uh, for MAT at uh, Rutgers and um, Cooper Medical School at Rowan. And we, I know you'll hear from some of these partners in panels later today to talk about the incredible work that they're doing. But one of the, the core functions that this helps support um, across the state is to provide access uh, to buprenorphine and uh, other treatment for individuals who are uninsured and not eligible for Medicaid or other insurance products, um, as well as to, to uh, be a, a, a center of excellence for other providers across the state who are looking for support or opportunities for a referral. Next slide. Here you see uh, an emphasis on some of the treatment prevention and recovery support and training programs that our division um, continues to fund mm -hmm. that I, I didn't touch on for um, for time purposes, but there is so much good work happening across our department. We are really um, uh, able to bring data and resources um, to help connect treatment providers, to help connect across government, um, and to help fund the work of your organizations. But, but really, all of what we do is not possible without you all in this room, and I thank you again um, for that work. In the next slide, um, uh, next slide. We're also continuing our implementation of MAT behind the walls. Um, MAT in jails has been gradual and steady. This initial pilot began in Atlantic County in 2017, and this is a collaboration between our department, OTPs, jails, judges, prosecutors' offices, um, where, where the state and the Medicaid program is helping fund uh, treatment behind the walls and then after release in the community. And medication provided to inmates behind the walls um, uh, using a mobile van. Um, and what we see is really promising data through that work. 78% of individuals continued MAT post-release and it is through organizations like the Reentry Corporation and our other partners on the ground that really help make this possible. Um, uh, next. Sarah, can you talk a little about that? So, just I just want to get you know, there's a crisis for a lot of us that people that were grappling with MAT in the community when they were arrested and they went to county jail, they would not be treated as a bottom. And thanks to the leadership of the commissioners, they were able to coordinate so that now, folks, and Dr. Gloria Bachman, our medical director, is perfectly aware of this so that persons are getting Suboxone in jail, because the concern was if they get it in jail and a script when they're released, because if we didn't want them necessarily, and I see uh, Dr. Calvetti from the Department of Corrections, we didn't want them to necessarily go to heroin fentanyl in the community. You just want to talk about that? Yep, that's exactly right. So historically, um, the, the Department of Corrections would have had inmates engage in withdrawal management protocol um, what we saw happening in, in partnership with DOC and our partners across government as we looked at the data was that after individuals were released from incarceration, individuals who used drugs would do so at the same level that they did prior to their incarceration, leading to overdose and overdose deaths. And the way that we um, treated individuals during their incarceration, the way that we helped prepare them for um, release going back to the community, it was absolutely critical. And, um, and that really bore out a lot of the work that we do here. So if you, here we go. So in this slide, you'll see um, uh, that with the expertise of DOC, they've made MAT available in all prison facilities and have created a real continuum of SUD levels of treatment available in the prisons. And our, Depart our Department of Health colleagues have provided support and expertise in data sharing and matching across systems. Um, so we are able to fund um, uh, with state dollars, with store dollars, uh, treatment behind the walls, and then using Medicaid treatment to continue following release. And in the next slide, you'll see a little bit more of the, the point the governor was just making. The program pairs peer health navigators um, with inmates incarcerated in correctional facilities who have an SUD, and six months prior to an individual's release, 
Uh, they're meeting with their peer health navigators to begin building a relationship, building trust, and to develop a plan to help them re-enter and maintain their recovery. So um, you can see here uh, uh, that there have been a total of 3,678 referrals to date since we began this program a few years ago. Um, and, and are really seeing, as I said at the beginning, the promise of this upon release with 78% of individuals maintaining um, MAT after release. And so next I wanna talk about some of what comes next in this work. Um, and particularly uh, as uh, with regards to the, the opioid settlement. So you all know um, there is a federal opioid settlement in New Jersey has participated with the Attorney General's support of this. Um, every single eligible county and municipality agreed to participate in the settlement, which means New Jersey is getting the maximum amount available to us. We'll be receiving $641 million from the settlement. Um, and then there are some other settlements where we'll also be receiving other smaller amounts. But the state is going to receive half of that funding. The other half will be going directly to the counties um, that participated in the settlement. And the settlement outlines a number of things that this, this funding has to be spent on in treatment and prevention and recovery um, and various strategies to combat this epidemic. But um, we want to make sure that the funds both at the state level and the local level are going towards critical investments in harm reduction centers, treatment programs, and data-driven strategies to help end the crisis. And this, um, th these funds we know will help bolster the work that's already underway. Um, in the next slide, the governor, oh, you can, uh, you can skip through to the next slide, sorry. The governor has established two primary methods through our department for the public and stakeholders to provide input on the best use of this funding. And this, I really want this to be a call to action for you all this morning. Um, the first is the establishment of an Opioid Recovery and Remediation Fund Advisory Council. We announced this a couple of weeks ago. Um, and the, our department will be chairing this group. I will be chairing this group with a number of experts and individuals with um, lived experiences and a variety of backgrounds that are important in addiction treatment and public health. And um, we will be listening to folks from the public through listening sessions, but we are also creating and, and have now launched an online portal to give members of the public the opportunity to weigh in on how the state should be using these funds. And we really, this is a call to any of you, to the people in your programs. Um, we we have been able to do a lot of incredible things. It would be helpful for us to hear feedback from, um, from people th in communities throughout the state, what is working, what is not working, what worked in your recovery journey that you wanna make sure everyone has access to, what are the things that should have been in place um, on the prevention side that may have kept you from beginning to use, all of these questions that can help us improve outcomes for the future. We really want to hear from folks directly, so we invite individuals to please provide that feedback through this online portal. It's open right now until October 31st. Um, we, because this funding is being received annually for several years, we will continue to reopen the portal annually as we think about how the funding should be spent in the following year. So um, again, please visit nj.gov slash opioid funds to provide uh, feedback and, um, and more information will be coming as well about opportunities to testify and speak before the advisory council. In the next slide, um, I wanna just highlight more specifically some things that are happening in the harm reduction space. And if, if um, you could hear me in the beginning, I think one of the things I was hoping to emphasize is that every person's pathway to um, use and misuse and addiction is different, and people's pathways to recovery also don't look the same. It is a process, and harm reduction is a critical part of the recovery process for many individuals. And so I talked a bit about naloxone distribution. In the next slide, you'll see um, we have, uh, we've done some important work as a state to help 
um, make it easier for naloxone to be distributed, including permitting standing orders, allowing pharmacists to dispense naloxone, um, and uh, Medicaid and state-regulated health insurance that's required to cover it without prior authorization. Um, we have done giveaway events at pharmacies and, and public places. We've created this online distribution portal that I talked about, um, and we have uh, provided hundreds of thousands of naloxone kits statewide. This is working, um, but there is lots more to do in the harm reduction space, and in the next slide, you'll see um, just a highlight of some of the low threshold programs in New Jersey and low barrier um, approaches. And this is an alternative approach that emphasizes medication access, engagement, and treatment retention through same day treatment entry using a harm reduction approach um, and allowing flexibility and promoting wide availability. And through this program, medication is provided regardless of insurance or income, and maintenance medication is delivered um, without arbitrary tapering or time limits, which we know is uh, also a critical issue. Um, and buprenorphine began also in harm reduction centers. It started in 2019 in two locations, providing same-day access to bup um, through prescription, medical assessment, and medical education and uh, includes weekly case management. So these programs are still, some of them in their nascent stages, that, uh, where we hope to continue to expand this kind of access statewide. Next slide. That brings me to the end. I really want to thank you all again for the opportunity to be with you for the work that you are doing in communities across the state. None of what we do at the government level um, it is really possible in changing people's lives without the work that you do in the community. So, Governor, um, to your organization at the Reentry Corporation, to your leadership, I'm deeply grateful for our partnership. Um, and to each of you, I, I share the same. Thank you all, and I wish you an excellent conference this morning. You're going to hear from a lot of great people. Thank you all. We have a round of applause for our commissioner. She did a phenomenal job. And um, when, when we had some real challenges making sure that people that were court involved had access to MAT, uh, the commissioner was there in a powerful way, not only in terms of presumptive eligibility and increasing access, but making sure there was a linkage between corrections and jail programs in the community. And this doesn't happen by accident. So I'm just effusive in my recognition and my gratitude because I need somebody at the top to make sure that it happens. Can we have one more round of applause, sir? Thank you. I'm so now we have now we have the gang who had the best SATs in high school. I would ask the doctors to please join with us at this time. And uh, I also want to give a round of applause to uh, Senator Testa, who came from Cumberland County. And our Bergen County prosecutor is here, but he didn't come as far as Senator Testa. And gee, let's have a round of applause for the great Senator from Burlington. She's so respectful, it's close to my heart. So we have all this high priced talent. I'm going to ask what the student debt ratio is for medical school these days. Um, but the first thing I'd like to do is Dr. Nelson, who spends a lot of time at Rutgers in Newark at the emergency department. Doc, could you just tell us what you see um, by virtue of fentanyl and what's happening? I mean, uh, j thank you for, for asking. Uh, you know, the... Um, the, the landscape has changed a lot over the. Uh, a if you lot just get closer to the mic, I'm sorry. The landscape has changed a lot over the last, you know, seven to ten years, as everybody knows. As fentanyl has been really taken hold in the uh, quote unquote heroin supply in in the state. Um, we in our ED, just like every ED probably across the state and country, have seen a, a significant increase in the number of people come in um, with opioid overdose. Um, we, you know, we. Um, we also see 
uh, as you've heard a little bit earlier uh, from the commissioner about uh, the uh, expanded use of, of buprenorphine in the emergency department, uh, through that and through the, the clinics that we run, we've seen more difficulty getting people started on buprenorphine in particular. And even to some extent methadone, because of the depth of dependence that people develop, um, the, the, the lack of quality has been, that was commented on uh, earlier by the first speaker as well has just led to this lack of ability to control the dose that people are taking. So because of all those factors put together, the, the numbers of patients that we see in the ED, not to mention the numbers who don't come in because they get naloxone administered on the street and don't take EMS or present to the emergency department, have just skyrocketed. And I think everybody here knows that. Uh, the numbers that were presented by the commissioner bear that out as well. The number of people who are dying uh, of fentanyl um, and uh, are seeking care have just uh, has skyrocketed. So if I jump to Dr. Chen. Doctor, um, could you just share with us your sense as uh, from a pharmacological perspective of what's happening uh, in the community, what's happening on the street? And you have to borrow mic, Dr. Baxter, he'll give it up. Well, thank you so much for having me here. I'm actually not a medical doctor. I'm yes. a clinical pharmacist, so appreciate being in part of this panel. Um, in terms of the community, you know, I know we have a lot of, a lot of incentives, a lot of initiatives, I should say, to increase access to treatment with buprenorphine, more prescribers. And that's a lot of the work that we're doing in the centers of excellence that the commissioner mentioned. Uh, but what we're seeing also is issues with access in pharmacies. And I think um, that's been a major- What does that mean? Could you explain what that means? It just means that patients are bringing their prescriptions to the pharmacy, but then the pharmacy could be out of stock or the pharmacy does not want to dispense it. Um, and a lot of it has to do because buprenorphine is a controlled substance. And because it's a controlled substance, you know, pharmacists have this corresponding responsibility if they fill a prescription that might not be for a legitimate use, such as diversion, you know, really under the DEA, uh, pharmacists are feeling that pressure. Um, then they have a corresponding responsibility that, uh, that their license could be lost or things like that if they help, you know, push or fuel a lot of the the opioid crisis and they feel that buprenorphine is part of that. So what a lot of what we're trying to do and in terms of the community is really education, education of pharmacists, uh, stakeholders, everyone like that, to ensure that, uh, you know, with, to treatment of buprenorphine is really what is needed to, uh, and, and other forms of MOUD, uh, medications for opioid use disorder are needed to help curb the opioid crisis. I'm going to go to Dr. Kai and then Dr. Purnell. Doc, doctor, what's your sense? So, you know, Dr. Nelson says, obviously, this tremendous increase. Dr. Chen says, we're concerned about access pharmacies so that from our clients, they have a script, but they can't get it filled. Maybe there's a problem with Medicaid. Maybe there's a problem even with presumptive eligibility. So there's this natural tension between the medical community, the pharmaceutical community, and persons that are in recovery. What's, what's your sense of where the challenges are? Yeah. Um, and thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you again for having us. Um, so uh, I'm Dr. Justin Key. I uh, do the um, medical directorship for psychiatry at Hackensack University Medical Center. So I think, uh, to your point, Governor, it's um, really collaboration. So what we've seen here is at the you know state level, level legislative level, medical level. Um, from my perspective in psychiatry, obviously um, mental health concerns are very, very huge and comorbid happening together with substance use. And so our job is we wanna work closely uh, with our colleagues in the ER and the hospital so that we're reaching as many people as possible on different levels, um, as well as uh, mat access and, and things like that. Um, but for us, it's really about you know screening and addressing in a, in a very non-judgmental way, making people feel welcome to um, uh, achieve psychiatric treatment as well as uh, substance use treatment. So, so Jim McGreevy comes in and I, I come in and I'm co-occurring mental health and addiction treatment. I've just been in prison for eight years, let alone 18 years. I'm suffering from trauma. I'm suffering from I don't have supportive family. I don't have all those institutional networks. 
I may have Medicaid, God willing, if, if Alex Roth at our Bergen site made, did his job. Um, so, so what's available? Yeah, so I think, um, I think the, uh, the first thing is having um, a good psychosocial team who can work yep. with the community, making sure to get people connected with um, Medicaid and uh, community resources. Um, but also what I see day to day is just having the, um, the medical community really serve as a, a touch point where people feel safe going to. I think that's a whole other topic we get into of, of stigma that happens. A little bit of a generation. Even further behind. Yeah. So I think you know, one, know thing that, fair. one thing at um, Hackensack Meridian Health is we tried to put out a um, addiction resources kind of pamphlet so that people in the ER, other clinics, if they're not familiar necessarily with these wide range of resources that can be sometimes staggering and, and overwhelming, um, that people have places they can reach out to or call to if they need help. But I think the name of the game really is collaboration and so I'm going to go to Dr. Pernilis, but I just, so I walk into the ED. How do you know what my background is? How do you know my history, my pharmacological history, my medical history? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, that's, that's a challenge and in, 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 people probably know the American healthcare system. So unless you have a electronic medical record that is shared, um, you don't know unless you talk to the person, which is why the rapport is so important. So they can start building that information to help this individual if they come to that same health system, but obviously an integrated health system would be ideal so that, you know, people can can know that information also. So so for 30 seconds while well, the commission is here, health information exchange, does it make sense? Yeah, I think so. I think the more information that multiple people can share as possible is, is ideal for the individual who comes in for care and they don't have to pick and choose where they have to go. I, I was over, so my doctor and he knew I had this booster and that booster and I'm like, yeah. how the heck do you know? Yeah. But, Dr. Purnell, so Chris, what, what's your sense of fentanyl within the community and the appreciable gaps in terms of access to service and treatment? I would say, um, first, let's start talking about this through the lens of health equity, because that is where I always focus. We see the level of inequities uh, resulting in the disparities that we see across historically excluded groups. So I'm referring to Black or African American, Hispanic or Latino, Native or Indigenous populations, because of three discrete levels within our systems. The first level is differential access to care. Fentanyl is taking advantage of a gap, of an injustice, of an inequity. And let me help you understand that. When you already have a disenfranchised, impoverished, historically excluded community that has been victim of structural policy violence, opportunities for those communities to be further abused or those communities to further um, be disproportionately impacted by disease is rampant. And we saw that during this pandemic. But what we also learned during this pandemic is that while we were focusing on COVID, other issues were ramping up like addiction, like access to fentanyl. And actually we began to see a disproportionate increase in black and Latino persons overdosing. And so for me, I'm looking at what what needs to happen in that integrated fashion in community so that people, especially that people who may not necessarily trust the healthcare system, and, and, and let's talk about that because of a lack of trustworthiness that the healthcare system and public health apparatus has not demonstrated. How do we use credible messengers? How do we use designated persons, groups, organizations, or systems of trust in community to amplify access, access to treatment, access to education? And then the second discrete level that we need to be talking about is differential quality of care. I think it's so important um, earlier when the uh, commissioner was speaking and we're talking about the training that providers, the full complement of those around the table have to undergo in order to be able to care for persons from these historically excluded groups. We have overtly 
overtly criminalize a medical condition. And because we have overtly criminalized a medical condition, you have those who are suffering less likely to want to engage to get the care that they need. If I first can't get an appointment because of a lack of access, but then I get an appointment and the person who's providing the care does not validate, see, or hear me, that just compounds the inequity and sees the disparities that we were facing. And the third discrete level that we have to talk about is the differential access to life opportunities. We have been screaming about the social determinants of health, the structural determinants of health, the political determinants of health long before the COVID-19 pandemic struck and all of the carnage that we've seen in its wake. And this is a part of that carnage. But now we need to move from dialogue to action and saying, how do we invest in social services in this nation? How do we achieve a firm, robust safety net before we even can achieve universal care? We Work at those three levels, and then we can reverse the curse. Thanks, sir. Thank you. So, Dr. Pozo, so, 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 Dr. Purnell talked about access. What happens? Who has access at Newbridge Medical? Uh, yeah, thank you, Governor McGreevy. And yeah, I, I agree with everything that's been said so far, particularly uh, where Dr. Pennell is coming from here on the equity issue. And I think a very important first step is everybody in this room has to see it, and you have to train your eye to see. And when we look at Bergen, we want people to imagine Bergen Newbridge Medical Center as a place where anybody can come. And we sit at the top of the addiction treatment pyramid as a addiction treatment unit, a medically managed withdrawal center, which we usually call detox. And you know, a, an example of detox is this is a word, everybody knows what it is, but we really shouldn't be using it anymore. And so I think we have an opportunity here to all examine our language, examine our use of stigma, and think about where in this state can people access medications for opioid use disorder. And depending on where you live, this will depend on whether or not you'll be able to access methadone, whether you'll be able to access buprenorphine, whether you'd be able to access Vivitrol or injectable naltrexone. And I think an important thing for everybody to understand, if you're going to treat this disease, if you're going to understand the epidemic, is to try to put yourself in the shoes of somebody who's opioid dependent. And people who are opioid dependent will require an opioid every day. And they will not be able to function without. And they can come in to the addiction treatment unit at Bergen and we can solve that problem for them. They can come off of the medication. But if we just send people out without treatment, the return to opioid use is very high. And we can cut that use in half if we use medications for opioid use disorder. So something that we are trying very actively to build uh, at the Bergen Newbridge Center is, whereas before, it used to be, if you come into medically managed withdrawal, if you come into detox, you'll come off everything. Now, anybody who's opioid dependent is offered two, two paths. Do you want to come off everything, or do you want to get onto medicine? And we don't think that just taking everybody off opioid is necessarily going to lead to the best health, but it creates an important issue. And the issue is... dependent on buprenorphine or method. systems that are welcoming, that understand the condition that we learn from our patients. Said fentanyl has changed the so, game. So to go to Dr. Nelson's point is, and you look at the New England Journal of Medicine and you look at 
the British journal Nature. Those that take Suboxone and Buprenorphine have a longer longevity. So the science, can, can you go so far as to say is fundamentally the approach in terms of sustaining life, there's, there's been a shift of approach medically in terms of the importance of providing Suboxone over a longer period of time? I will say an unequivocal yes that anybody who is interested in maintenance medication on buprenorphine or methadone should have it and have access to it. It has been shown to cut the mortality rate in half. I mean, as you've pointed out, the evidence completely supports medications for open use disorder as opposed to abstinence-based therapy. So, I mean, that's a cultural change, right, Doc? I mean, like for me, I know grappling with the idea of providing Suboxone, I come from an old mentality and that was a shift. And now we have program participants that have been on Suboxone for five years, six years, and probably maybe for the I think the big message Very deep. The drug is more potent, but potency is adjusted for by dose. So you just take a lot less of fentanyl than you do heroin. But over time, you build up fairly high doses of fentanyl, leading to very deep dependence. If somebody, everybody knows this, but if you use the dose of fentanyl, you know, uh, a month ago that you use now, you would die. Right, because the dependence that you develop over that month prevents you from dying from the current dose that you're taking. Right, so so potency can be can be adjusted over time or by taking the right dose. But there are other factors of the drug: how tightly it binds to the opioid receptor, right? How aggressively it stimulates the receptor. All of these things matter. And what it really comes down to ultimately is that fentanyl is just able to generate more dependence, which means it's really harder to stop. The withdrawal is more intense, and starting these medications for opioid use disorder, particularly buprenorphine, which for those that know the lingo is a partial agonist, yep. is much more difficult, right? And that's exactly that's exactly the difference. But, but remember, it's not. I, I hate when I hear you know the 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 the, the kinds of the trope that we're substituting one addiction for another. Yeah. I know everybody knows it, but but you can't you can't avoid saying that people are still dependent on an opioid. It's just a, a, a pharmaceutically produced, legally available, relatively easy to access with all of the limitations that we've already heard about. Opioid, you're not buying on the street with lack of quality control. You don't know what else is in it besides the fentanyl that's in it, if that's what you're looking for. Um, and so it's safe. So I, Dr. Chen and then the great old Dr. Baxter, who's been around for... I think he was friends with Moses and then Dr. Bachman. Um, so, so to go to what Dr. Nelson said and to what you said earlier, I was listening acutely what you said about pharmacies being reluctant. Is there anything that we have to do legislatively? I think that's the biggest thing. There's a recent paper in- So you know, you got Senator Stanfield, you got Senator Testa here. This is, go ahead. There's a recent paper in JAMA uh, in, uh, by uh, Dr. Cato, Q-A-T-O, that kind of provides a viewpoint of what can we do. Uh, and one thing is kind of separating buprenorphine from all this corresponding responsibility associated with controlled substances. So just explain mentioned. that, or somebody explain that. So it just basically means that, you know. So any doctor can provide Oxycontin. Any doctor can prescribe. But not any doctor can prescribe buprenorphine. That's a little different than what I'm yeah. referring to. Okay. Corresponding responsibility is really like if, if a doctor writes a prescription, right, may not be for a legitimate purpose, and a pharmacy pharmacist fills it, oh. and something happens to the page, maybe they divert it and something happens, yeah. 
then legally that pharmacist is liable for that as long as, as yeah. along with the uh, physician. So in terms of things that we can do, it's really about separating buprenorphine from the, uh, you know, from the, there's a there's a controlled substance act, right, where um, you you prevent the pharmacists from being liable for the corresponding responsibility. What what specific protocols can we do to ensure that MOUD, the treatment of MOUD, is separate from opioids? Because I think that's where the confusion occurs. It's because a lot of the a lot of the regulations related to pharmacists having to check for red flags is all associated with preventing opioid diversion. But we know that buprenorphine is so much different. And so we need to separate that. I think that's, that's one strategy that, that we can use. And number two is really in terms of communication, because I know the DEA, for example, released a press release in March of 2022 saying that, you know, we support the increased access to buprenorphine. Uh, we were doing a lot of educational outreach to pharmacists and wholesalers or distributors, whatever you want to call them. And that transparency and just providing the transparency to say exactly what is being done will really help overall because I think there's a lot of misunderstandings amongst different stakeholders here as to what needs to be done to ensure that, you know, buprenorphine access is available. Yeah. So, Dr. Baxter, you've, you've been in this space for a long time. Yes, and I can tell you, uh, uh, first of all, I'm very happy to uh, be uh, uh, participating and, and to have an opportunity to uh, talk with you all today. But, you know, all of the different topics that we've been talking about so far, it, uh, it all boils down to education. And it's uh, education of uh, pharmacists. Uh, I can tell you that uh, some of the uh, things that uh, Dr. Uh, Chen is saying is absolutely true, but there are uh, other uh, instances where there is prejudice and uh, there's a discrimination that is being, uh, uh, it's, it's happening to, to our patients. Uh, when uh, a, a doctor, a uh, family practice guy writes a prescription for Oxycontin, uh, 90, nobody uh, bothers that person and says, uh, uh, I don't have your medicine or uh, I'm not going to give you this or I'm going to check back here. Uh, when someone uh, brings a prescription forward for a FDA approved medication to treat a condition, uh, they get a lot of times uh, the, uh, the uh, runaround. And I can tell you that I've actually had pharmacists call me and say, uh, I'd like to know uh, what your uh, tapering uh, schedule is. You know, how dare you? Because uh, there's a uh, built-in bias against our patients. Sorry, it's the truth. If you didn't want me to tell the truth, you shouldn't have brought me up here. I, uh, uh, the, uh, the other thing is this, is that uh, I was part of the uh, FDA panel that approved uh, uh, buprenorphine and CSAT use in this country. And I can tell you that the initial approval was for 32 milligrams as the maximum effective dose. And I can also tell you that it was approved not for just uh, a withdrawal management or detoxification as some of my older friends and I like to speak about, but it was um, approved for maintenance therapy. And uh, when you talk about the treatment of other chronic medical illnesses, uh, and we talk about uh, being dependent on another uh, substance, I point to you IDDM, insulin dependent diabetes. Nobody tells them, hurry up and get off your insulin. Uh, nobody uh, uh, will uh, tell you how much uh, insulin that you can give to them. Uh, but when you talk about the treatment of substance use disorders, it's a, a lot, of, uh, lot of other things going on. So I'm going to uh, be short and say that uh, we really need to uh, do uh, our uh, focus on prevention because we've done a lot on treatment and we've done a lot on everything else. Uh, we've discovered what it is. So we need to, to do more on prevention. And I'm talking about uh, public service uh, announcements like we did with the kids in the 1980s. Uh, they made a whole generation of folks stop smoking. 
And I suggest that we should do that with some of our uh, third and uh, fourth graders. Uh, we need to have education uh, in, um, in the healthcare uh, uh, system, uh, the uh, schools, uh, substance use and addiction should be part of the mandatory curriculum for all healthcare uh, providers, social workers, counselors, so that people can uh, recognize it early, you know, primary prevention, secondary prevention. No, and, I thought this was going to be short. Yeah, well, <laughs> it, it actually is. <laughs> because the problem is uh, you know, pretty, pretty large. And I think that um, in terms of uh, looking at what's going on, this is an issue of supply and demand. We want it, so they're supplying it. And so what we have to do is to uh, focus our efforts on decreasing cutting, the demand. Cutting demand. Somebody said that we're 5% of the world's population, but we consume 99% of the world's fentanyl, which yeah. is a shocking statistic. Uh, uh, Dr. Bachman, Gloria, you've been able to connect women, our women with health navigation services from, from prison, from Edna Mahan, and Dr. Kaldani is here, and I want to say thank you. So how, how does that linkage work? But go ahead. Well, I actually want to start with a question to the audience, because we talked about education, and I agree with Dr. Baxter, third and fourth grade. What are the youngest individuals who are addicted? Who do I see that are addicted? The youngest, 10, 12? Babies, exactly. I, they're in this country, between 400 and 440 babies are born addicted. And this also points to the fact, which is what we're doing uh, in terms of the New Jersey reentry program, is number one, eliminating the stigma so that someone who wants to get pregnant or is planning or may, you know, be, you know, um, doing something along the lines that, gee, if it happens, it happens, is to tr reduce the addiction, de diminish the re uh, addiction, treat the addiction before pregnancy. So it's really a preventive measure that education can address, and we really are mm -hmm. uh, emphasizing that with the New Jersey reentry program, as well as the treatments and the management. And you go up to the women yes. regularly. Can you just share what you do? Absolutely. Um, Constant Cousy, who's the nurse navigator, and I, we go to the, uh, we go behind the wall at least once a month, and we meet with the women, and we discuss the issues, including addiction issues that they have, and make sure that we streamline their management so that they have the management they need or the intervention they need both while in prison and in, on their reentry. Thanks, Doctor. And Doctor Bagan, Tanya. So you've seen what we've tried to do with the, with the Women's Project, with providing access to healthcare and strategies and to treatment. You've also worked on the, for the federal government. Um, are we doing? Is the is, is it getting to the ground? So my sense is, you know, I was just listening to Doctor. Just listening to mental health, addiction. So we've got good strategies, but the question is, are they readily accessible to go to Chris's point? So, forgive me. Yep. Doctor, I know from experience, you're fully vaccinated and boosted, right? Doctor, you're fully vaccinated and boosted, as well as all of you? Okay. Yep. And you may wonder why I did that. My mother is fully vaccinated and double boosted, and several weeks ago, she got COVID. So I can't wait to get my bivalent vaccine. Just like everybody who we're talking about needs to get their COVID vaccine, primary sure. series, as well as boosted. So forgive me, but I needed to make that public announcement. So in answer to your question, it's not getting to the ground. And to answer that quickly, my, my, my colleague over here talked about what we did to stop smoking. Yet one of the things we see popping up all over my neighborhood okay, are new stores for smoking and dispensing marijuana. That's giving a very confusing message, especially since I happen to be black and Puerto Rican, 
And in my neighborhood and everybody else's neighborhood who's Black and Puerto Rican, we have much higher rates of arrest initially if we're found. When we, when we just have to approach the court system or dragged into that, the first thing that we have to do to reach the ground is to look what happens to a person when it, they're either caught with fentanyl, opioids, or stimulants. And let us not forget, in the Black and the Latino community, we are dying from overdoses, and my colleagues will tell you, at a far higher rate, sure. 600% versus 200% of whites because of the combination of opioids, cocaine, and fentanyl. So having said that, in terms of getting to the ground, first we have to look at what happens initially when one of us has an issue. First of all, there's three choices that can be made. I'm gonna add on to the esteemed Dr. Purnell. One is I come before the court, I can be sent home. One, okay? Number two, I can be sent to intensive treatment. Number three, okay, I can get incarcerated. And that's very, very important because the first step to treatment is being treated equitably and dealing with racism. I really appreciate the cultural aspect but if you don't deal with the racial, racial aspect, which pervades over every single thing that was said, we have a problem. Number two, in terms of, of reaching the community, okay, one of the challenges we have is with access, the assumptions being made that we don't want treatment. But the reality is when we look at published articles, okay, we find that number one, Narcan is not as available in our communities, okay? Number two, if we have Narcan and are using drugs, when we try to get a refill, it's even difficult to get that. Number three, what my esteemed colleague was talking about with buprenorphine, it is absolutely ridiculous. Do you know, I, we have to take training, education, and pass it every year every year to prescribe opioids. If we have to do that, there is no reason why buprenorphine shouldn't be added to that list. We should not be restricted to the number of people we see and prescribe. Can I just, I just want to pick I'm up sorry. on that point. No, that's a great point. So doc, what do you think about that? What Dr. Pagan just said. Yeah. I, the I, last I, yeah. point in terms of, particularly in terms of access. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, and training. it's completely spot on because it's taken this long to, just start to introduce the idea of, okay, let's get some more people trained and, and get them involved. So what's the impact, to go to Dr. Bagan's point, what's the impact of not having that access? What's the impact in the community, whatever community? Yeah, well, I mean, the impact, unfortunately, is what we've seen today and heard this morning, which is more inequity, more deaths, a vicious cycle. Right? So if you were to change it, what would you do? So I think we have to, we have to really start um, at the primary level, which is what people have talked about, right? Working with legislation and law enforcement on, on equity. We also need to work on um, education. But what would you do families. in terms of licensure of doctors being able to provide? So we need to expand the, the access. So at the DEA level or at a pharmacy level, be able to have that access more readily available and reduce the, you know, any kinds of barriers that may have been historical rather than Dr. Baxter, does that make sense? Uh, yes, yes, it does. Uh, uh, but also to to the uh, doctor's point is that uh, there are pharmacy deserts in uh, communities yep. of uh, color. And so that is a significant impact uh, in mm -hmm. terms of mm -hmm. getting your uh, medications refilled sure. and uh, the availability of the medications at that pharmacy. So, you know, th uh, there's a, a, a lot of components here. Yep. So what do, I'm sorry, Dr. Chen, and then I want to add with that pharmacy desert, that's one of the red flags that pharmacists look for when they see a patient or client travel so far to get their prescription for buprenorphine. They say, oh, you're from 100 miles away. I have to deny that script. And that leads to more barriers and access to treatment. Yeah, why? Dr. So there seems to, I just, when, when Dr. Bagan made a point, I just saw everybody nod. And I just wanted to validate Dr. Nelson. It is true that you need no license to prescribe an opioid. You need deep to be registered with the DEA uh, and every physician. Can you just say that again? 
to, you know, to prescribe an opioid for pain or, or you know, whatever you might use it for, other than opioid dependence. Yep. You just need to get your D registration, which every physician has. And in New Jersey, you need to control, you know, dangerous substance uh, registration as well. Um, there's the FDA had a risk evaluation mitigation strategy program put in place that was supposed to help at least educate doctors about the dangers and the safe use of of um, the extended release of long acting opioids and then ultimately the immediate release opioids like the ones like the Percocets yep. you're talking about. Uh, those were voluntary, voluntary, which obviously who's going to do that if it's if you don't have if to. It's voluntary. So, so with buprenorphine, it used to be until, as, as Clement said uh, last year uh, or earlier this year, that you needed to take an eight hour training course in order to prescribe buprenorphine. And, and you had to get a special waiver for your DEA registration to do that. That was changed and eliminated, so now it's just a checkbox on a website. So the, the barrier is so low. You still have to do that, and that's not necessarily unreasonable. And I personally think you need some education, because if you prescribe buprenorphine inappropriately, you will precipitate open withdrawal in your patient, and that's miserable, right? So, so I think there's got to be some education around it. But here, here's my concern. In healthcare, um, you know, I work in emergency medicine. I deal with an entire hospital full of doctors. It is very difficult to this day to get doctors to go onto the website and check the box. Yep. I think yes. They're, they're deathly afraid <laughs> Why is of it? stigma, yep. bias, a lot of what everybody else has talked about. But I think we view patients with substance use disorder as difficult patients, as scary patients, as litigious patients. I don't really know why, but I still get asked. And so like Dr. Clement Baxter's Baxter, point. You know, we are, I am constantly asked to write people morphine prescriptions for other doctors because they don't want to check the box and write their own prescription. Yep. And I'm going to go back to Dr. Bagan and let her finish and then Dr. Bernal. Okay. Oh, okay. But, but I, I just thought it was really, because when you made your comment, everybody shook their head yes. And so it's, I, I don't know what we do beyond checking the box, but, but it's also, as Dr. Chen said, it's creating excess in the community, whether it's pharmacies, whether it's centers of excellence. I mean, I just see it for the people I'm privileged to work with. It's a challenge. There's a couple of centers that people grapple with and we're going to talk in a couple of minutes about the whole challenge of, of when people show up positively in their urine for heroin what's the, or fentanyl, what's the appropriate medical response. Doc? So let me say to everybody, if you have a pen, write this down. Real simple. SAMHSA, S-A-M-S-H-A, HRSA, H-R-S-A, HHS, and 988. <laughs> and the reason I said those four things is that we need to get the resources to the ground, as my colleague said. And those resources need to be gotten not only to the community, but also to the legislators. So for example, you asked earlier, is there any legislation that can be introduced? We have great legislation on the books in New Jersey, which you helped to craft, regarding decriminalization, okay, and adjudication for drug use based on race and ethnicity. We need to follow up on that report, okay, because that, it's, it's looking upstream. It's like if someone gets bitten by a rat or someone has bad water, you can keep treating them and treating them, or you can go upstream, okay, get rid of the rat and get rid of the bad water. That's what we have to do. We have to get rid of the racism and decriminalization, number one. Number two, in terms of education and training, as my esteemed colleague said, of course I believe in education and training. So for example, from SAMHSA, you can get medical, medication assistant treatment, MAT training materials and resources. Just go to SAMHSA, MAT, you can get that. For pregnant ladies, and remember, pregnant women, and I'll, if I can just finish with this, who may be using substances for whatever reason, okay, they usually have the comorbidities of ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. They may have been raped. They may have been all sorts of things. They may be dealing with HIV, et cetera. So HRSA, Health Resource Service yep. Administration, has provided an HHS funding to help mommies, pregnant yep. mommies who have substance diseases. So I'm gonna stop. No, right no, and, and, we, and we, Dr. Bachman, we, we 
work with the women that are pregnant within NJRC. We work with the HRSA guidelines. Doc, do you want to just hop in yeah, on Yeah, absolutely. That? I just want to ditto. Absolutely. Of course. Dr. Bachman. Yeah, no, no, no. So Dr. Bachman is on it at the Institute of, of Women. So, and then uh, can, I just wanted to go to Dr. Purnell. My beautiful friend here. And by the way, I want to give a shout out to Dr. Pagan, who chairs our women's project, so thank you. <laughs> yes. I, I have to get Dr. Pagan's lectures all the time. It's like I, I, I feel like I'm, I'm back sitting with my aunt. Yes. Um, I just wanted to add for everyone here a very simple but very important definition of racism. And I thought about this while Dr. Nelson was speaking and Dr. Bagan then named it. Dr. Cameron Jones, who is a public health pantheon and many others in the literature in the field, described racism as a system of structuring opportunity whereby one group, based on their phenotype or skin color and the social construct of race, is advantage, and another group, based on their skin color or phenotype and the social construct of race, is disadvantage, but the strength of a society as a whole is sad. If we can understand that racism is system sickness, then we can understand the imperative to name how racism is happening in every facet of our lives. Health-seeking behaviors do not happen in a vacuum. Health-seeking behaviors happen in the context of interlocking systems of oppression. Health prescribing behaviors, let me just complete the thought. Health prescribing behaviors do not happen in a vacuum. But prescribing behaviors happen in the context of interlocking systems of oppression. And the very policies that we design and create too often, I said this earlier, I borrowed this from the esteemed Dr. Paul Farmer, are examples of policy violence. And when we begin to deconstruct why certain barriers are created around treating certain conditions in certain groups, we can have a more fulsome, honest, and transparent conversation and really bring some real sustainable change. Okay. So, so we want to bring change, right? So we've, we're, we're running out of time, and I walk away with some of the, the conversations about pharmacy deserts, um, access to boop, the need to check the box, um, the need to understand that fentanyl is different. But if you were going to have three changes to address the fentanyl crisis, I would just like to ask you what they would be. So Dr. Curso, you're on the ground. And just, just for 30 seconds, can you say what you do every day? Uh, I am at heart a primary care physician, but right now I am the medical director of the addiction treatment unit. So I'm at both the bottom, at Upper Burger New Bridge, uh, and so I live at the with the folks who are the most stable and the least stable. Uh, and, and a lot of, and a lot, frankly, a lot of our program participants come through there, and I'm so grateful for your leadership. Um, and and thank you for that. The three that uh, come to my mind. So uh, the first is. With buprenorphine, it used to be easy to get on it. Yep. And it's gotten harder. And Can you say that again? It used to be easy to get on it, and in the age of fentanyl, it has gotten harder to get on this life-saving medication. And one potential policy change I would like to see is it, withdrawal management, detox, generally speaking, is better covered for alcohol and benzodiazepine withdrawal because we know that that can be life-threatening. I submit to everybody in this room, we should now look at getting people either for the first time onto buprenorphine or getting previously successful patients who used to do well on buprenorphine back onto it would be a very large service that all addiction treatment facilities should be offering in state. And, and why is it more difficult to get on now? With heroin, you're ready to get on your buprenorphine after 12 to 24 hours. You sicken up, you start to sweat, and then you can take your buprenorphine. What we are hearing from patients, who are generally our best teachers, is that even two, three, in some rare cases, five, six, seven days later, when they take a buprenorphine, the fentanyl is still lingering in their systems and it makes them sick. 
And the worst thing that could happen is they then blame this very helpful medication for the illness that transpires after I, they take I it. I just, Rob told me, could you just say that one more time? I think this is really important. The distinct, and it plays into the distinction that Dr. Nelson said earlier between heroin and fentanyl. Helping patients who are opioid dependent on fentanyl to get onto medications is an enormously important task. It has become harder in the age of fentanyl and yet even more important. And our hospitals together and our treatment facilities together in this state have to work together to get people on. We're good at that up at Bergen Newbridge. Then we need places to send people. So send people to us, we'll get them on, we'll send them back to you, you keep them going. But it's that, it, it's the basic distinction in the nature between heroin and fentanyl that complicates the ability to access group. There's one other piece, you, you asked for three things. The first would be that opioid uh, management is an acceptable use of withdrawal management. The second would be for some people in the age of fentanyl, buprenorphine is no longer strong enough and we need better access to methadone. And we need to be looking at both the state level and the federal level for ways that we can make methadone a more accessible and less stigmatized medication. Dr. Buckman? Obviously the big one is stigma that if I'm addicted, I should not be concerned or afraid to tell my healthcare provider or those who can help me. So that's really the big thing, decriminalize it, we've talked about already. And I think the other is what Dr. Baxter said, education. We truly need education like this forum. And I applaud you, Governor, for putting this together with your team. Thank you. Thanks. The great Dr. Baxter. Uh, microphone, I, Doc. Thank you. I know you've got a deep baritone voice, but. Well, I was trying to save that for later. <laughs> but my uh, actual uh, uh, points are uh, education, and I'm sp specifically talking about the uh, public service announcements getting to the younger children so that we can start to decrease the demand. Uh, also, education of all health care providers. Uh, social workers, nurses, dentists, pharmacists, so that they can start to identify uh, uh, problems earlier. And uh, lastly, is that uh, we need to have uh, our hands uh, unbound so that we can use FDA approved medications like we can use anything else for any other chronic And, and when, you were on, when you participated on the FDA yes. panel, so can you just share for the benefit of us here who didn't have that exalted status? Yes. Well, go ahead. Yes, well, uh, I, I'm going to try to stay in bounds uh, because I could say some things that are not good, and I will. And uh, the uh, buprenorphine at that time uh, was only going to be called uh, Suboxone and uh, Subutex. And it was found to be effective up to 34 milligrams, beyond which there is what we talk about a ceiling effect. So if you take more, you're not going to uh, get any better. If you're treating someone that, had, that actually has opiate dependence, you're not going to overdose them because uh, it's kind of hard to do if somebody really is an opiate uh, a dependent person. Um, the insurance industry got involved because they had to pay for this medication. And so then they started uh, checking to see what the average dose was. So the average dose was 16. So they said, oh, uh, that's what we should make the, uh, the uh, cutoff is. And then uh, there was a lot of, lot of uh, pushback. And so they moved it up to a 24. And if your patient, uh, and keep in mind what I'm talking to you about how we treat other chronic medical illnesses. Nobody tells uh, a physician you can only use so much insulin. You can't go above 25 units. Nobody does that in any other uh, medical uh, treatment scenario. But uh, for individuals that are not physicians that are in, involved with industry and are involved with dollars, uh, another thing I want to leave you with is if it doesn't make sense, it's because it's about dollars. Yeah, but I, I just, 
Good, Dr. Shen. Yeah, so, so I think what you talk about is, is obviously understanding the scope of the original FDA approval, education, education, Dr. Chen. Well, I think we need to think of buprenorphine as a harm reduction strategy, just like any of like our other strategies in harm reduction, like using naloxone, clean needles, fentanyl test strips. Because when people are on buprenorphine, right, we need to educate our patients, clients, that it's a shield, that they shouldn't stop using bup if they're going to use their fentanyl or something like that. Bup is really a shield and really protects them from overdose. We really want to use that as a harm, thinking about it as a harm reduction strategy. Good. Second thing is we don't want to stop bup buprenorphine just because they recur. And I, like, I sometimes don't like to use the word relapse because I tend to think of relapse as potentially stigmatizing. I might as well say hypertension. Well, your, your hypertension goes up, blood pressure goes up, then your blood pressure relapse. You know, so just say, just say it recurred, you know, or uncontrolled. In other words, just uncontrolled. So I think that's really about that. And people, a lot of prescribers might think that, oh, if they're, they recur in their benzo use, they'll stop you too. And that's really dangerous. So, Doc, just, just to jump in, yeah. we have situations where our folks are on boot, but they'll relapse, they'll use. And then seemingly for all the best of circumstances, the addiction treatment specialist will say, well, I'm only going to give you X until you come back with a clean urine. And it, it, it's almost, they create this tension between the behavior when actually the alternative is to use. Yeah. I mean, urine drug screening is really not all that evidence-based, right? Uh, we want to use buprenorphine to save lives. I mean, just... People can have their urines positive, but we provide them the bup and they're taking their bup. Maybe that's part of their recovery. We want to support the patients in their own recovery and what that might be. And it could be the continue using. And so um, really- But it's like thinking that. of it differently. Thinking it differently, that abstinence is not- Always abstinence only a small happen. part of, of recovery. Dr. Ka? Yeah. And um, talk a little bit of the conflation between mental health and addiction. Sure, sure, yeah. So. Um, yeah, I'm very humbled to be in a position where I listen to a lot of people every day tell me things that they probably haven't told a lot of other people. So as our colleagues have, have mentioned already. Doc, could you just the mic? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. And so for our colleagues have mentioned already, um, we have to be very, very open and careful about how we're coming across to people because this needs to count, right? we got to have them come back and we have to give them appropriate treatment. Um, so a couple of things on the mental health front. Uh, I used to practice elsewhere where... I worked with colleagues who would refuse to start bup when people were taking benzos for other conditions. And what stuck with me is that your patients are more, or people are gonna be more likely to die from benzos and heroin than they are in benzos and buprenorphine. So to Dr. Chen's um, you know, harm reduction approach is we gotta think about these as medical conditions that we're treating with evidence-based and that needs to lead where it leads. Um, and what does that mean that needs to lead where it leads? Like if, if, if it's reducing mortality and there's lives being saved, why aren't we doing so more? So that's, that's the goal, right? right? Reducing mortality, saving lives. Um, and then, you know, again, I, I, I treated a, I did a buprenorphine group um, back in Kaiser Permanente and the concept of, again of when do I get off this or do I need to get off this? And I think the group environment was very powerful because people could kind of share their lived experiences but also a good opportunity to remind people about stigma and tell them, hey, well, think about insulin-dependent diabetes or think about these other things, right? Think about these as brain conditions that together we need to treat and get better. And does that change your perspective of this? And the final point I'd make is that what I tell my patients every day who may not be opioid dependent, but they're coming to me for ADHD or anxiety, I tell them, please, 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 do not take family, friends, other people's medication, fentanyls and everything. If you're not getting something from a pharmacist over the counter, just assume that it's fentanyl. And I prescribe naloxone to as many people as I can who I think are at risk. And lastly, just your thoughts about the, the ample supply of treatment facilities that provide for both. So you go to the doctor's point earlier, long-term treatment for mental health and addiction treatment, do they exist in New Jersey? 
Yeah, um, I think, you know, just like everywhere else, always, you know, always, always getting better. And just the initiatives we heard this morning, I think, are, are very, very exciting. But, it, you know, it's going to take a, you know, take a large society to work together and make sure these, these services are available concurrently. Good. And Dr. Nelson has been doing this in the trenches. <clears throat> well, you know, as an academic who, who runs a department in a medical school, uh, I can't get past the fact that we need to do more research. We need to really understand all facets of, of the addiction spectrum. Uh, see, my, my personal work to address Dr. Curso's point has been an alternative induction strategies for buprenorphine because it is so hard to use in the fentanyl age. And you can't just do it the way we did it for heroin. So we've spent a lot of time looking at how to get people with microdosing and macrodosing and other things. So I think that's it's very important and to really get the best evidence that we have to, to, to look at, at this issue. I think naloxone we can't we can't ignore as, as an incredible tool to keep people alive and get them into into treatment. Uh, it's great to hear about all the efforts we have in this country and in, in the state to get naloxone in the hands of people, but it really has to be there. You, know, you can't go yep. looking for it when you need it, right? And it should be in everybody's backpack and glove compartment and purse and, and everywhere, not just people who use opioids, but in people who know people who use opioids and people who just happen to be riding a bus or walking down the street and, and see somebody who might need it. That's a big lift, but I think we really need to do that. Um, and and to, to my point I made earlier, I think in healthcare, there's still a stigma. And, and to, to Dr. Baxter's point, education is very important. It's never, it's never the solution, but it's absolutely part of the solution. Yeah. And we really have to destigmatize in the eyes of physicians and, and, and nurses and, and other healthcare providers, and in the public and in, in government and in everybody. The fact that this is just, a, it's, I hate to say the word normal, but it's definitely a part of, of the, the society we live in. Thank you. Dr. Vergan? Hi. Uh, the three that I would say is what I said earlier. New Jersey really needs to implement, follow up, and report on their legislation that's supposed to provide, when someone comes in for, for drug use to the court system, equitable assessment so that Blacks, Latinos, <coughs> and whites are treated equally, and that particularly Blacks and Latinos receive the six to 12 months that are recommended in your report. Second, equitable access, starting first with mental health, physical health, and by the way, we didn't talk about oral health, at all the facilities here, as well as federally qualified health centers, which you can find at findahealthcenter.gov. Last but not least, that 988 number is yep. a suicide prevention hotline. Most people who are using drugs, they don't want to use drugs. Okay, they are self medicating. I know that term isn't, isn't like, not, you know, a lot of people don't like it, but I'm 66 years old and I'm going to use it. In the same way that people drink alcohol and use other things, they're hurting. People are hurting. We assume, we assume if someone's black or Latino or using heroin, that, oh, they just accidentally overdose. No, some people are committing suicide because they're in that much. Pain. And so the last thing to remember that 988 suicide prevention hotline, as well as seeking mental health services, because many people using substances, you got to start up here. You got to start with where they're hurting up here. And if you don't treat that, it's going to be difficult to treat anything else. Thank you, doctor. <laughs> Great, Dr. Bagan. I'm going to try to make this quick. So Recall what I started my particular commentary with about those three discrete levels because everyone on this platform has described an action or an intervention at one of those policy levels. So absent me repeating that, the three things that I want to leave you with because I think it's relevant for this and for larger conversations. One, budgets are moral imperatives. The dollars and the funding that we create for specific conditions and for specific groups are rooted in more than just pure economic happenstance. They are rooted in how we value lives. They are rooted in how white supremacy, and I'm going to use this word, and hopefully it makes all of us uncomfortable. They are rooted in white supremacy and how white supremacy has prescribed social caste, economic caste, religious caste, and political caste in our society. And our interactions and our behaviors are not absent of that larger construct. We're talking about the curse of fentanyl. So I got to go far upstream so that we can undo that curse. 
Um, the second thing that I want to talk about is that policies specifically testify, they testify of what we believe is the value of those lives that I just described. And that is not until we look at policy generation, policy advocacy, policy making from a truly justice orientation. Equity is an achievable goal, but we need to get beyond equity and get to justice. Justice is fixing the warped and corrupt system. Justice is digging up the root. Okay, and finally, we need to share power. There are so many power asymmetries in our culture. The power asymmetries feed off of stigma. Power asymmetries feed off the interlocking systems of oppression, of which racism is one of those systems of oppression. And as long as people are stigmatized for medical conditions, as long as people are stigmatized for life conditions, what my sister here is talking about, why someone uses in the first place, and as long as prescribers are stigmatized over the behaviors to truly help them, we're not going to be able to achieve wholesale change. We're going to do a little bit of change, and then we're going to see a problem continue to fester, and some other pandemic is going to come up, and then we're going to focus on that big issue, and other things are going to keep ripping up under the surface, and lives are going to be lost. We can stop losing lives when we begin to value the human experience and do those things. Thank you, Chris. Can we give a round of applause for the whole panel? Thank you. Yeah, thanks for everything. Uh, thank you. And now we're going to hear briefly from Enzo, um, who's an NJRC uh, program participant, and he's going to share a little bit of his perspectives. And Dr. Lavonis is in the back, the great Petrus Lavonis in his chair soccer suit. Um, all right, Enzo. Thank you, thank you, brother. Uh, wow, that was great. Um, yeah, real, real brief, uh, real brief. Uh, my, like, uh, like the government said, my name is Enzo. Uh, I'm from Jersey City, born and raised. You know, I had a a, a little bit of a, a rough upbringing. You know, but like I said, you know, fentanyl is a game changer. You know, 20 years I've been doing this thing with the opioid, and you know, there wasn't really such. Uh, of a thing as uh, overdose, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. Uh, you know, my experience uh, in the last year with fentanyl, I, you know, I winded up in the county jail three times, all right? Once behind the, the wheel of the tractor trailer, the second time behind the wheel of my personal vehicle, and then the third time, uh, just by the grace of God, I had family in the house and I, and I was a roking. But, you know, it's just a tough experience. and. You know, going into the county, I had a first-hand experience uh, three times, you know, the whole thing where it takes three, four days for them to put you on, on the buprenorphine. You know, uh, I'm currently uh, getting off it. You know, I'm on the lowest dose possible now, 0.7. It completely gave me, thank you, thank you. You know, it, it gave me the ability, you know, after running into a brick wall constantly, repeatedly, repeatedly, some of us need medication, you know, and but it it, it gave me this this uh, this hope and strength to be able to do the spiritual aspect of it, um, you know. And I got in there. I'm doing the work, and you know, I, I'm I'm certifying to be a peer recovery specialist. I'm working in a treatment center now, you know, two days a week, and it's all thanks to that, you know. The subtext, the people off you, you know, it gave me the edge, and hopefully, you know, I will get off it within the next month, you know, and continue my spiritual journey. But like I said, the the fentanyl is crazy, and it's, you know, even like going to treatment centers, I've been in there, you know, you have to wait so long to take the medication because the way fentanyl binds to your receptors, you know, you immediately go into precipitated withdrawals, and you just want to run out of the treatment center. So, uh, you know. It has to be a, a, a way to coordinate, do something. But, you know, that's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your time. Thanks, Enzo. And so Enzo is um, also in, in a peer recovery program. And so he's learning peer recovery coaching. The whole goal is he's teaching one another. And so now we'd like to call upon our legislators, who I think all just went out to get coffee. Um, as the legislators are apt to do. 
Um, Lacey's going to go out there and corral them. And um, in the meantime, I just also want to recognize uh, our dear friend, um, Dr. Petros Livonis, and doctor is at Rutgers Chair of Psychiatry, and also President of the American Psychiatric Association. So he's our keynote at lunch. And unlike, and unlike legislators, doctor actually stays in the room. Um, but they're, they're, they're coming up quickly. So again, thank you very much. It's just interesting to hear what's, what's available and some of the reaction and some of the bias still that's evident on Suboxone and how we have to make it so readily accessible. So Alex, can you get the legislators? Alex Roth, can you get the legislators back there? Thank you. You want to get Yeah. All right. And would you get up there? Yeah. Do you want to talk? Yeah. All right. Senator O'Scallon and the great Assemblywoman Ileana Pinter Murn and Senator Ruiz. Good, good, good. Senator, look, look who's talking. You hear it? Senator? Yeah, he just. Thank you. Oh, my God. Enzo, just pull up over here. Whoa. Yes, you have right here. No, no, you you just pull up that chair right here. Senator Ruiz, right here. Right here. Right here. Yeah. Declan and Speaker Coughlin. Hey, you're gonna shout out, Deb. So we're just gonna get started. Senator Tester came from Cumberland County. And speaker, hey, Senator, Senator Bill Powell's here. All right, so, Enzo, what was the hardest thing? Enzo, what you said over here? All right. Enzo's going to share what was the hardest thing about going from the throes of fentanyl addiction to recovery. No. You are there. Um, man, the, the hardest thing was the fear. You know, after doing it for, you know, it, it, it's just in your body so, so much. It's, it's so much different than any other opioid. And, you know, the withdrawal, the feeling is like 10 times worse than, than any heroin or any other opioid. You know, and then... You're dealing with the fear, you know, what's going to happen afterwards. So, you know, for me, that, that was the biggest thing it, it, is the fear and, and the actual the different withdrawals from any other opioid. The Oh, well, you know, you know, the way, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, you call uh, uh, treatment centers or, uh, you know, someone advocates to get you in and, you know, there's, there's waiting periods, you know, um, they tell you to call back, nobody answers the phones, you know, but, you know, that, the hardest thing was the waiting periods. So, may I say, Patterson has long battled addiction. Can you tell us a little bit about how, how, how evident is there a yeah. crisis and what can you do about it? First, Governor, I want to give you a lot of credit because you've always been a champion for all who fall and who need help getting back up. Two weeks ago. Some of us fall more than others. But come on, Governor. Two weeks ago, the Governor co-hosted a re-entry job fair at City Hall in Patterson and over 100 people participated in that job fair. And we appreciate your leadership and I appreciate your friendship, Governor. And to contextualize how severe the situation is in Patterson, as far as fentanyl and other drugs are concerned, our fire department was featured on the cable channel a and &E. It was a program called Live Rescue. And in one episode, which is about 60 minutes, and there are other fire departments throughout the country that are featured, we had to administer Narcan 12 times. So that puts into perspective what, what we're up against. The Patterson 
strives to be a city of solutions. And so we've been very aggressive in applying for grants. And with one of the grants, we were able to create an opioid response team, which is comprised of a police officer, an EMT, and a social worker. And we've been concentrated on Broadway. If anyone's familiar with Patterson, that's where a lot of the opioid use disorder emanates from. And we have over 500 referrals. Now, granted, you have people who are service resistant, but we're making the outreach in that area. And then in addition to that effort to support the initiative of the opioid response team, we applied for a very rare grant opportunity. Bloomberg Philanthropies issued a global mayor's challenge. And what the global mayor's challenge called for was a municipality to come up with an innovative idea to address a long-standing challenge that was only exacerbated by the pandemic. And they stated that if your city was chosen, you'd receive a million dollars to implement that innovative idea to address that long-standing challenge. So 631 cities around the world applied for this unique opportunity. They only selected 15 cities. Patterson was one of those cities. And the innovative idea, and the governor, we pulled in Governor McGreevy on this one, the innovative idea was to address opioid use disorder. And we called this program Real Fix, because I start off by talking about Narcan. Narcan is a quick fix. Fentanyl is a fake fix. Real Fix, we believe, is medically assisted treatment, Suboxone. So we created a hotline and we piloted this program. The hotline's 833-REAL-FIX. And we piloted with five individuals who, str who struggle with opioid use disorder. And how it works is those individuals would call the hotline, 833-REAL-FIX, and they'd be connected with a teledoc who would prescribe medication from a local participating pharmacy. We said that we could get that Suboxone to that individual within 90 minutes. When we piloted it, we got it to those individuals within 76 minutes. Afterwards, we don't want to end there because we understand real fix has to have a real solution. And so we connect those individuals to a counselor to get them on a path to sobriety. Yeah. So, so that you're providing Suboxone quickly, efficiently, moving into the street. I just wanted to ask Senator Ruiz and then the speaker, Senator, you've seen, you've been involved in education, educational opportunities for the entirety of your life, standards, testing, protocols. Uh, you know, Dr. Baxter talked about education, education, education. And then Dr. Bachman asked people, how old were people that were addicted? And candidly, I was, it was disconcerting. People said 12, some people said eight years old. I mean, it was... Are we doing everything that we can to be educating children in schools as to the dangers? No, absolutely not. I think, you know, it, depending on the community, the education you see either comes from a very personal lens, right? That you're seeing someone who's addicted in your household or you're actually seeing it on your walk to school. But you're not making the connection as to how the individual got there and or we're not providing enough resources to say th this is the potential impact. I think that if you have this conversation though today, and this is not to, or maybe to create some passionate discussion amongst my colleagues, is, is that oftentimes we get so um, overwhelmed with not wanting to speak truth to power. And this is a space where you have to do it and it, it would be critically uncomfortable. Addiction is an extraordinary thing to see, to be in it, to be part of that outside familiar space yeah. and to talk about fundamentally what approaches you need to, to get to a better place. And, and so I think that when you have to engage in those conversations, I could see where some, there would be some kind of pushback. But back to your education thing, I, I always focus why do we lose people to this? In some circumstances, an accident, right? And the doctor, very much part of the problem. I can tell you that firsthand because I saw it in my life, outside looking in at a family member and the destruction. And just by the grace of God, the person never made their way out to um, the streets, right? We got her off of it and, 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 and she's in a great space. But making sure that if it is coming from an emotional internal crisis or from um, a space where you feel completely alone, if we make investments in education, no matter what they are, and make sure that we are profoundly 
making sure that every New Jersey child is reaching their God-given potential, I can guarantee you that your numbers would be much smaller. So, so maybe, I don't know, Senator Dugan has, and others talked about legislation to provide an educational programming as early as third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, in terms of addiction, addiction treatment. And then the other big takeaway is access to MAT, uh, medication-assisted treatment. So we heard the doctors go back and forth and just say that, you know, pharmacies are concerned about making access to MAT so readily available. Doctors are concerned. Is there something that we can do from a legislative perspective to remove the fear of doctors of pharmacies from engaging in like proactive MAT provisions? I'm sure there is, and I'll just tell you this is a real life experience. I, I, I give myself B12 complex shots um, prescribed by the doctor, and unfortunately they didn't prescribe the needle that had to go with it. And the, and the pharmacist was looking at me like, I can't give you this. And I said, are you not, familiar with the needle exchange because I was like, I'll take anything right now until I get the. She had absolutely no clue what I was talking about. So yes, we could do things, but we also have to go back and revisit policies that we have in place that were strategically put there for better best practices to make sure that everyone is up to speed on what current law is. Mm, so one thing that came up from the doctor's panel, I just interested in and as the speaker, is health information exchange. It, it happened again and again that people, that if you go to Robert Wood Johnson or you're going down to Cooper, that your medical information will follow you from, from cardiologist to cardiologist, to the clinic, to the surgery center. But if you're traveling from addiction, if you're traveling from mental health, there's no health information exchange. There's no way so that the doctor, one of the doctors from Hackensack says, we literally ask people, what is their experience? We ask people, what are their track record? So you have a doctor literally asking a patient who has, who is wherever they are in terms of their, their awareness. Is there a possibility, speak, Craig, that, Speaker, that we could think about the, the prospect of a health information exchange the same way there? Like I had the opportunity to go to my doctor and he knew I had got my booster shot. He knew I had got my shingles shot. But the reality is if I go to three addiction treatment centers and one mental health clinic, Nobody knows what the treatment is. Nobody knows what the pharmacological regimen is. Is there a possibility to track that? Yeah, and, and we can just look down the panel to see how committed that my colleagues are in the legislature are in doing that. It makes perfect sense. It, it, for the same reasons it makes sense for your, your medical conditions, right? Uh, the ability for doctors to be able to treat a patient uh, without the, having to rely on the patient's recollection of what they may, what conditions they may have had, what other what drugs they have taken, whatever they don't, we we don't know what state the the, the patient may be in, right? Uh, so it seems to me that that is something that we ought to look to do and and make sure that it, it is in place because it, it it will yield better results, and that's ultimately yeah. I just want to figure out, Enzo, how many how many treatment centers were you in? Probably at least, maybe, maybe within the 20 years, maybe at least seven to 10. And every single one of those, I had to re-give all my information. I would lie. I would try to get more medication, you know, depending on how I was feeling. So, yeah, that well, was it should, yeah, it shouldn't be 50 first dates. It should be, it should, there should be a coordinated effort on top of it for the patient's information uh, in, in order in, in a way to control, uh, to make sure that patients are being treated with what they need, but not over medicating, right? I mean, there's that possibility as well. So it, it makes great sense to be able to do that. Now, implementing that will be a challenge for some of the of the treatment centers, I suspect uh, they'll face challenges in terms of the the having the, the software and technology to be able to do that. Uh, but the overarching good that it'll uh, it'll it'll give bring well, I think outweighs that. Dean, I was just wondering, what do, you think? what do you think about health information exchange and what else? I mean, so we're just trying to walk walk away with actionable items. So one is access to BOOP. We're talking about early childhood education, health information exchange. 
What's your sense? Yeah, um, definitely when it comes to the health information exchange, I think it's very important. However, we have to get rid of the stigma first. And I'll tell you a personal story. I had a, a very close family member diagnosed with terminal lung cancer, told that she only had a few, maybe two months to live. They would not give her pain medication because she had been treated for alcoholism. And they said she might abuse it. She's dying. You know, so we have That's to get rid of Wait, can you say that again? That's an, yeah. That goes to what Senator Rick said. That's an incredible story. Yeah. So, uh, could you say that again? So, um, family member, terminal cancer, a couple months to live, definitive diagnosis. She had been treated for alcoholism before. And because of that, she could not get pain medications um, because they, she might abuse them in the two months that she had left. So it was that stigma is there and it's still there. So I love the idea of exchanging information. It makes it so much easier. But at the same time, we have to get rid of the stigma first. Yep. So, and uh, someone, Ileana Pinter Marin, and I just appreciate everything you've done in this space in terms of addiction and treatment and access and making sure that people, when they leave jail, they leave, that they have access to MAT. One of the things that's difficult is it ties into what the speaker said, is that health information exchange gives you information, but if you had that information, you might be able to follow treatment, would follow that information to go what Senator Stanfield just said, her, her family member that was dying that couldn't get pain medication. Is there a way that we could connect the health information exchange to treatment that would maximize more sensible treatment? Thanks, Gov. So one of the things that we've actually even spoken about is the, the, the problem is if you're, if you're going to a hospital and you're staying within the system, right, and you're going to primary cares or specialists, they all have your, your information. The difficulty in this is it's bigger than that, though, because for treatment centers, you're not necessarily going to a, a, a facility that's run by, you know, a hospital yeah. or even a primary care. They're just separate entities. I think the challenge that we have in front of us is how do we really connect those specific treatment centers? Because some of these treatment centers are also community based, right? So that becomes an even bigger challenge because of, you know, privacy and, and all, all that other issue, because we're trying to do the right thing for the patient, but when it's even a community center, um, or even, you know, and you know this when you're released and sometimes you're going to that community center for the, for the check-in or to do your drug testing, how do we connect those smaller centers into the big exchange, I think, is something that we really need to, to, to look at. Whether maybe we have, um, you know, the community center engage with a, a hospital setting or a primary care and have that yep. linkage together. That's just some of the spaces that we've been trying to explore, but it is challenging. Senator? This is just more of a generic question. The issue becomes we're all focused on this continuum of care, but do we have enough spaces and seats available that provide, and the key is accountability and governance too, right? You want to be sure that you're sending someone to a place that has actionable uh, proof that they work. This becomes an equity issue again. Someone who yeah. has access to resources and insurance and money can go to a very relaxing space and, and get their heart and their head right and, and, and function. But if we are not providing spaces filled with dignity and respect and, and accountable methods of treatment, then we're losing sight of the of the long term picture here as well. And I'm not so sure that we have enough spaces, spaces. And, and geographically balanced spaces. And Shivana just took a new job. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Very good transition. Exactly. No, but it's it's good to say what. Yes. So so thank you, Gov. And um, to Senator Ruiz's point, um, I took a job at Children's Aid and Family Services, and they're sitting right over here. Thank you so much for joining Ellen and okay. Jessica. They run uh, with Bergen County Prosecutor's Office uh, peer recovery, peer support navigators. So one of the things that uh, we've done, we've done well in the legislature, is work with the Department of Human Services to fund peers actually going out into the community. Getting rid of stigma and bias, I have over 20 years in the field, the Gov knows this in psychiatry spaces. As we heard the medical panel up here, and not all of our legislative colleagues were here, but physicians are frustrated and we cannot uh, create equity, which we fall for, for mental health as well as for primary medical health services. Yep. 
So we have to know that there is some privacy that comes with mental health because of the stigmas and going to 17 different programs, providing a release that you wanna share that information. So not only uh, we heard from Dr. Purnell on the inequities which are real for black and brown people who try to access treatment uh, that are substandard if they can get treatment, but removing our biases as legislators to create access to Narcan and Naloxone, which we're using more and more and more to help people recover but then where do they go for treatment post that Narcan? So what I'm hoping for, and I agree with the physicians who were up here and the panel before us is early education. Early education so that we're sensitive as families. Instead of putting that loved one out and not understanding the hurts and the pains that got them to the trauma of using a prescribed medication for pain from a sports injury that seemed legal at the time where you took a pill to school and the kid thought it was candy, so they shared it and then became addicted. We need to educate our kids as early as possible. We also need to make sure that funding is there, and I say that to my colleagues, I'm proud of the work that we've done as a legislature to put money uh, towards this problem, but it's growing. So we're missing the mark somewhere so it's my hope that as we have these discussions and become a more informed New Jersey, that we continue to work together to combat this issue. Thank Thanks. you. I have Senator Gopal, Senator Scanlon, and then Senator Tester. I just, I, you know, I, I just love the idea of, of, of doing something, linking all the treatment centers and the acute care settings in the state of New Jersey on a map, figuring out where they are, then identifying a health education system information exchange so that you could track people electronically to go to the speaker's point. And then doctors would be more informed and patients would be more informed as to the connections. But that's an interesting, it's something that we, we haven't done yet in New Jersey. Senator Gopal, Senator, the, the Monmouth County constituency. Look, I, I think that, uh, first of all, to the governor, who has been incredible. Um, we were just with him uh, last week in Monmouth County, and uh, to Speaker Coughlin, whose leadership's incredible. Uh, you know, uh, Declan's a Republican, I'm a Democrat. This isn't a, a political issue, and the governor has made it clear. We saw it with former Governor Christie and now Governor Murphy, who, who was really both pushed for this. And we're saying, hanging out in Camden together. I know. <laughs> Uh, where uh, we got to get two billion for our hospitals in Monmouth. Uh, <laughs> we uh, we see this across our district. It doesn't matter black, brown, white. It's affecting everyone. We have a great nonprofit in our county, Tigger House. Yep. Um, but we're seeing access, and a lot of it is is what all the other speakers talked about: coordination of hospitals. We have five hospitals in our county, and and uh, making sure that healthcare services are all coordinating, making sure they're accessed, making sure information is legally being able to be shared. Um, it, it's, it's been a challenge. And so uh, anything obviously we can do with our colleagues in that effort, I think is gonna play a big role. So, so the, 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 the coordination is key, but to go back to Senator, we said, how about on the education piece? Like, like we haven't done that. And just the doctor, Dr. Baxter, who's been here since Moses, said we should be doing it, we should be doing it, we should be doing it. I mean, that's something that maybe we should be doing, right? As part of third grade, fourth grade teaching children. Yeah, I, I think we need to look, we should look at, uh, at uh, from age appropriate. And, and you know, we had a, a, and I'm sure you got great challenges in Essex. We had a 15 year old in, in uh, Asbury Park recently, Monmouth County Prosecutor's Office caught him and dropped a, a very heavy, uh, heavy weapon, uh, 15 years old, a legal gun that he got. And he had a, he was already on opioid addiction, um, 15 years old, um, a number of different things that he was taking. Um, so yes, I think it hits really, really young. It hits families young, it hits kids young. And I think that's something that we probably yeah. as a state need to do a lot more and on. Dr. Lewis from Rutgers was just saying, the problem is it's so acute, it's so toxic that the longer it goes untreated to go to what you said about your family, it almost becomes impossible. Senator. Governor, thank you for having us here. And as Vin mentioned, I, there, are, there are very few things in Trenton where there is as much unity uh, as attacking the addiction problem that, that plagues New Jersey. Uh, and, you know, we talk about equity, uh, it doesn't care. Addiction knows no bounds. Uh, sure. We got a batch of, there, there's a lot of rich kids who are dead 
from from this opioid crisis. Uh, it's it's something that unifies all of us. Uh, there's some philosophical differences in the approach, but certainly these basic things like education, like information exchange, we're 15 years past where we should have all of our medical records easily accessible if you grant it, and we do have privacy concerns, where it's ridiculous that that you go into a treatment center and you can't authorize the instant access to all of your medical records. It's insane. And we have to, I just, I just went in for a, a checkup, 12 pages, I was just telling the speaker, 12 pages of crap to fill out that I filled out a thousand times. Why can't, it's, it's amazing to me that, that and, yep. and it's tragic. My father, uh, who passed last year, would go in and he was 90. He doesn't remember what medications he's on. So another doctor is prescribing a, a medication that is going to uh, be contraindicated. Uh, that should be impossible at this point. Um, and same thing, especially with treatment centers. So uh, we all need to come together and make sure that that happens and fully on board with the education aspect too. Uh, look, right now, uh, education, uh, age appropriate education uh, about other topics yeah, has been has been haunting us. This is one where uh, we really know that our kids are at risk at these young ages, and we have to we have to get there. Yep. No question. And I, I want to thank uh, Senator Testa because he's been working so closely with us on the whole question with Rob Carter on the qu question of getting driver's licenses for putting our people back to work and. Um, I just uh, want to thank, we have all of the New Jersey reentry guys are getting jobs at Cumberland Dairy Farmers. How are they going to get there? I have no idea. But, go ahead. Senator, Good. thank you. Sincerely. No, Governor, thank you. I mean, look, that was, a, you know, that was, you know, for the folks that are listening and are in the audience, you know, to, to piggyback on what Senator O'Scanlan said, you know, this isn't a bipartisan issue. This is a human issue, right? This is a human being issue. And, you know, I, I'm, I work as a criminal defense lawyer, so... Seeing people addicted to drugs is something that I see, unfortunately, every day in my life. Sometimes it's some days are better than others. Uh, one of the things that I've seen, Governor, is that everybody seems to be in their own silo. So what Senator O'Scanlan was saying about being able to share information, you know, here we had Hendricks House in my backyard, didn't know that there was the New Jersey Reentry Corporation that could help their patients to be able to get driver's licenses, social security cards, birth certificates, so that they could get identification so that they can go to work. I mean, here, and like you said, everybody's going to go work at Cumberland Dairy because the owner at Cumberland Dairy but be really believes in the process, which is, which, is a phenomenal, which is a phenomenal thing. And I think we all really need to buy into, into this. The other thing that I've seen, you know, in, from the street aspect of this and, and hearing about the treatment of, you know, Buprenex, Suboxone, yeah. is the stigma of, many individuals believe, hey, you're just replacing heroin or fentanyl with another drug. And now, and now it's just being prescribed. That's a stigma that I think really needs to be erased because obviously the long-term goal is number one, to save lives. And number two, get to be people to be productive members of society so that they can have identification. The transportation yeah. issue in my area is gonna be a very difficult oh. issue. Uh, you know, Being in Cumberland County, we don't have a lot of public transportation. That's a real issue that an infrastructure issue that needs to be fixed. I know you're going to be helping with that. Um, <laughs> they have cars now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, it, but you know, and, and number three, I think the long-term goal is to, you're not going to be on Suboxone the rest of your life. I mean, you know, it's it's supposed to be a tapering off at some point. But that's that's the you know. And the, there's a little tension there in the in the treatment community. Because, there may be, but yeah. again, but. Again, who is the pharmacy to question yep. the doctors who are absolutely yep. the experts in this field? I yep. mean, you know, in what other field would someone be an expert, you know, and you're, and you're questioning your plumber on how they're going to fix, your, you yep. know, the pipes in your yep. house? Like, yep. you, you would never question your mechanic how they're fixing your car if you're not a mechanic. Yep. Yep. Now, all of a sudden, you have these non-experts who are questioning the physicians who are experts in this field. That's that's a real issue for me that I have, you know. But, so, Anza, can you tell us a little bit about your treatment modality? What happened? Sure. So the, the treatment center I'm at now, the Suboxone Center, um, you know, the doctor that's been treating me, uh, you know, he listens to me. So he, you know, he listens. 
And, you know, I asked him, you know, a couple months ago, I was like, all right, I'm ready to come down from four milligrams to two milligrams. And, you know, are you ready for that? And he was looking at the chart, looking at the urines. How you doing? He actually took a personal uh, interest in helping me. And, uh, and I went from the two milligrams and then I asked him, okay, doc, I want to cut that in half now. What do you think? And we sat and we talked a little. He's like, you got to listen to your body. And instead of coming in once a month, he decided to do every two weeks. So that way he could, you know, check my, uh, my analysis, you know, ask me what's going on. Am I feeling anything? Am I sleeping? And it's going good. You know, I'm on 0.7, which is half of the low end of a dough, but you know, but it's working good, you know. I'm not feeling any type of withdrawal. I'm sleeping great. So I'll be doing that for the next maybe uh, two to four more weeks. And then he suggested to cut that in half. Which, How important was MAT for you? I, I mean, MAT, it, it gave me, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, you know, you're talking about, uh, you're talking about, I have several, several felonies. I have one federal uh, uh, prison that I did, so, and countless in-betweens. You know, so I've been running into a brick wall for a little over 20 years, you know. So, you know, the MATs gave me the ability to do, I would probably wouldn't be here, you know. So, and, you know, the peer recovery, you know, last year I went to the school, you know, I did the in classroom thing, and now I'm doing uh, the internship hours, but I'm getting paid for it. I work at a facility where I get to help people, you know. So that's a big thing for me. Thanks, Enzo. So, you know, Enzo's the reason. So, when you think about MAT and go back to Senator's point, is is removing the bias, and we hear Dr. Baxter said that again and again about bias. And and Senator Ruiz said, and Senator Stanfeld said that people that were grappling with pain and addiction in the twilight of their life or people that were trying to grapple. So, so what do we do to to make that better, Gene, for your for your family member. Is there something we could do and you being in law enforcement? Um, the education, oh, thanks. The education piece is essential, but um, law enforcement has really come a long way. Uh, for people that don't know me, I've been in law enforcement for 25 years. I was a sheriff in Burlington County for 18 years and I've seen the evolution and it's amazing. It's amazing. And we went from just, you know, throwing people in jail and, and just watching them, you know, flounder to now um, in Burlington, we have a couple of great programs. One is straight to treatment yep. so that when someone um, is encountered, maybe, maybe they have to be revived with Narcan or what, whatever, they're given the chance to go straight to a treatment program and they have beds available. They make sure it's seamless and um, they don't get charged. Um, we also um, do Hope One which um, started in Morris County. And when I was sheriff, we started it in Burlington, where- Matthew. Yeah, go ahead. It, where it's, um, it's a mobile outreach unit that goes out to people that are having um, issues that are maybe you know living on the street or whatever. And they get Narcan training. Family members can come get Narcan training and free Narcan. They get to talk to counselors to put them right into treatment if, that's where the, if they're ready for that at that point in time. But again, it's a law enforcement and uh, behavioral health com combination there that makes people feel comfortable enough to come up and get help and the fact that there is immediate help and it's not um, a lag period because we know during those lag periods you know um, bad choices get made so it's a seamless program so I'm just happy to see that that evolution in law enforcement is really you know um, been a drastic change over my years in, in the so it's the law enforcement Siobhan did you Thank you. And, and we are uh, grateful that we realize we cannot police our way out of this epidemic. Uh, but one of the barriers to um, stabilizing individuals is housing. Finding supportive housing where they actually can have case management and supports in the living space is another, is another critical piece that I hope we advocate for that's yeah. affordable. Well, I know Eliana has, and, and the, the, you know, what we'd like to do is transi <laughs> transitional housing, and and transitional housing makes sense. People need it for six months, nine months, 18 months. Unfortunately, the Department of Community Affairs wants permanent housing, um, which is problematic in the community, problematic all over, but it's been a perennial problem in New Jersey, the need for transitional housing. When somebody comes out of jail, when somebody comes out of addiction, they need to get settled quickly and rapidly 
The only thing that works now is Oxford houses. And the Oxford houses, there's quite a few of them in Monmouth County, in Ocean County, parts of Essex. But the reality is, is the demand is so much greater. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because we've seen right and there's stats that if you don't have the transitional housing piece so you so you get out you're in the program let's just say even if you start while you're incarcerated um yep. and then you get enter into the program but if you don't have a place to live uh, at least temporarily while you're getting all your information what's the point you're going to end up going to do what it is that you know what to do and where to go because it's your familiarity so you end up going back to the same point where you, you started at yeah so if we don't advocate for transitional housing. And I think transitional housing, it's also important because it's, it's not permanent. There is mm. oversight. There is yep. different conversations. And even, you know, communities will appreciate that more so than the long-term piece because there there's a different aspect to transitional. Like you yep. were literally helping people to move on into a better space in their life. Yeah. And one of the things we're trying to do in Essex is, is, you know, when people go through the biggest pot of money is welfare, general assistance, and people whether it's temporary emergency housing, and they'll go to one site, another site, another site. What we're trying to do is congregate care housing for court-involved persons. So all those mothers will be together, all those individuals will be together because they all have different demands because there are certain jobs that aren't accessible to people that are court-involved. They have certain addiction treatment needs. So the ironically, instead of just taking a check and going to this building or that building and the next building, we're trying to bring people together uh, with with the chief of staff, Phil Lodges, huh? who, who just made his way in, into Where the is he? by the way, he's Where's over the... here, over here. Oh, okay. The... There he is. <laughs> I gave him a shout out. I didn't even know he was here. <laughs> Take it back. That's funny. One thing we've seen drug courts, right? And I, I know that there's been an express need to revisit um, that law because there are huge um, gaps and spaces where I think policy can get revamped. And, uh, you know, not to use this opportunity, but to shop a bill, I have a mental health court diversion program. We just saw, I see some of my colleagues calling for that we need a statewide approach to this. Essex County has been since its inception that um, Judge Grant put a program together. There really is what you're talking about, that collaborative model where people are sitting in a room and looking at that human being from point of entering the courtroom to best practices, wraparound services, and then going back into yep. society. So courts has to be part of this conversation. Uh, we have to revisit uh, the drug court system because I think okay. that there's some gaps in those spaces that probably just need some modification. And we have to, you know, all of us can sit up here and say these are all great things. And the bottom line is it, there's investment that is needed in all these programs. So during our budget process, we have to be truthful about what we're saying here today, making sure that we're making those investments in human capital. And so well, one of the things we're doing, we can, Clap for Senator Williams. Um, <laughs> so, 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 but one of the things, exactly, one of the things we're trying to do is now is pre-entry services. Yeah. So what we've always done in the past is somebody's been walking out of prison, we'll provide them right. services. And so now we're trying to, after bail reform, yeah. there were so many people released that didn't have services. And so now we have a, a proposal before Judge Grant for... Union County and for Monmouth County to do pre-entry services to see how that will work to provide for them addiction treatment, provide for a housing, provide for job tra training. So hopefully between the space of arrest and adjudication, they have a stabilization of their lives. Mayor? Thanks, Governor. I want to dovetail on what said. By the way, I'm glad you have your Seton Hall pin on. I, you talk about pa <laughs> pandering to the I'm audience. I'm pilot, alumnus of Seton Hall University. Well, Thank the you. speaker of St. John. So he, we were so encouraged that Coach Shaheen Holloway is going to lead us to the Final Four this year. But Yeah, whatever. <laughs> I'm a Mets fan. We have to be realistic in our expectations. Right, Phil? So, Senator Stanfield, I want to – yeah, I know. I was seeking your sympathy. So, Senator Stanfield, I want to actually dovetail what you're saying relative to law enforcement because we've hired someone within our police department that's a manager of alternate, alternate public safety strategies – and she deals almost exclusively with outreach relative to this issue. So we saw that it was important enough to aggressively seek grant funding for that purpose. And then to dovetail on Assemblywoman, Sumter, Assemblywoman Sumter's point relative to the housing and supportive housing, we partnered with our hospital, St. Joe's. Yeah. And in a few months, we'll be cutting the ribbon on 56 units for people with 
addiction and other special needs. And then to you, you already have some room some to vote, but I oh, know. I think it's a twice. It's twice. The election's over. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's time for governing. Yeah, exactly. Governor. Exactly. But the point is, is that I, I appreciate on the housing, but I love what was said here before is because we're, we're, our model is we try to provide continued care for 12 to 18 months. Yeah. So 12 to 18 months is our benchmark. So that goes. For, and if I may, Senator, uh, Governor, to Senator Ruiz's point relative to the drug court, Patterson will be unveiling in a few weeks community court to make a holistic approach to addiction and other issues that we've been grappling with for quite some time. Shamelessly pandering. Well, you gave me the mic. I paid for this mic. Yeah, I just wanted to add on to what Senator Ruiz said about the court involvement. I'm on the uh, New Jersey Jobs Committee that Judge Grant runs, and it really... um, it's the employment community together with people that are in recovery court, used to be called drug court, um, and that they're complying. They make wonderful um, employees. Wake Fern had 300 people and wanted yep. 300 more um, because you have employees that are being drug tested. They're being coached on um, what's expected in employment, and they show up for work. They have, you know, there's consequences for them if they don't, and they are in the workforce, uh, many have gotten promoted, they've become, you know, long-term em- employees. Sure. So it's been a great program started in Atlantic County and it's continuing, but we're working very hard sure. on that. So so I just want to just crystallize and then we're gonna, just gonna go down the list after some moment. So it's education, early childhood education on addiction. Two, a mapping. Mapping of all acute and local mental health and addiction treatment centers for the state of New Jersey. A mapping so you know where all those resources are. Three is a health information exchange so that to go to what Senator O'Scanlan and the speaker said is that you're able to track um, all that information within the confines in New Jersey. Four is also employment and better connecting employment. And I know Senator Tester, you're doing that with a working group in Cumberland County is a working group to connect people to their skills, to training and to work. So those are four tangible areas that go back to the larger question of how we have p- helped people coming out of addiction. But the last thing was also housing. And I think someone wanted to say something. I really wanted to uplift in the employment section, the recovery specialists, the peer navigators. Uh, this is an opportunity for a person who is in recovery to become educated, become skilled, start with the base of upwards of $40,000 and moving up and connecting with people to move them through. A strong career path when we don't have enough psychiatrists, we don't have enough social workers to care for persons who are suffering from substance abuse. So again, it's a new career pathway that we can build upon across the state and really hold folks' hands to get them over the finish line and provide the internships, which is another challenge for them to get the hours so they can be fully credentialed. So we're, we're gonna provide the five point outline for all the legislators here. And Senator? Yep. Yep. No challenge. Thank you. Thank you. No, I appreciate that. We're, we're the kind of people I hated in college. No. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right, Senator. Governor, I'm going to take some cues from the mayor and have a shameless plug here. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm. Yeah, exactly. We're like, we can't even get close. No. So you know, I'm co chair of the Manufacturing Caucus. And, and this is one of the things that I've really learned, you know, being at Hendricks House, talking to Rob Carter, who's your ambassador and a great ambassador he is for New Jersey Reentry Corporation. You know, so many of these individuals, you know, not only do they want, a job, they want a career, 
Yep. Right. They, they want a career, which is very different than just some entry level job. And, and, I, and I, I so, you know, the average manufacturing job in the state of New Jersey with overtime is about ninety five thousand dollars per year. That's not Mike Testa's statistic. That's from New Jersey Manufacturing Extension yep. Program. I can tell you manufacturers are starving for employees right now. Yep. So I can tell you, you know, working with the reentry corporation and the manufacturing caucus, I think it's sort of a match made in heaven for yep. people who are coming out of Hendricks House once they have that identification. And I think it's really going to be a pathway back through our community colleges throughout the state of New Jersey because you can have a six month certificate or a year certificate. And then the employers, it's going to behoove them to pay for those individuals that have proven themselves to get a two-year associate's degree and then beyond. And I think you're going to see a real pathway back. So not only the education component that's necessary at the young age, that's age appropriate, right, Senator Gopal? And obviously education, once a person is out in society and has become a productive member of society who's proven themselves. Yep. No, but we're doing that now. We have a culinary program in Brookdale. We have uh, in Hudson, we're doing welding, CDL, HVAC, and so we're starting to do it. What? And Carney, and exactly. The, thank you. At the Carney Training Center. So I, I just appreciate that. It's training, training, training. Industry recognized credentials that overcome your court jacket so that you're competitive in the marketplace. To go to what you said earlier, you need that plumber, you need that CDL, you need that HVAC. Well, Senator? I just want to, to say one thing, Governor. If you remember when Governor McGreevy came to Monmouth County five or six years ago, you remember the response he got. Monmouth is very conservative. And they looked at him literally like he had multiple heads, some of the county officials and others. Uh, but through Senator O'Scanlan and others, it's completely different now, six years later. Everybody is all in. And if I could just really quick, anything, Mom, if I do, can I just give a shout out to Brian? Because he's God sent. And Brian is amazing. Brian, Brian Montgomery, just a shout out. So I, I well, Ben, I went on the story of you, me, and Tom are known when I, I, I got confused. This is a, this is the interest of, of full disclosure between Neptune and Neptune City. So I said Neptune City. That, that must be Democrat. Neptune must be Republican. Little did I know that in in Mammoth it's reversed. Yeah. And then I got a call from my dear friend Tom Arnold, and he said he almost gave them all a heart attack. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. He's said, like, they're going to come into our town here, exactly, and exactly. the governor promised them everything would be okay. The the roads wouldn't burn down. People wouldn't have to exactly. End. The sky wouldn't attack. fall. And the irony is, is the, the folks, as Brian knows, the folks that are coming, or we got a couple of guys right there. Raise your hands in the back. That that those guys are from Monmouth County and they're getting addiction treatment and we're putting them to work. So, so thank you. So it's just, you know, and I also want to give credit to Governor Christie because he said when we first started that Monmouth and Ocean was then the epicenter of the addiction crisis. And candidly, the guys and gals I work with didn't want to chase Percocet and oxycodone and fentanyl. I mean, just to be blunt, the kids in the hood were like, I'm staying away from that crap. And and it was just, it was sad because the kids in Ocean and Monmouth would literally chase the stamp of a friend of theirs who had died from, from Percocet and from, or excuse me, from fentanyl. And so it's just, it's, what? Yeah, so it's just in any event. But thank you, Senator. Right, so uh, just to wrap up, because we got the great um, Dr. Petrus Livonis, Dr. Frank Anasia, and uh, Dr. Dr. Livonis is the president of the American Psychiatric Association and chairman of Rutgers um, Department of Psychiatry and a great partner for NJRC. And we're about to use third and fourth year psychiatric residents to treat our clients. Yeah, it's really good. It's really good to go to what... Eliana and Senator Tupperi said, it's like you're going to give them the same level of care, God willing, you'd give their family member. Um, so we heard, and I appreciate it in the workforce. Anything you want to say about work? Uh, not work. Uh, just real quick. This is the Jersey City Italian version. <laughs> no, you know, just real quick about the peer recovery uh, coaching. And, you know, it was instrumental because, you know, a person like me, 
what, why didn't I die? What, you know, why didn't I completely overdose, right? Because I have a story to tell. I have lives or whatever to touch. And in the process of doing that, I help myself. And, you know, me listening to a peer recovery coach that has the experience that I have, I'm going to be all ears because I'm going to be like, you have an, uh, an endless amount of wealth and, I mean, it's wealth, uh, information to give, you know, that, you know, and I'm not putting down anyone that's, you know, uh, that does the college thing for the addiction, but it's just, it just goes hand in hand, the actual street experience with, you know, the recovery coach experience. It's, it just goes hand in hand. That's all. All right, so we're just going to go down the line. If I just ask the legislators, I just go down the line. So we have a five points that we're going to do, and we'll submit it to respectfully to the legislators and hopefully get some movement. But I just want you to think about in terms of here, when we talked about education, health information exchange, and I appreciate uh, the points that were made earlier. Um, and then what is it that, that you think we can do to improve access to MAT? And what is it that we can do? I mean, I heard what Jean said, excuse me, Senator Stanfield, I heard what Senator Ruiz said about struggle. What can we do to pull apart, even if we're working with law enforcement, so people don't have these challenges to, to, to take MAT? Senator, you want to just use this mic? Sure. I mean, I said it earlier, Governor. You know, I think just the stigma needs to be removed. I mean, you know, the, again, there's a lot of people that I've spoken to, you know, just general population folks that say, yeah, but the person is now off of heroin, fentanyl, but now they're on Suboxone or Methadone or, you know, how long is this going to be and, and how are my tax dollars affected? And, you know, and something that I think that the point that I made when Rob Carter visited Hendrick's house, and I, and I want to make this very clear, it costs a whole lot more to incarcerate somebody, you know, you know in, in this state. It costs a lot of money to incarcerate someone in the state. So if we can actually save lives and show people that we're, there's a, not only a life savings, but a cost savings, Everybody wins in this scenario. And again, I think there needs to be a real removal of the stigma and that people's lives are really worth it. These aren't just numbers. These are actual human beings. And I said it from the very beginning, this isn't a partisan issue. This is a human being issue, right? This isn't Republicans, Democrats up here. We're here as New Jerseyans who really care, I think. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. So. And you drove the car Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Governor. I think continuing forums such as this, uh, where it's a diverse room, you got the key legislators out who will take it back to our respective caucuses to continue to work on the issue. Education, education, and destigmatizing. There was a time where medication assisted therapies were not in vogue, Need needle exchange, that was a battle. We've come a long way, but there is more road to cover, and we're here for it. Yeah, I, I just want to echo again the education piece. Um, when I was sheriff, we did work with the juveniles that were starting to get into trouble with the system. And we brought up Project Pride. It came from the Department of Corrections. Inmates that had their own stories to tell. They were young inmates. And the kids related to them so well. Um, they, they heard their individual stories. And we had lunch with them. And they could ask questions. And I think we need the same thing with people who are in recovery that have walk the walk, meet the talk to the kids. And I think as the kids become more understanding of the issue, hopefully adults will also become more understanding of the issue and, and recognize it for what it is. So I think, you know, we're on the right track. And thank you for everything you're doing. So for over two years, we've been trying to put this pandemic behind us, but for far longer, we've had an epidemic, mm -hmm. this opioid epidemic. And now we can contextualize and see that this is a global community. And Senator Tessa, you're right. We, we have to humanize this situation because it is someone's brother, sister, mother, daughter that is afflicted with this addiction and is struggling. And so what can we do as leaders, whether you're a legislative leader or an executive leader? Well, we have to become more solution oriented and then create that synergy because someone mentioned silos. So that's exactly what we're trying to do. And hopefully when we roll out Real Fix, it was just piloted we can serve as a model for others to emulate because Michael Bloomberg is data driven, but we also have to be compassion driven as well. And he'll be visiting Patterson, not only to deliver the check because he didn't give us the million dollars. Somebody told me it was in the mail. But when he comes and personally delivers the check, he'll see for himself the individuals that are struggling with opioid use disorder. So we have to focus on that early education, but also the outreach. And that's why 
in other governments struggling with this, municipal governments, they should staff up and get individuals who can solely focus on this epidemic within the pandemic. You want this? No, I, 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 I thought it was going to just be like, we're going to just listen to Patterson. I was going to have Rick, please. <laughs> Don't worry, Nork is in the house. Thank you. Uh, just saying. Oh, just saying. Uh, the, so I want to give a, a great uh, shout out to Governor McGreevy who said, so for, for all of you who haven't worked with him, when he said we're going to develop these packages and we're going to share it with the legislature, that is his clear indication that by the end of this year, half of those bills are going to get done because his tenacity you gets, uh, is, is, is the passion and the tenacity. Right. It's like everybody just says, just do it already because we don't want to get an email from yes. him again. So yes. he is a fighter uh, with purpose. So thank you for the work that you do. Um, Listen, I've taken a page from that. The speaker can tell you. He, he, he gets to the point, just, just do it for her already because I'm over it. Um, <laughs> I'm kidding. Whatever works, though. The speaker was shaking his head yes. Yes, he agrees <laughs> me, no. We, so, I'm just trying to figure out how much this is going to cost. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think everyone has said it. Prevention, education, co cohesion, continuum of care, I, I, you know, best practices. I think we have to revisit some of the programs that we've put in place and make yeah. sure that they're fulfilling the commitment and the intent of the law. We have to look at what can better um, create those other bridges to get somebody to becoming a full rounded, uh, successful taxpayer and integrated back into yep. life. We could have to continue to uplift truth in these conversations as uncomfortable that it can make any one of us be in these spaces. We have to make secured investments in this because policy without having the reinforcement of, of funding, it goes uh, nowhere. Um, and, and then I have a question for everyone here and it does not have to get answered now, but it's something that I found out and, 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 and you and I can speak offline about this because maybe, you know, I had a conversation with a couple of police officers. They were telling me just this past weekend, a young woman overdosed and they, they gave her nar the Narcan and, and she came back. But if that person after receiving Narcan refuses to go to the hospital, there is nothing else to do. And so I think that's a space where we have yep. to have a conversation about that. If you're getting Narcan, it is a clear indication that there is an issue. How can the person just get up and leave? And I understand that that is the law, but as lawmakers, in a, and I don't know enough about this, right? So I'm just putting it out there. You can email me. What can we better do when we know that there's someone as vulnerable who's still saying no after they've been resuscitated? Okay. And then the other area, as Phil will tell you, is also in county jails, people that are mentally ill, they can refuse their meds even when it's clearly in their interest. And it's really painful, Phil, it's really painful for us, the task force, that literally people not in their right space are refusing pharmaceutical prescriptions that would actually help them and they're not even in the right space to make the decision not to take it. I mean, that's not true for state prison where they have to take it, but we'd love to see that reevaluated for county jails. Yeah, so, so I think it's multiple with that and I would just sound off the alarm like I will. It, you know, circumstances lead people to these kind of spaces. Yeah. And when we see the numbers that are going to come out with learning loss, that is a call to action, even though all of us in this room are not in the education space. If you think that that generation of children will not turn to something else because they will be desperate for work, then we're going to lose sight of what our moral obligation is in this country. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Uh, so I, I uh, want to reiterate that sometimes we do things because we, we, we want to do, we feel it's the right policy, but I don't think anyone knows how annoying Governor McGreevy can be when he doesn't get his way or if he's on a particular issue. Yeah. No, he knows. He knows, how, he knows how I feel. I'm going to go. Yeah, I say it. It's annoying. But, um, you know, Governor McGreevy, thank you very much because I always say this. Um, you know, I want to thank you because... You were one of the, the few people early on, many years ago, that you brought a lot of these issues to the forefront because beforehand, we were all embarrassed to talk about addiction and mental health. Mm 
So I just want to congratulate you again, time and time again, because if it wasn't for you, we would still be doing things the wrong way. And you uh, really brought us to, to a different light. I think for myself and you and I have been involved in this, the, the transitional housing, housing really has to be something very important because I don't think we can um, continue to help and, and serve those that don't have a place to live after the fact. And that's completely unacceptable in 2022, um, especially after the pandemic and what some of those Thank inmates you. coming out have gone through. Um, number two is, and I think you come to me um, uh, quite a few years ago when funding was cut for uh, your program, but I think that it's just, uh, it's an issue that we shouldn't even be talking about. I think reentry services need to continue not only existing, but only expanding. And we've had those conversations even when it comes to halfway houses and other places um, that there's really a supportive space. And, and I think um, number three, a lot of us talked about it and you said it is how we can change. And I think with those like Phil Elijah that's here, that's overseeing the Essex County uh, Correctional Facility, but how we can um, change some of the things that have been implemented. I think that some of these things were implemented for uh, security reasons yep. and for um, having patients be self-aware. But at what point does that self-awareness stop? And do we do what's best for that person as a human being? Amen. Right. So I think that that's something that we also need to take a look at. So I just want to say thank you to you. And I want to say thank you to, you know, how strong you are, because coming up here and talking about your story, um, you know, we can all offer services, but you've made a decision to change your life. So I congratulate you today. Thank you, Enzo. Next time you'll come up, you know, you'll get all this praise. No, no, not now. You'll be here for two years. My friend James. <laughs> Been stepped on so many times. Yeah, so many times that, yeah. it, that if you go to court and you say not guilty, they can't find it because they're conclusive. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's just, um, I'm going to have to go back. No, no, James. Well, on, on the ticket piece, mm -hmm. we do a lot to clean up the warrants, but the reality is, as James said, MVC will not reduce the outstanding course to MVC. So we have legal points of contact in every one of the sites. So if it's in Newark, we'll get it addressed. If it's in Red Bank, we'll get addressed. The problem is the MVC piece of the fine, we can't get reduced. So there's a little known statute that converts prison time and monetizes it. So we can get all, well, you know, if you go into Woodbridge Municipal Court, we can get that fine, that warrant thrown out. But the problem is, is the MVC fine itself is there to the grave and beyond. So that's something that is a real burden for our guys and gals because it 
if they can't, you can make a deal with NBC for say, for example, for they have to negotiate $30 a week or whatever. But sometimes when you're trying to pay everything else, it just becomes onerous. But thank and, you, and James. And you'll be suspended pending your hearing. That's the problem yep. as well. So exactly. I, I handle that space quite yeah. often. So, yeah. So, Senator Gopal? Just to uh, echo everybody else, uh, you know, this would have been unheard of 10 years ago to have a room like this on this topic. It's pretty incredible how far we've come. And uh, that's essentially on Governor McGreevy um, and his ability to bring a lot of people together on a very, very difficult issue. Uh, and, and it's really, really incredible. So uh, I'm really hopeful. I'm optimistic. We can look at things in the Senate Education Committee as it relates to stigma and awareness. Thank you. Um, and there are some incredible colleagues up here. The the former Burlington County Sheriff, who's now a state my colleague, she's got incredible experiences in law enforcement now, lawmaking. So I think everyone here hopefully has different skill sets they can uh, bring. Phil is getting a lot of shout outs more than Joe D. I thought that was yeah, odd. Exactly. But, uh, it's exactly. Uh, I'm not. It's your colleague. It's not me. I'm not. <laughs> Um, but everybody is collectively on this issue, and the speaker, and the budget chair, and the majority. But I also chair, like so. the question of medication that Senator Absolutely. Lee's, like that's Senator Scallon. Again, thank you for having us, yeah. and uh, I'll echo, echo everyone else. Uh, this is a sign of the progress that we've made over the past 10, 15 years. Uh, I was growing up; my mother was addicted to alcohol. Nobody knew what was going on behind that door. Uh, we hit it. Uh, when my mom died of it, several people said, I didn't even know she drank. Well, she was drinking for 30 years, gallons of vodka a day sometimes. Today, it's, you can talk about it. You can get people help. You can, yeah. So we're making progress. Um, but the, the stigma is still there. It was just a few years ago, uh, I, I was going to a ribbon cutting for a treatment center in a suburb that now Senator Gopal represents. And my staff said, are you sure you want to go? The neighbors are going to be there screaming. I'm like, that's why I need to go. Uh, and they were there and they were screaming. And I screamed back in my element. I kind of like that. Uh, and, and I told these people, you're all wrong. You're stigmatizing something that shouldn't be stigmatized. The people that are showing up here aren't a threat to your children. Plus, my daughter had to walk by this uh, treatment center to go to school. So I, I came with some credibility. A few years later now, I talked to the police chief just the other day. Not one call. Not one complaint. Yep. So we need to keep making that progress and all of us need to be there and be heard like we are today. So thank you for asking. Thank, thank you, Senator. And Speaker from the Sacred Soil of Woodbridge. <laughs> so I'm going to take what we call a point of personal privilege in Trenton. And I'm going to tell you that I have known Jim McGreevy, Governor McGreevy, longer and better than everyone here. Our friendship and our association goes back what is measured in decades 35 or so years uh if you think he's a pain in the neck now you should have seen him he he was a, a fine mayor and he was an extraordinary governor even though he fired me from being the municipal chair once um i've gotten past it it's only been you know well, it was years 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 so. Me, so i know i know who the power was yeah I, I heard his father and his sister now works for us. So, family now, if they're coming back to me, Sharon, you're in trouble. No, I'm only kidding. The, the truth of the matter is, is I've, I've seen the evolution of Jim McGreevy, who was a terrific mayor, who was a terrific governor. But I think, in fairness, Jim, you have found your cause and your purpose. This is, this is it. We don't do anything but agitate. You guys make it happen. I usually do a solo, Jim. <laughs> So, no, but the truth of the matter is, is you have you found your cause and your purpose because you are changing lives, which is something you've always cared about doing. Uh, this conference, this coming together of people from all over the, the re-entry areas, of coming together of people who care about changing the world relative to uh, addiction is wholly because of you. Uh, and because of your commitment and dedication and willingness to be a pain in the neck when it takes, you know, 10 emails to get me to commit to something in the budget. When it takes, <laughs> tens kind, uh, when it takes the kind of tenacity that you show. So how do we, we go about this and what do we take from this? Well, we take first of all that uh, there are people who genuinely care about making a difference. There are people who care about coming together. And I think one of the things that we have to do is recognize that a holistic approach to addressing this is 
is the way to go. And I think a great starting point is by having people of both parties on this panel who recognize that this isn't, as Senator Tesla pointed out, this isn't a Democratic or Republican issue. This isn't a bipartisan issue. This is about caring for people because there's probably nobody in this room who doesn't know someone or the or is closely associated with somebody who has had to deal with addiction. And we know we can change it if we commit to it. And so we have to commit to it, but we have to start early because like so many things, that there's, no, you know, there's no illness that the doctor says, thank God we found it later, yep. right? So it's true. that's true with mental health. It's true about addiction. We need to start early. We need to recognize the signs. We need to educate parents. And we need to, as it's been mentioned so many times, destigmatize these things. People who are addicted to drugs are not bad people. The people who have a problem, have a medical condition the same way, having a broken leg. Nobody looks at somebody with a broken leg and says, that's a bad guy. We say that somebody who broke their leg. We need to do that with mental health. We need to do that with addiction. And we can if we have the willingness to do that. And a good place to start on it is to talk about it and bring it out into the open. And that's what you've done for all of us. So thank you for that. And th you know, give them a big round of applause for that. And that's where it starts with people of, of with the same intent. Now we'll have to work through some things to get there. Or, you know, all of us will have different ideas. Thank God about how we get there. Right? It's better to have good ideas and it's better to debate it. But where there's a commonality of purpose and where there's a willingness to say we have to get there, we can do it. And you're bringing that about by this conference, and this panel is doing it and has the ability to do it by coming together. So thank you for all of that. Thank you. And can I just ask everybody to stand up and give these guys a round of applause? This has like been phenomenal. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Do we break now? It's up to you. It's up to you. All right, so Dr. Lavona said we can break, and so we'll break for 15 minutes, grab your lunch, come back here, and we'll hear from the great Dr. Petros Lavonis. And the Bergen County Prosecutor is here. He's ready to negotiate plea bargains on table 12. Yeah. I appreciate it, thank you so much.
the microphone, right? Yeah. Yeah. What are you going to do with Crawford? Right there. He doesn't want to do it down here? Beyond fentanyl, this next psychiatry. You're going to do it from there? Oh, you don't like the I love it. I love it. I love it. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Ready? Here's the camera. Thanks, Chris. We gotta go. Thank you very much. Well, I'm just gonna ask Alex, can you shut those doors over there in the back? This is a, a treat for all of us. Dr. Petros Livonis has an outstanding background, an academic career, chair of the Department of Psychiatry at Rutgers Medical College, and a long and storied history with psychiatry and with addiction treatment. And most recently, he was selected as president of the American Psychiatric Association. And I believe in terms of thought leaders in this country, he is among the most thoughtful and informed individuals to guide this nation on the question of addiction and psychiatry. And so no one will get this treasure this is worth listening to Jim McGreevy's corny jokes for two years. It's really a great pleasure to present Beyond Femmo, What's Next for Psychiatry and Addiction Treatment by Dr. Petros Livonis, President of the American Psychiatric Association. Thank you so much, Jim. Uh, it's always uh, a pleasure, but also a big honor to be invited uh, to give a, a talk uh, following these uh, in incredible thought leaders that we've had in the morning, both on the scientific side and on the legislative side. So um, I know quite a few of you in the audience. I knew I know quite a lot of people who were here uh, on the panel. And uh, if you heard uh, about fentanyl from uh, Lou Baxter and uh, Louis Nelson and a number of my colleagues, then you're very, very well versed uh, on fentanyl. So I want to talk more about uh, where do we go from here, some of the ideas of what's coming up next. Next slide. Uh, the way I would like to do that is some uh, introductory remarks about the lay of the land, and then delve onto new laws, new medicines, new medications that you have, new therapies, new technologies, and the new social context within which we do all our work. Next slide. So let's start with the lay of the land. And of course, we cannot uh, uh, ignore the pandemic. Next slide. This is a, a, a classic slide about phases of recovery in the pandemic. I have to uh, thank my colleague, uh, Dr. Frank Ginassi, for this uh, slide. Uh, he sent it to us uh, in the beginning of the pandemic and has been very informative since. So essentially it says, we get the disaster, we have a honeymoon period where everybody is kumbaya, yeah, 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 let's just uh, fight this together. And then there's a disillusionment, this, uh, disillusionment uh, phase followed by the reconstruction and the recovery. Now, the timeline is off on this slide, uh, primarily because this was meant for a, a, a disaster of an acute nature, something like 9-11. Uh, but of course, the pandemic, it's a much more protracted disaster, so uh, the timeline is not exactly accurate. When it comes to addiction, when it comes to what we're going through right now, uh, I feel we're at the very bottom of this, uh, of this graph right here. Uh, we have gone through the heroic and the honeymoon phase, and now we are entering this very tough period of huge mortality, uh, deaths from uh, overdose uh, right and left, uh, people being very tired of uh, the pandemic, the workforce being decimated, and uh, yet we are uh, 
supposed to and we're here to, uh, to help our patients. So that's where, where we are. Next slide. This is something you have seen over and over and over again. It's the state of the opioid uh, epidemic. And of course, fentanyl in purple right here is the one primarily responsible for the spike in deaths that we have seen over the past couple of years. Uh, this graph ends in 2022, and uh, I can tell you that because of the most recent full data that we have, but things have not gone better. If anything, things have gone worse. So uh, in terms of addiction, in terms of the opioid epidemic, we are into the thick of things compounded by the, uh, the pandemic, this COVID-19 pandemic, and the incredible uh, uh, repercussions that that has uh, in terms of uh, workforce and uh, people's disillusionment. So in some ways, we're at the perfect storm of uh, different forces putting our patients, especially our most vulnerable patients, at highest risk. Next slide. All right, new laws. This is the, the, the CRISPR one, not the easiest, but the, the most uh, straightforward part of, of this talk and uh, have the new, uh, next slide. Uh, our major effort is access to care. Access to care, and that can take two different uh, facets. One is uh, getting rid of the course, getting rid of the buprenorphine course. Uh, we love the course. Uh, Dr. Uh, Clement Chen right here in the audience teaches a bunch of them. His next one, I believe, is uh, November 3rd at uh, Rutgers and JMS. It's the promotional part of the talk. Uh, we love giving that course, uh, uh, but at the same time, it's yet another barrier to treatment. It's, uh, it's uh, something that has to go, and we do have uh, a legislation in place. We uh, met with, Dr. Men uh, with uh, Bob Menendez, with Senator Menendez's uh, office last week. We are meeting with uh, 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 Senator uh, Cory Booker's uh, office in a couple of weeks. We really hope to pass the MAT Act and uh, eliminate the waiver. The second one is to uh, make permanent the uh, allowances that have been uh, extended, uh, primarily because uh, in terms of telehealth and phone health to our patients during the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. So these are the two major ones helping us uh, go forward with access to care. All right, next slide. All right, this is, uh, uh, this is research that comes out of our own shop, out of Rutgers, and it is fascinating because it really uh, uh, puts to question the, the boogeyman of diversion. Nobody wants to see buprenorphine being diverted. We all agree to that, but it's not quite as much of a menace as most people think and therefore promote barriers to access to treatment. Uh, what you see in front of you is uh, retention curves, how much people stayed in treatment if they were positive for non-prescribed buprenorphine at intake uh, to a, a program versus if the urine toxicology examination was negative uh, for buprenorphine, that's in red, uh, when, they were, when they showed up for an intake uh, at, the, at the treatment program. And as you can see from, the, from this slide, people who already had some experience with buprenorphine, even if it was non-prescribed buprenorphine, end up faring better than people who were buprenorphine naive. Uh, it's yet another piece in the puzzle of, uh, of buprenorphine, but it actually does show that uh, diversion is not really the enemy. The enemy is barriers to treatment is lower access to care. If we're able to give buprenorphine, prescribe buprenorphine to our patients, then we wouldn't need to have this kind of diversion and you wouldn't have the, uh, these kind of problems. All right, um, next slide. So let's think about medicines. Let's think about medications. Next slide. The first one that caught our attention was uh, cannabis. Uh, marijuana. Uh, earlier research showed that states where cannabis, uh, cannabis laws 
uh, were uh, quite extensive, uh, states that had liberalized cannabis for medical uh, reasons and recreational reasons may have shown a decrease in opioid use and decrease in opioid overdoses. Unfortunately, this kind of early optimism was met with some disappointment when the study went national. And what you have in front of you here is the results of that study that showed actually that the more the frequent the marijuana use, the higher the opioid use disorder uh, uh, in, a, in a population. And the interesting thing about this research is that the wave one cannabis use uh, was measured at, let's say, point, uh, you know, uh, today, and then the opioid use disorder was measured at a subsequent time. So what happened here is that the more cannabis use uh, that we uh, the, that we studied, the more cannabis use that, uh, that we see, the higher the opioid problem in the future. And that, of course, has given us pause in terms of our early enthusiasm that maybe uh, cannabis was part of the answer to the uh, opioid epidemic. Uh, we have been much, much less enthusiastic about that uh, these days. Next slide. Uh, on the other hand, something that has been more uh, promising is uh, the use of uh, psilocybin. Psilocybin is the active ingredient in uh, mushrooms, in uh, uh, magic mushrooms, if uh, people want to say that. Uh, and uh, there are some early results. This is uh, in terms of alcohol use disorder, which is the first addiction that has been studied extensively uh, as uh, a, a target for psilocybin. And uh, quite possibly, there is some signal there, of course, not for everyday use, not for clinical use. This is just a research finding. There's a lot more work to be done before we can sign on the dotted line and say psilocybin for addiction. We don't want to have uh, uh, psilocybin be prescribed or, or actually being dispensed in a way that is not regulated. We do not want to have the same trouble that we've seen with the tobacco industry or with the cannabis industry. Uh, we need to be much, much more careful about that and cross our T's and dot our lines, our I's, dot our I's before we, we suggest psilocybin. But it is promising at this point. This is research that came out about a month ago. All right, next slide. Moving on to the therapeutics, the psychotherapies of, of addiction. Uh, another uh, uh, next slide. Another uh, kind of early enthusiasm that we had was for mindfulness. And I continue to be a, a proponent of mindfulness and I think that has a lot to give, but unfortunately, somehow it never caught up. Uh, remember how CBT, when it first came out, it came as a big wave and everybody learned CBT and we used the cognitive behavioral therapy across the board. Then. Motivational interviewing came to town and everybody got so excited about motivational interviewing and we all got trained in motivational interviewing and we started treating our patients with the MI and we're very happy that we did these things and we did see a, a major difference in our patients. I was hoping that mindfulness would be another one of those waves that's going to catch like fire, it's going to go across the board, it's going to have the research behind it and the clinical experience. As it turns out, somehow mindfulness is fizzling out. Not quite sure why that's so, but that's where we are at this point. On the other hand, on the more promising side, next slide, is lifestyle medicine. Um, it's a, an emerging field of medicine that tries to incorporate, to combine, to integrate different facets of wellness. And as you see here, uh, avoid substances is one part of lifestyle medicine, sleep, sex and relationships, uh, stress, nutrition, exercise, the major blocks of wellness at the core of lifestyle medicine. I'm absolutely delighted that this is now in the house of medicine. Our residents, our medical students get exposed to these kind of ideas, start learning how to do it, how to be much more of a holistic healer, not just focusing very, very narrowly on the chief complaint on the medical problem that the patient may be showing up with. 
So this kind of approach is, in my mind at least, really the, uh, uh, the way of the future. All right, uh, cruising like along here, trying to make up some time too. Uh, next slide. So new technologies, um, keeping up with the theme of the other parts, bad news, good news in terms of new technologies. Uh, next slide. Uh, first of all, we have the technological addictions. This is something that's emerging in uh, 2022. Uh, we do have uh, internet gaming, cyber sex, internet gambling, if obesity, social media, texting and emailing, online auctions and shopping, different facets of technological addictions. The two that I have in green are the ones with the most research behind them, the ones that I have most robust uh, work done and we're most confident that they are true uh, addictions. When it gets to the lower part of this slide, uh, we have our doubts whether they are really robust uh, addictions. Next slide. Now, I'm bringing this slide up because um, it mirrors to a great extent the tobacco industry. What we have in front of you is the diagram that is given to psychologists who work for companies that develop internet games. The task of a company that makes internet games is to throw the player into the flow channel. Let's look at that. If the skills of the player are considerably higher than the challenge of the game, the player gets bored and stops playing. If the challenge of the game is considerably higher than the skills of the player, the player gets too anxious and they stop playing. So the task there is to force the player, especially young people, especially people from underprivileged communities to keep playing in that flow, flow channel, flow zone, as sometimes called, uh, with higher and higher stakes, with microtransactions, with loot boxes, keeping them engaged, keeping them addicted to the game. Uh, it reminds me, as I said, very much of the tobacco industry, that back in the 1950s, 1960s, they employed chemists to find the perfect combination of chemicals in the cigarette to maximize the addictiveness of their product. It's a very similar situation here with internet gaming. Next slide. And this is some of the work that we do now. It becomes a little more complex. Um, we do see some more areas around that flow zone and there are some subpopulations, people who are particularly uh, concerned with issues of control. They may have a different, uh, they need different treatment than let's say patients who have a particular orientation towards arousal. So I don't want to go into great detail about these matters, but this is something that we're working on uh, in 2022. All right, next slide. Uh, cyber sex, another uh, uh, technological addiction that has skyrocketed uh, during the, the pandemic. And the cyber sex is an all-inclusive term that does have different aspects to it, online pornography, online dating, sex chat, sex webcams, and of course, teledildonics. A lot of people erroneously think that teledildonics came around with the, the, uh, with the pandemic. This is not true, they were here beforehand, they just became much more popular with the pandemic. Now, I want to stop here and make something absolutely clear. Next slide. That the vast majority who engage in online dating and online pornography and online sex and chats and so on suffer from no psychiatric disorder. It is very much part of everyday life this is data from 2020 that shows that 30% of US adults date online. For some populations, like the uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual population, it has crossed the 50% mark and more than 50% of people date online. Uh, we don't see very much a difference among uh, racial ethnic groups. Uh, we're all about on the same boat when it comes to online dating. But of course, we see a generational uh, difference where young people are far more engaged in uh, online dating. Only a very small number of these people, maybe one to 2% will end up suffering from the addiction to cyber sex. Just making absolutely sure that this is, in the vast majority of people, this is part of normal life. 
All right, next slide. On the good news, the emergence of the CBT apps. Uh, this is one of the earlier ones uh, that uh, help people stay the course with buprenorphine, giving them reminders, try to engage the, the patient with uh, behavioral cues so that they can actually maximize the benefit that they get from buprenorphine. A wonderful intervention that actually uh, had a lot of promise. Next slide. Then psychological aspects were added to these original CBT apps. And you see here uh, people actually uh, showing, uh, reporting emotions uh, and combining this kind of cognitions that they have about their mental state with the behavior of, uh, let's say, taking medication or not. And finally, third slide, next slide, the integration with wellness. These CBT apps these days uh, go beyond, the, the, you cannot really see this slide very well, but they are essentially integrated with Fitbit uh, and other technologies so you can have all your wellness and your mental health and your addiction treatment all under one roof. Great promise. I personally think that they have a lot to offer, but we're not totally there yet. Um, some CBT apps advertise that you don't need a therapist at all. You don't need a clinician. You can just do it by yourself. You may, you may have seen some of these commercials uh, on TV with the celebrities, athletes, and so on, advertising with some of these CBT apps and saying, who needs a, a, you know, a therapist when you have your app? We're not so sure that this is adequate. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, there are some CBT apps that over-engage the therapist. And essentially, you are on call 24-7, and if the patient puts something in that uh, uh, I have a, a dark thought or something, the, the, the clinician wakes up uh, in the middle of the night, and that is not workable either. So not enough clinician, too much clinician. We haven't quite figured out how to do the interface with uh, uh, clinical work uh, in terms of these CBT apps. But this is something we're working on now. Next slide. And finally, the, uh, uh, the social context, uh, the larger environment within which we all live and love and play and work. Uh, next slide. Starting with terminology. The terminology is shifting right in front of our own eyes. Uh, we don't say uh, somebody's an addict. We don't say somebody's an alcoholic. Uh, the same way that we don't say somebody is schizophrenic or somebody's HIV. It's not that the person is the, the illness defines the entire person. You use different language, patient who suffers from uh, alcoholism or patient who suffers from alcohol use disorder or person who uh, has HIV or person who has an addiction. Um, I fully support this uh, move in terminology. I think it's a great idea. It does make people aware of the difference between who we are and the illness that we may happen to be afflicted with. On the other hand, there's a cultural tradition behind some of these words that should not be ignored. For example, Alcoholics Anonymous. The word alcoholic is of great cultural significance within the mutual health community. And this is not something that we should actually throw the baby with the bathwater. Next slide. Uh, the second larger social context issue is uh, what I mentioned at the very beginning the disenfranchisement and the disengagement of the workforce. We have a very severe uh, shortage of psychiatrists, shortage of psychologists, shortage of counselors, shortage of social workers across the nation, even worse in, in, in New Jersey. And the little workforce that we have actually starts getting disengaged. This is Gallup uh, data from uh, less than a month ago that shows that uh, people are getting more and more uh, disengaged. Um, gives us pause, for sure. Next slide. The usual explanation for this kind of uh, disengagement is quiet quitting uh, and a synonym of quiet quitting, start acting your wage. Um, it has a, a somewhat of a, of a kind of a, of a dark, uh, of, a, of a demeaning kind of a, a feel to it. It brings uh, uh, ideas that people are lazy or that people don't want to do their work or people are not enthusiastic. The majority of us who entered this field 
are very enthusiastic and incredibly committed to our patients. So I'm not quite sure that this is what's going on behind uh, these kind of uh, new social uh, structures or it's new social uh, behaviors that, that we see. Next slide. What I think is, um, is happening is that people have an expectation to be able to control their work much more so than, let's say, my generation or the generation behind me. People want to have a say on when they work, on where they work from, and how much they want to work. And this is something that uh, is not easy, but it's doable. Um, we can actually align ourselves with our patients. The majority of our patients, especially when they start having meaningful employment, do not want to come see us nine to five. They want to see us before nine or after five. Um, they, they may not want the intensity of treatment that just five days a week in a partial hospitalization program or, or something else. They want a more varied uh, approach to treatment. So there is a space there for matching the provider's yearning for flexibility with the actual needs of our patients. Some patients like the telehealth, that some patients like to actually come and see the provider uh, face to face. So it's in a sense our responsibility, Frank's and mine and the administrators in this group to be able to match these needs with what people be, uh, are able to offer. And finally, the last slide here, this is of course uh, the, uh, a, a huge part of our workforce uh, efforts, diversity, equity, and inclusion. But what I particularly like is the addition of the fourth dimension, the concept of belonging. Uh, it's not just enough to have a diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's not enough to just be invited to the, to the dance. You need to participate in the dance. You have to feel authentic about your participation in the uh, community where you live and love and play and, and work. And that is now being proposed in terms of belonging. Another uh, plug here, the American Psychiatric Association is launching a major uh, partnership between faith communities and mental health uh, communities. That's gonna take place in a couple of weeks in Washington, D.C. And I do see this as a, as a major effort to get people to this next level of belonging. And with that, I want to thank you very much. And sure. uh, I it in half an hour. So, I, I just have two questions for the. Oh, thanks, Liz. Right. I just have two questions for the for the good doctor. Doc, could you just talk a little bit about the the relationship between addiction, if you can, and the challenges of the criminal justice system, and how you know, for us, the conflation between those who are addicted and those who are involved and the difficulty of grappling with the, with one's addiction and how that intersects with criminal justice. Yeah. I mean, there are two major parts to it. One is while the patient is in a controlled environment in a jail or prison, and that's where we make all these efforts to make access to care inside uh, as uh, applicable as possible. Uh, buprenorphine, a, a life-saving medication, as, as we know, is not uh, easily available to all uh, uh, jails and prisons, in, certainly not in the country. And this is a major effort that we're making to have addiction treatment, not just buprenorphine, but all kinds of addiction treatment available uh, to people. The other part, which is equally significant, is what happens after somebody, uh, you know, leaves uh, uh, jail or prison, and then, and then of course, this is where the re-entry issue comes in, employment, uh, housing, these are the major blocks, and I was delighted to see the, uh, the legislation here, um, you know, uh, not only supporting, but actually advocating for these incredibly important matters. From a scientific perspective, what I'm delighted also to see is that these are becoming uh, measurable outcomes in our research. You cannot possibly publish an article now without having something to say about what's gonna happen in the long run in terms of housing, what's gonna happen in the long run in terms of employment, what's gonna happen in, in the long run in terms of somebody's relationship uh, status and uh, interest in having a family and the like. In the past, all we cared about was abstinence and how many drinks you, you have and how often do you use and how many positive unit toxicology examinations you have. 
But thankfully, we have now moved to more social outcomes, which is, of course, of great, great importance to our patients primarily, but also to us. My friends from the, the prosecutor's office asked um, that they're concerned because they see multiple overdosing in a short period of time. Um, they've suggested they've seen individual overdoses three times in a weekend. Uh, the question is, is there any discussion or how do we grapple with the notion of commitment as an option for overdose? And is that something that's being reviewed in medical circles? Commitment uh, as, a, as, an, uh, as an antidote to overdose? Well, just, um, I think she, I think they mean placing some, go ahead, Liz. Liz, will you use the microphone? Yeah. Thanks. Liz is not shy, Doc. <laughs> Which is very good. Hi, Doctor. Yeah. So in Bergen County, when someone is reversed with Narcan, law enforcement officers call a recovery specialist to come meet the person at the hospital where the person is taken. Mm -hmm. But what we're finding is that increasingly people are refusing medical attention. They're refusing to be transported and they're allowed to. And so now we're seeing uh, people overdose a number of times in a short period of time, three, four, five times in a weekend. Is that um, person not a danger to themselves uh, if that's the situation? And can they continue to refuse um, transportation to the hospital or medical attention? Yeah, this is a, an issue that has, uh, is not new. The, 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 the multiple overdose within the same weekend may be new, but uh, the idea of whether we can commit somebody on the basis of addiction alone is something that has been going on for a long, long time. I don't know how many people here remember uh, uh, Miss Dixon uh, with uh, Rudy Giuliani when uh, he was mayor of New York. That became like a huge issue of somebody who had uh, alcohol addiction and was in and out of the hospital. And then the idea was, can we possibly commit uh, that person or not? Uh, many, many arguments on both sides. I personally feel that we should be able to commit uh, these patients. Why? Because I see it very much as another psychiatric disorder, the same way that we do commit uh, patients for uh, schizophrenia and uh, major depressive disorder when they are uh, in danger to themselves or others. Uh, we should be able to have that option, not uh, to use it liberally, to use it very, very, very thoughtfully and very cautiously and in a very uh, controlled fashion but we should have that option with patients who suffer from extremely severe uh, addictive disorders as well. Doctor, the, the last question, we heard about fentanyl and how fentanyl was different than heroin, the acuity or the toxicity and the immediacy. Does that have any impact on the psychiatric therapies that are being employed in grappling with patients that are wrestling with fentanyl addiction as opposed to heroin addiction? All right, it has, the most practical uh, element uh, to do this question is uh, I used to carry with me uh, a, a spray of, of naloxone in my backpack. Yeah. Uh, these days, I carry two sprays of naloxone in my backpack because when somebody has overdosed from fentanyl, it may very well be that the first one is not enough and I would need to give a second one. So uh, everything that we've known about heroin is uh, bigger and scarier uh, with fentanyl. We need higher doses very often when we treat uh, patients. We need longer treatment uh, when we see them on the outside. Uh, it is, um, in, in some ways, what crystal methamphetamine uh, is to cocaine, fentanyl is to heroin. It's like the turbo uh, heroin, and, and that's how we see it. Is there any, like, two questions from the audience? And then we'll let Dr. Let the good Patrice, do you want to stand up? Thank you. I just had a question about DBT therapy. You didn't talk about that. And I wanted to know the success of that approach to addiction. Yeah. Uh, DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy, is essentially a version of cognitive behavioral therapy. Something I keep on reminding people that the original book on dialectical behavioral therapy by Marshall Linehan is titled The Cognitive Behavioral Therapy of the Borderline Personality Disorder Patient. So this is, or the borderline patient actually was called. Uh, so it is essentially a CBT approach plus several other elements, some of which do have to do with mindfulness. Um, 
It is helpful, several uh, places uh, employed, and I think that they've seen some very good results. Uh, we don't uh, label it as a major intervention. We think about it as more as of a version of CBT. And there's other versions of cognitive behavioral therapy, interpersonal therapy, and so on, that actually can help our patients tremendously. No, I'm in favor of DBT for sure. I was wondering about the civil commitment process. Okay. What about it? Right. I'm from Massachusetts, and we have a uh, Section 35 we call, which is a civil commitment that usually a family does on a family member or a friend. They go to the court and plead the case, so to speak. Okay. I'm wondering if they have that in New Jersey, or maybe that's a option. <coughs> The, this is, the, yeah, this, this is uh, the question that, that, that we answered uh, uh, about that. And uh, yes, certainly an option. I didn't know about Massachusetts and where we stand with it uh, over there, but certainly something that I would like to see us have as an option under very special circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. I'm, sure, I'm, I'm sorry, because we've got Dominic ready to come on. Can we have a round of applause for Dr. Lavonis? Thank you. Okay, and we will be, and we will have Dr. Lavonis has been gracious enough to give us the slides, and so we'll have that in within our public presentation. And now I just want to introduce somebody. Michael K. Williams was a force for change, and Michael worked with us, and he worked with our 30 over 30 group, and we're really honored to have his nephew here, Dominic, share with some thoughts. Dominic knows, the family knows, that Michael unfortunately was taken by virtue of fentanyl, and I would just like to present Dominic DuPont. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for having me, Governor McGreevy. Thank you, New Jersey Ranchery. And Thank you for the folks who are in the room this afternoon. Um, I'm, it's an honor and a privilege for me to be here, um, primarily because I, I understand the impact that fentanyl can have on our communities in general. But it's often not spoken about that communities of color, communities who um, probably have the least resources have huge challenges. And um, on September 6th, last year, on Labor Day, uh, my uncle Michael K. Williams was found by myself and my wife in his penthouse apartment. And it was clear that there was some challenges that were, uh, uh, that Michael was going through prior to that. But um, we, we walked into a situation where he was deceased. And we have been doing a lot of work, as you can see, with uh, the New Jersey Reentry uh, Corporation. Uh, Michael was committed to this work, and he speaks about it in his book, Scenes from My Life, that was scheduled to come out um, only a few weeks before he died. And, uh, you know, my primary goal, my primary reason for, for being here and just talking about Michael's legacy is, is that we don't stigmatize, you know, substance abuse, that we have real conversations with real people about what's really going on and why um, people are trying to find ways to cope. More importantly, that we take a look at better ways to cope. And um, Michael spoke candidly about that and scenes from my life. Uh, in Michael K. Williams' fashion, this book made the New York Times bestseller in six days. Not because Michael K. Williams, thank you. Not because this beautiful human being is on the cover of the book, but because what's on the inside of this book is 
what's on the inside of most of us who are dealing with trauma and pain. I think the only real difference with Michael was that he found a way to turn his trauma and pain into art. And people loved that through his characters like Omar Devon Little from The Wire and Chalky White from Boardwalk Empire and Freddie Knight from The Night Of. And when I heard the governor earlier talk about you know, this intersection between criminal justice issues and substance abuse and how do we help people figure out ways to handle these things in a way that's effective, that doesn't cause them to kill themselves, um, I really think is an important part of this conversation. P understanding that people who have skin in the game be part of this conversation and understand that it's important to pull the layers back and talk about what's really happening in our communities so that we prevent or help prevent people from dying. And uh, that's the reason why I'm here today. That's the reason why we are gonna continue to honor Michael's legacy and we're gonna continue the work. That is what these conversations are about for me, continuing the work, pulling the layers back, understanding what's happening, why it's happening, and thinking of solutions that will help prevent these situations from continuing in our communities. One of my rules are not to talk too long or too often. So governor, I wanna provide maybe a few minutes. I, I don't know how much time we have. I know it's probably not a lot, but for questions that people may have about my personal experience in the criminal justice system, how that intertwined with the work that Michael was doing here at uh, the New Jersey Reentry uh, Corporation and if there are no questions, then I want to just leave this book for someone in here who may be dealing with some issues and some challenges. I saw your hand go up first. Um, and, if, and if you're not, you may know somebody who is, but. Does but anybody I'm, have any questions for, for Dom? We're only a half hour behind. I can come back. I yeah, exactly. Back. Dominic and I will be here to two. Exactly. Um, and, and like I said, if people don't have questions, um, just please remember that um, I really appreciate this opportunity to elevate this, this com important conversation that we're having about how people heal. Thank you so much, and, Governor. And, and just let me just say one last thing about Dominic is that we are on a mural in our Essex County facility. We have a beautiful mural in Michael's memory. So what we try to do, thank you, James. So we all have something leave something in this life. And so Michael left his heart, his soul, and the beautiful expression of his face. And that's enshrined on the wall. So I just want to say thank you to Dominic because Michael spoke openly about his addiction. And for you heard it time and time again today, when it's swept under the rug, when it's ignored, that's when there are problems. And so I just want to say thank you to Dominic. Thank you. So now I just would ask if our panel, next panel, could join with us, the Executive Administration and, and Regulatory Panel. I see the great Eileen Brad, Bradley, Tom, Lisa, uh, Tara, Rob, His Eminence, Frank Anasi, Elliot, and Deborah Wentz. I, I almost wish we had a great showing of legislators. I almost wish they could hear this panel. Eileen, what do we have to be concerned about in the next six months? Microphone is right there. In terms of reimbursement rates, in terms of structure with CMS and treatment. Well, where shall I begin? Hi, everyone. <laughs> There's a real concern with what's going to happen financially. In we order got Dr. F Frank Miles and we got all these smart people here. So, In order to treat uh, all these people that we love and care about. As many of you may or may not know, as of July 1st so far, 
the managed MCOs, managed care organizations, are going to primarily take over um, the carve-in of long-term residential treatment. These agencies are not ready for it. What does that mean in English? What that means in English, thank you. What that means in English is that currently, the, the individuals that come in now, especially through public funding, which would be the Medicaid, what's going to happen is these, there's five organizations, um, Horizon, Aetna, Cigna, I know I'm missing a couple, Deb, you could probably help me on that. But just well, go ahead. And they are going to take over approving your admissions, approving treatment, and how long you can treat these people. Now, I know many of us have had concerns when that happened with mental health. Now it's going to happen with addiction. So currently, when someone comes into a program, if they're coming through, especially the criminal justice system, which is what I'm uh, very familiar with, because that's who we primarily treat in, in, at Damon House, we don't have to get pre-authorizations. We bring the person in, we contact what's called the IME, which you could call that managed care organization right now. We, we do our paperwork. If there's a problem with the paperwork, while the person is sitting there, they will contact you immediately back with what you need to, to correct. And we correct it, you come into the program. Because as many of you know, we need to get the individual into the program while they're sitting there and they're ready to come in. Otherwise, they walk out. The longer they sit in an, in an admissions office, the more likely they are going to walk out and then you don't know if you're gonna get them back or if anyone's gonna get them back. Tom, is this a problem? Oh, I agree 100%. Is it microphones, I'm sorry. Here, do you wanna use this? I agree uh, 100%. With that, uh, unfortunately, I've had the experience working with managed care uh, for quite some time. And now we're going to have to deal with it uh, with the five families, as I call them, in New Jersey. Um, and it's going to be difficult because we're going to have to wait on them for approvals in a time when we're dealing with the fentanyl crisis and... <clears throat> We have complex detoxes, which are taking more than the, the, the average detox, where you were just using uh, a protocol for alcohol or for a known opiate. But now when you're dealing with fentanyl, those first three days, unfortunately, those clients are uncomfortable as hell. And what we try to do is provide them with comfort drugs, like Balbuca, up until the time they can actually start the detox pot protocol. Unfortunately, in those 72 hours, we lose a lot of clients. They get up and go AMA. They're still too uncomfortable. But yeah, uh, you know, we've had to deal with, <clears throat> as providers, uh, the pandemic. We had to <clears throat> deal with the fentanyl crisis. And now we're going to be dealing with the introduction of So I just care. want to jump in. Thank you, Tom. So, Tom, you echo what Eileen said. Frank, as president of University of Behavioral Health, do you see this as a concern for smaller providers? I do. I, I, you know, I think, and thank you, Governor. I, I think the concern here is <clears throat> you're adding another level of decision-making in the process. That's exactly what Tom said. Yeah. Another level of decision-making. And, and we're unclear yet as exactly how the five entities are going to respond, what their criteria will be, what the delay will be, what the timing issue will be. Um, the concern always is, and I've, I saw this in the late 80s in the Boston market, I saw it in the mid 90s in the Pittsburgh market, and now we're finally seeing it here. The concern is that the, the lag with this disorder can be lethal. So, Dr. Ellers? Well, I understand the concerns. Yep. Obviously, there are. And to be fair to Dr. Ellis, Dr. Tyler, Dr. Yeah. Doctor, thank you very much. Yeah. And on behalf of all of us, the representing DHS. Yeah, I I understand the concerns. Uh, obviously, there are advantages and disadvantages to uh, the managed care organizations getting involved in these issues, uh, and uh, I understand the delays and the concerns you're raising with. Now this fentanyl situation, <clears throat> and uh, the most I can say, I'm not involved specifically in my role in this issue, 
but I will take this back. We work closely with our Medicaid uh, agency at the Division of Mental Health and Addiction Services, and we're trying to promote medication for opioid use disorder. In residential treatment, we're trying to provide access to residential treatment uh, and long-term supports, and certainly we don't want these to get in the way. So uh, I can't specifically respond here, but I will bring back this message and hope we can work on these issues yeah. together. Dr. Liebling, did you want to share your thoughts as to the the extra, the additional level of bureaucratic oversight? Yeah, from my vantage point in the hospital-based setting, it really points to the importance of something like a buprenorphine bridge clinic. To Dr. Ganassi's point, for example, any delays could be fatal. So if we're ensuring that someone can access buprenorphine right away, and we heard earlier about um, some of the COVID, risk, uh, COVID allowances for telephonic buprenorphine induction, uh, that, that is so important to be able to really bridge that gap before someone's able to enter into treatment. But I'm going to wrap up with a different different, but doctor? Sure. Um, I echo all of my colleagues' comments and agree that we need to make access to care easier, not harder. Our jobs are already hard enough, and this just adds complexity. But my question is, we all know what's going on. All of us at the table, all of us in the room, we see it firsthand. We know what's going on out in the streets in people's homes, but do the decision makers in the, the family of five, is that what you called it, Tom? <laughs> do they know, or I mean, are they aware? We know, but do they know? And if they did, how could they possibly do this? Lisa? So again, I'm gonna agree. Ooh, there you go, thank you. So I'm gonna agree with everything that everyone's been saying. All I can say is we don't wanna do anything that's gonna add a buffer, right? Because the barrier free, um, like access to care, barrier free is what we need to do. And the more layers that we put on top of it um, are going to be an issue. Um, I work with Quip and Jay, and I, you know, the importance of making sure that patients get in so that we can make sure that we have follow up and all these things that are necessary to care. Nothing, we, we can't afford to lose any more time in trying to get people the help that we need. And I think that the insurance companies, it would be wonderful to be able to set something up. I was on a call recently with, I remember mm -hmm. Irene on that phone call. And one of the things, you know, that we kept saying, we need to get everyone, I think, in the same room so everyone can hear, like the state, the insurance companies, and the providers to make sure that everybody is on the same page. Because I really feel like maybe if they understood the specifics that we know and see every day, that we could have the ability to make some changes. Sure, Deborah, President CEO of Najama, you serve as a gatekeeper for so many of these concerns. Well, you just have to do. Thank you. There's a disparity between, I guess, the state's vision of fully integrated care, where the all the um, elements of the system, which are now in silos and pieces would be uh, case managed with managed care. I really think that the answer is in the contract that the state puts together after it goes through its extensive stakeholdering uh, process. So again, we want to emphasize that the 1115 waiver um, when it is approved by uh, the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services does not mean immediate turnkey into managed care. What it does do is give the state the authorization to explore service by service managed care. We know that the vision that they're trying to reach is to have a one-stop integrated care where people would get their physical health, mental health, substance abuse, their social determinants of care. We um, Do we need managed care to do that? I, I don't know. I think another model that really encapsulates that is the Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic demonstration program with- Could you explain uh, yeah. what that is for? So the, um, they're known as CCBHCs. Jeez. Everything has a acronym. 
So the, that, the Certified Community Behavioral Health Clinic model goes beyond integration of primary and mental health and substance use care with case management focused on the social determinants of health. Each CCBHC in the demonstration programs required to have not only a full continuum of both mental health and substance use services, including medication-assisted treatment, they're also tied into the health information exchanges. They have various uh, levels of service from crisis services to rehab services to peer supports. So do you support the, the concept of the CCBHE as being the template? They do. They must meet stringent criteria no, for you, timeliness do, do, do of Do you access. think that's the right direction? I think it's a fabulous model, and um, it is considered oh. nationwide to be we the love model it. of Frank, the what do you future. Think? So I, I, we have the privilege of running six of them across yep. the state, uh, thousands of patients in each one. It has widely opened access, and it's allowed for something that, that has long been hard to fund, it's that interstitial glue between levels of care. So we've always been able to provide outpatient or inpatient or IOP. The problem has been billing for the people who are allowed to connect them in between yep. by phone or otherwise. CCBHC has removed that barrier. So then is, is that the right direction that New Jersey? We would love to see more and we'd love to see them expanded. Yes. So what's the, what's the tension between the CCBHC and the proposed integrated model with, I'll use Tom's phrase, the five families. <laughs> well, I would presume, I, I don't know this for a fact, and again, to Deb's point, Dr. Eiler's point, it's how it's written. Yeah. If there is decision-making put in between assessment and delivery, then we would have to find a way to rapidly go from the assessment treatment plan, may we please do this, and then do it right now, there's not a may we please do this. And would the CCBHCs be impacted by this? I, I don't see how they wouldn't be. They would be in the intended waiver because the way they're written into the waiver, so the there are two kinds of CCBHCs. The original, what are called the demonstration programs yep. um, that have a prospective payment system. And for the lay person, that just means that they're getting a bundled payment and they're able to bill so they were able to expand workforce, yep, hire yep. more psychiatrists, APNs, establish the mat. They work with the education criminal justice system. There are no geographic barriers. It's a 24 yep. seven service. Um, so the, um, with the other kind of CCBHCs called the expansion grants, which were a different, it's the same model, but without the same funding source. And uh, they, so in the 1115 waiver to um, continue to fund the demonstration model, which has funding yep. only now to December, September, uh, December, 2023, they're going but, but, to I, I, I just want to pull back funding. for a second. And I'm just saying that if, if, because we'd like to share this with legislators, to go to Eileen's original point and Tom's and was echoed by Tara and, and even Robert and Frank and Elliot. So what is it that should happen? So say, for example, an integrated model, if we agree it, having a, having a, a platform, having a single platform may be an ideal goal, but what should it look like and how should we do it in terms of providing services? Frank? Well, you know, I like the idea of having a, a comprehensive plan for an individual that's approved and that you don't have to revisit over and over again. Um, so I think once you do a comprehensive evaluation and you decide on a plan of care, that care can be six months to a year. To have to go back to the well each time for, let's say, fee-based services, and, and it allows for obstruction in ways we can't predict. And, and the intention, though, was? Price control. Yeah. And Tom or, or Eileen, do you want to add to that? Yes. Yes. Oh, oh okay. Eileen is so shy. No. <laughs> hmm. Okay. And you could just explain for the whole audience who doesn't live within the space 
what's happening here? Well, what's happening is our whole funding structure is being um, um, ob obliterated. And I think that I've given a lot of thought to this, and I've been on a lot of webinars, seminars, and have done some research on this. And whether it's, the, the, as you say, the five families, I like that. Um, if we could get all of them, whatever the funding sources are going to be, which like currently we have a couple, if you work with the public funding systems, they agree on who can treat the individual, what license or credential is permitted. They agree on the process. They agree on how often you have to go back to them for authorization for something, which in long-term residential, it's, it's been actually made much simpler. They agree on the rules. They agree on how much you're going to get paid based on credentials. Well, I, what I, what but, I, no, no, let ahead. me finish, Jim. Go what's going to happen, and this is what's critical, is that the five families don't necessarily, in the beginning, they're going to follow a similar rule. Yep. But then it's all changing. Every one of them will negotiate their own rate with every agency. And after talking to some of my current colleagues who are, are used to dealing with this, some of them say they're not even paying the Medicaid rate, which is not great. Number two, their billing systems electronically are all different. So there's which, no uniformity. There's, there's no uniformity on any of this, which will create a financial nightmare on top of currently when we bill, we get paid within a couple of uh, 10 days, two business weeks, with the managed care organizations, the five families, the average, I actually have it written down so I don't forget, not that I would, 30 to 45 days from the date of billing. And that's if it's a perfect claim. Now, if you work in any of these agencies, particularly the smaller ones or the mid-sized, they will go broke. They will literally go broke. There's a very real concern how many of these agencies will be here in two years? So what we're hoping for is that the state can somehow help broker this so that we can have one set of rules. And number two, when this does go into effect, they do what they did before when we went from being paid automatically to fee-for-service and or Medicaid, they covered costs yep. until you got on your feet Gee. and then we paid them back. Yep, then you had reconciliation. I just want to go down on this one issue and then we'll move on. Tom, anything else here? Yeah, I just uh, I'd just like sorry. to add what, uh, to what Eileen said because uh, every change Just that closer, we, I'm sorry, Tom. Every change that we make as a result of MCOs or some other agency, outside agency, is going to be costly. And one of the things that non, uh, you know, non-profit providers like Turning Point and others have to deal with that on a day-to-day -day basis. We just have to adapt, improvise, and overcome, you know, the, <clears throat> the fentanyl, the COVID, and now we're dealing with managed care again. And unfortunately- And cash flow. And, and cash flow, yeah. I mean, 45 days for a nonprofit, that's, that's not very well. That's not very good. But the technology as well, too. I mean, we need to be able to have assistance in getting the technology that's required on these, uh, telemedicine and digital platforms. We learned evidence by COVID. If we didn't have uh, telemedicine, we would have people, you know, not being able to uh, communicate yep. with their providers. Yep, thank you, Tom, please. Um, I was just gonna add that whether it's a CCBHC or hospital-based services, it would be really wonderful to have one set of rules standardized. Well, that's and what I think Eileen and Tom and Frank are all pushing for. Right. Uniformity, regularity, consistency. Yep. Too many variables if we don't do that. And we haven't even talked about credentials that yep. these yep. MCOs are gonna be asking for. And if I could just very quickly on sure. that. So on the whole credential piece, um, LCADCs seem to be the forgotten licensure in the state, licensed clinical alcohol and drug counselors. They are the only license that cannot bill the insurance companies. We are in the middle of a staff shortage and 100% should be able to bill the insurances and serve our population. That's worth noting. Thank you. Tech? Okay. 
So another thought for consideration as we sit here focusing on reentry and addiction, that very often folks who struggle with addiction have lost employment and rely on Medicaid as their primary health insurance. People reentering society after incarceration rely on Medicaid as their health insurance. Treatment providers who only solely rely on Medicaid reimbursement and have no active contracts with managed yep. healthcare providers are, are at a huge disadvantage. Providers, thankfully, like some of us that already have existing contracts, have an advantage. But if you've never negotiated with Horizon or Aetna, you don't have existing contracts in place, you will be at a huge disadvantage. And perhaps, and probably Deb can speak to this in more detail, may not be able to provide services. So that's something to consider thinking about this sensitive population. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Eilers, not to put you on the spot, but I just appreciate your, your gray matter. Well, uh, I wanted to just speak briefly about the Certified Community Behavioral Health Centers as part of this, because yeah. it's it, uh, I've been project co-director of the project for the last six years, and we were fortunate being one of eight states yes. to get the demonstration grant, and we've learned so much from, from that this model, not only in terms of the range of services, the care coordination, which is, they say, the linchpin of, of the services, so you can actually follow people, provide whatever services they need, even wraparound services, um, mental health, substance use, and uh, some coordination with medical care. So, <clears throat> so this is a great model, and we're fully behind it. And it looks like from the federal standpoint, the federal government is behind it, too. So we're going to see more of it. And the question is how we do it. I want to point out that the CCBHC serves everybody that comes in the door, even yes. people who aren't insured. Uh, and there are a lot of federal requirements that we have to follow with this model. I can't get into all of them here. It has some performance-based uh, funding built into it, which is another thing the federal government wants to see. How does a program show that it really it does what it says it's doing in terms of patient care? It's got that built in. It's got a lot of performance measures. It's got this uh, working with the HIE that, you, that you've talked about. And that helps you know, getting feedback from emergency room and hospital admissions. It works in terms of these performance measures. And it also, uh, so it, it has a number of very beneficial uh, practices and procedures that are built in. And so this is where we need to go. Managed care is going to oversee it, but I don't think you're going to see the impact with programs like this, which are, uh, you know, as we talked about, the funding is cost-based, at least as it has stood for the last year, the last several years with, with our model and other models around the, the country. But I'm, again, not an expert on, on managed care or can't speak to all of the issues specifically that have been addressed here. But I know from our commissioner, to our assistant commissioner, Melky, we are very concerned about the issues that you're bringing up, and we are going to have stakeholder input as we move along. And I think it was Tara and Lisa mm -hmm. and Tom and Eileen <clears throat> said is also consistency. Mm -hmm. Frank, doctor? No, I think one of the concerns, too, is you know, the, the field's fought for several decades for health parity, yep. uh, parity between behavioral and physical health. And I, I think one of the things that happened is when parity occurred, uh, payment parity never happened. And so one of the concerns I have is for those agencies across the table, most of us are in that position, we're proud to be, who largely serve Medicaid populations. The fee schedules associated with that are often 20 years old. Um, and for those of you who are in the field, you realize now that hiring a social worker, hiring a uh, licensed professional counselor, uh, hiring an advanced practice nurse, you know, God forbid hiring a psychiatrist, is costing 30, 40 percent more than it did three years ago. Those costs are rising, and they're rising without concomitant rises in the pricing yep. index. This is a spiral. Uh, you know, there's no way to hire somebody like a psychiatrist or an advanced practice nurse for 40% more than what you paid last year and have that be sustainable. This, this concerns me. Yep. Thanks. Dr. Liebman? 
Sure, and just to build on that, I'll actually take this opportunity to talk a little bit about peers. I'm just so grateful and indebted to everyone in this room and beyond who work as peers and comparatively, right, a, a low cost intervention, I think peers should be paid much more than they commonly are and credit to Commissioner Edelman on uh, what you sure. talked about this morning, increasing their salaries um, by a decent percentage. We're going to be able to do that uh, here at RWJ Barnabas Health. So um, yeah, in integrating peers into CCBHCs into other settings, I think is, is crucial and we've made great strides and hope to continue to see that to grow. So, so Deb, um, and Deb's been indefatigable supporting CCBHCs. I remember she had uh, good Governor Christie call Senator Toomey on the Finance Committee, like pleading. But so is there a way that we can address the concerns that have been been addressed at the families at this end of the table um, to have that level of consistency and regularity? Well, there is one thing, and I don't think it's necessarily a good thing in the 1115 waiver proposal, is to have a uniform rate for CCBHCs. One of the beauties of the demonstration uh, structure is that there you each area, each um, CCBHC has different needs and can bill. But I think there's a great opportunity because as part of the Safer Communities Act, which just yep. uh, passed, which in layman's term, that was the gun bill, um, there was, um, it gave, uh, CMS allowed 10 states each year on a rolling basis to um, begin to create additional demonstrations from the original one and they would be funded that way. So I think that there, um, everything really is in the state policy because as I point out, all the issues that are of concern, a lot of those issues could be addressed, uniform credentialing, what prior authorization looks like, what the floor for payment in the state's contract with the MCO. Yep. So, so we need, we are constantly advocating. Sure. So can I just move to prevention, doctor? Can you just talk a little bit about some of the efforts of the Institute, specifically on, on grappling with fentanyl and prevention per se? Absolutely. Yeah, so uh, our services span from prevention to recovery, as the name suggests, and prevention. Um, I was thinking... Just closer often, to the mic. Oh, yeah, sure, no problem. I was thinking often earlier as we were discussing about education, about the efforts that we oversee in, in schools and communities. So these are things like community-based coalitions that you may be aware of in your county or youth prevention coalitions in our schools. I would though like to take the opportunity to talk about a couple of harm reduction initiatives that yeah. are closer to the branch inside because I think this is the time to be bold, right? What we've been doing, it's been working, but it's not enough. And um, there are two in particular that I'd like to talk about, especially in the context of treatment and um, Re sort of the regulatory framework in which they exist. The first is overdose prevention centers. These are sites where people can bring pre-obtained drugs uh, to use and have staff on site to reverse uh, an overdose in the event that it occurs. And those have been shown to decrease crime, litter, uh, disease transmission, and mortality. Um, but unfortunately, they're illegal uh, under federal law. Um, so that right, is something that we could do uh, in the near future to either repeal what's called the crack, crack house statute um, to make those legal or have the federal gov government otherwise make clear that they won't be prosecuting the operators of these sites. Uh, the second is, um, I apologize. Um, the second one that I was going to talk about is, um, Safe supply. There we go. Thank you for uh, for bearing with me. So uh, the idea. Have to wait for two more decades. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It'll happen so regularly that you won't even notice. <laughs> I bet. Um, so uh, this is the idea, and then to, specifically to this idea of uh, regulations that for people who use drugs, uh, illicit drugs in particular, we've sort of ceded control as a, as a country yep. um, and regulations to the black market. So the idea being that for people who are at particularly high risk of overdose um, due to the presence of fentanyl in the illicit drug supply, we can actually prescribe pharmaceutical opioids of known potency and known purity um, to reduce their risk of overdose. Uh, so again, just safe, safe supply. Safe supply or safe no, supply. No, I'm familiar with it, but it, it's 
you know, gain traction in British Columbia, but not necessarily right. New Jersey. Exactly. So a paper was just published yesterday out of uh, yep. Ontario, I believe, that showed that uh, one of these programs reduced uh, healthcare expenditures, ED and hospital visits, all without a single opioid overdose death in the first year. So, Frank, what do you think? No, I agree with this. I mean, obviously, uh, Governor, you're aware we've had the privilege now for the last five years of working with state prisoners who are yep. stepping out of prison. We have this uh, program called IRTS. You've worked with us closely, and we're able to follow folks for three months. These are all people with opioid addictions. We can follow them for three to six months prior to release, form a relationship with a peer navigator. Once they're released, we're able to follow them for 12 months, including not only uh, substance abuse treatment, uh, medication-assisted treatment, but also help with housing, job training, placement, uh, social determinants of health. We've seen, a, there's now a study going on, Dr. Riley's going to speak about this externally, and the early results seem to indicate that there's a dramatic drop in those overdoses in that critical period of three weeks before yep. after release. We're thrilled. We need more programs. But on like safe this. supply, which is slightly different. Yeah, I think this is a great idea. So, so safe supply is. Well, it, it, right now, you never know what the level of fentanyl is going to be yep, in something. Exactly. And, and to be able to standardize that could be a game changer. Real Doctor? Yeah, I guess it's a sort of a harm reduction center yeah. but that provides a supply as well as clean syringes. So yes. Uh, uh, I want to point out one thing that has not been mentioned, I don't think, so far today. I've been here most of the day. And that is the integration of behavioral health with primary care and medical issues. So important. We know that people with substance use disorders are dying at an, uh, an early rate compared to the general population. And that's for a number of factors. And, and we've seen that the, uh, the decreased lifespan in the U.S. for the last several years, largely due to overdoses, but it's also due to other Mental medical health. issues. Yeah, suicide. And suicide, Alzheimer's disease is another one. Uh, but people with substance use disorders, and particularly IV drug use, have hepatitis C, HIV. Uh, they smoke it in large numbers. And incidentally, we did an analysis of our NJ uh, SAMS, the database for um, individuals attending licensed program. We found out over half use smoking products. Uh, and we're not addressing these issues primarily. We are providing some services, yeah. but not to the degree. Smoking is the number one prevent, present, preventable cause of death, yeah. and we have not addressed that. And I understand the reasons behind it, but also smoking uh, cessation leads to better long-term recovery, according yep. to studies. So no, all of these issues doctor. could be managed That's better. That's so critical is the nexus between yeah primary health yeah. and behavioral health. In some ways, managed care, it's got a lot of issues, but we're going to talk in the next, talking about yeah. the intersection between those who engage in violent behavior and the mentally ill. I know Dr. Anna Zed and others um, from Essex County Correctional Task and uh, Phil Elijah and Frank Mazza with the great work he's doing in Hudson. But but I agree with you. That's, a, that's an opportunity that we haven't pursued as rigorously as we ought. Tara? Just on, on safe supply? Um, well, I mean, I'm not an expert on that, I will say. But we are in the midst of a crisis, and people are dying. So whatever we need to do to be creative and forward-thinking and not be afraid to be bold and take risks, we must. Good for you. Lise? So I would like to go back to the integration side um, because I work very closely with DOH um, as leading in the integration department at Bergen Newbridge Medical Center. And one of the things that we are doing that's a wonderful initiative through the state is that we have screenings to comprehensively um, go throughout the entire organization from the emergency yep. room, outpatient, pretty much every entry point that does screen for depression, SUD, um, tobacco, um, and social determinants of health. So what we are seeing is 100% everything is connected. I love what Dr. Petros was explaining about the lifestyle um, medicine because I do believe that that is where the future um, is for SUD and BH together. The, the tough thing for us, like for our folks that are in jail and Dr. Anna, is, is obviously when somebody's coming in at 2 o'clock in the morning trying to able to discern what their level of mental acuity is, what their challenges are, and before they move, excuse me, before they move into general population, 
So I agree with you. I mean, so it, excuse me, diagnostics are so much a part of this. Tom? Uh, the one thing I wanted to bring up, Jim, was uh, the concerns I have for adolescents. And uh, I think a couple of panels uh, previously have, have talked about it. And uh, my concern is, is that we have an adolescent program in Pomp and Plains, and um, probably 85 to 90 percent of the adolescents that are coming in, their drug of choice, marijuana. Yep. And the concern that I have is that <clears throat> if you do any research on <clears throat> uh, marijuana being laced with fentanyl, uh, there's no real statistic, st uh, significant statistic findings that that is actually happening, but it has occurred. So let's not, you know, underestimate the need to be able to, uh, you know, provide education around addiction from middle school on up. Yeah. I'm just afraid, Younger. just afraid that 85% of these children are coming into our program and their drug of choice is marijuana. It's important to say, Eileen. Well, we sort of went a little around different things here. So, um, where 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 do you want me to go? Well, I, I think <laughs> you know I, I'll go anywhere. No, no, no. I, I think right now is I think when you just heard from Frank and you heard from Doctor, it, it's a couple points. And I think you know we obviously we have to grapple with the finance. We have to grapple with the template. We have to fall grapple with the consistency or perhaps the proposed lack of consistency of, of funding. But then you look at the CCBHC model, you see it as an ideal model, Frank, a number of others sort of, and then, but after that, you look at specific challenges and whether it's the specific challenges, Frank talks about, you know, identify, excuse me, Frank, Dr. Ganassi talks about identifying people early on and following them throughout as they move into the general community. Tom talks about um, the importance clinically of providing education. You know, the concern in all of this is how do you successfully integrate, whether it's education, training, services, and for us, selfishly, it's the reentry population with which we deal. So it's not only understanding it from a medical perspective, but as something Petro said earlier, that behavioral health belongs in the medical house. And that's something that I think we have to bring, fight kicking and screaming to bring back into the, the medical house. So that when, when Dr. Liebman talks about safe supply, is it construed as a medical alternative or is this, is this understood as being a behavioral health opportunity or solution? Okay, so let's start with education. I think, I think it was said earlier, but I think education has to start when they're this high. You know, we have Smokey the Bear for fire prevention. We've tried to have uh, McGruff for um, crime, but we don't. And, but we don't have something for addiction. To you know, and I, and I think if we start when they're young, it makes a huge difference. That's number one with education. And then we have to keep infiltrating this throughout their lives, specifically in the schools, in the community, with our families. We have to educate the families first. I mean, we're on third, fourth, fifth generation users in these programs. Well, I, I, I'm sure you all know that. Um, as far as um, harm reduction, I have mixed feelings because I still would like to see more research. However, I am in support of anything we can do that's going to save lives. I mean, this and is... And that's been the message today yeah. over and over again. It's not getting to the panacea, it's not getting mm -hmm. to utopia, it's getting to saving lives. It's an insidious, insidious disease. Sure. And it affects not just you, the individual, which is horrible enough, but the entire family. Yeah. And, and before we wrap up, I've got Deborah, who is, to me, God bless her, she, she reads, she's tenacious, she's well-researched. Deb, in addition to you know, looking at an integrated structure, in addition to looking at the concerns that people raise, legitimate raise from, as Tom says, I loathe the expression, the five families. Um, what are the other challenges that CEOs will face 
the major challenge and ongoing challenge is workforce because no matter what structure, what program that you have, if you don't have Lisa. someone to serve those people when they need it, whether it's the middle of the night or, and that's becoming really difficult. So a couple recommendations that I would have would be instead of um, holding so stringently maybe to certain licensures to we need to expand facility licensures to capture non-clinical service provision. Can I just ask what people think about I think that's such a common sense idea but it's never happened. What do people think about facility licensure? Does it make sense? Yes. Who's against, is anybody against it? I, I just, I mean, we've done that in so many other areas in public policy because we want to have a degree of measured flexibility. It just hasn't happened here. Sorry, Deb. So that would help to ease administrative burden and miss high turnover. Also, we need, because this is a legal and regulatory panel, to ease reg regulatory requirements to allow more prescribers to participate in that. We spoke about the federal, the mate, and the mainstreaming. Uh, we need more prescribers to meet program staffing requirements or else they need to be relaxed. And there needs to be more broad prescribing authority in regard to certain medications. And um, we have to also include an expansion of prescriber types like the APNs, others, we, we can't because we don't have the luxury to require ASAM credentials in all instances. And then you have to uh, ease prescribing for specific medications and you have to significantly increase long-term uh, recovery supports to include social determinants of health, which you, you do well, but we, um, and finally, I think the opportunity we have today is we need to ensure that all those opioid settlement funds are utilized to strengthen the workforce and pro uh, provide sustainability to existing programs and to fill those gaps um, rather than to create new programs, which only tend to hijack the existing staff the existing on, from the foundation. Yep. So what we, what we want to do with all of these panels is we want to, out of this, come to a report to, to our legislative friends. So whether it's, it's Deb and it's, it's Dr. Liebling, it's Frank, and his, his, his obviously command, Dr. Alice, thank you. And I, I admire your courage. Um, <laughs> and, and, and to Tara and to Lisa, thank you. And the inestimable Tom Brady and Eileen. But I think what... The, there's an opportunity here before things go awry. And I think certain things work really well, the CCBHCs and, and using that perhaps as a model is an opportunity, but then also providing, I loved what doctor said is integrating primary with behavioral. We have to keep that focus stuck. Yeah, and I, and I wanna make a point on that one because I agree completely. Not only should it be in um, primary care, it should be in pediatric care, and obstetrics at the yep. very least. And there ought to be universal acceptance of the codes. So right now we're doing a lot of integrated care across a variety of sites. And I will tell you, not all payers pay the same on these codes. Some not at all, some very much delayed. I can't imagine why they wouldn't want to. It seemed consistent with the idea of prevention and yep. early recovery. So somehow making sure that those codes Consistency on the paid. code, yep. yep. That's powerful. Thank you, Frank. Tom, anything else? Yeah, when you're dealing with managed care, just ask him where the money is. <laughs> yep. Deb, any last words? You just got to hit the microphone. Thank you. I think what we do every day is coming back to saving lives. And so we have to fight on all these fronts and always keep in mind the person because that, I know, is what um, motivates me to. Um, to, to do work. And I, the last thing too is in the licensure backlog. Um, so there are a lot of fronts that w there is opportunity for us, um, but and we, we have to act quickly too, because every day another life is lost or many. Thank you. Can we have a round of applause? Thank you. And now our panel is coming up and these are the guys on the front line. So I'm just gonna ask them to come forward. 
Steve, there's Frank, Michael. Yes, yes, I'm glad you heard it. Yes. 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 So we're doing our. Um, we are doing our our warm start on November seventeenth. We're going to the smoke out, and then we're going to roll out smoke free by site with the end date of June thirtieth. Yes, yes. And we need this as much for our staff as we do for our yeah. clients. And the staff yes. is often the biggest barrier. Yes. 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 We have experience with it. But that's great. Yes. Maybe I'll get in touch with you because I'd like to hear. We have an effort. All right. So we're going to get quickly get started. And we've got Gloria, Gloria Wolves down here. Gloria, you're over here. All right, Dr. Anazet. Dr. Anazet is a great guy, and he's director of medicine at Essex County Correctional. Doctor, what's the challenge of fentanyl in the Essex County Correctional Facility? Well, yeah, speak in the mic. Get forward closer. Well, it's become the predominantly, uh, the predominant right here. used uh, opiate that's coming to our facility. Even folks that are attempting to use uh, street drugs like sticks, which is Xanax, they're finding that when our team, in fact, I just want to give a quick shout out to our MAT team that's sitting over there. So, hey, hey. Pascal. <laughs> They're the, ones I bringing, Pascal more than never. they're the ones bringing in the legal opioids into the uh, jail. Um, so to answer your question, uh, fentanyl poses a real threat to our folks. When we get them, as you said, everyone on this panel here is on the front line. So when those patients come, they have fentanyl in their system. So the jail being administered by our administrator here, Chief Elijah, we are the largest inpatient residential treatment program. So folks are coming in four to 500 a month with fentanyl in their systems, in their veins, in their hearts. And so frankly, we need to get to their mind, body, and spirit and try to combat a problem that threatens to literally decimate a whole generation. So, so you're on it. I just want to call Bob Frank Mazza. Frank is over in Hudson, which is the new Jerusalem. Um, <laughs> but, is Jersey City in the house? Um, but Frank, can you just talk about, just pick up, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump back to Phil, but can you just talk about what you're doing on mental health and what you're doing? Because I, I don't wanna lose the connection that one of the doctors made earlier about the conflation between mental health and addiction and specifically fentanyl. Can you just talk about what you're doing in Hudson County? Sure. Thanks, Frank. So, uh... <clears throat> When you talk, a lot of the discussion today has been around clinical treatment, right? Uh, and clinical treatment is only as good as the services it is provided in combination with, right? So uh, when you talk about mental health disorders, right? So Dr. Anazette will tell you that, well, addiction is driven a lot of the times by past trauma, mental health disorders. Uh, <clears throat> but when we focus on fentanyl, I think what is most important to understand is Traditional treatment models understand that nearly half of everybody that comes out of clinical treatment is going to relapse, right? And half of everybody that comes out of treatment is going to relapse in the first year. <clears throat> so treatment has always understood that falling down is part of it, right? And that's not the end of the road. We're there to pick the person up. Fentanyl changes that game. Fentanyl is 100 times more potent than morphine, right? So we don't have that option. If you work in a jail, you know the story ends one of two ways. Someone either dies of an overdose, they make a mistake while they're high and they spend the rest of their life in jail, or treatment is effective. <clears throat> we have less options, or we have less chances to deliver that treatment in an impactful way now because of fentanyl. And Dr. Anazette said something very important. <clears throat> when they walk in the jail, 
they have fentanyl in their system. And the jail is the most in-common treatment provider for uh, people living below the poverty line with addictions issues. <clears throat> ERs, people are walking into our ERs. We miss entrance points all the time when it comes to drug addiction. People are alive, they're walking in the door, we're hitting them with Narcan, we're sort of dealing with the crisis in front of us, we're opening the door and we're letting them out. I've heard a lot of people talk about, well, what services are that person is that person getting at that point when they walk out of that door? <clears throat> the question is what combination of services are they getting when they walk out of the door? Treatment is only good if you have a place to live, right? If you have a house to stay in, transitional housing. Uh, treatment is only as good as somebody who is also with a peer recovery specialist who can monitor their medication, right? So it is building all of these things in combination with the clinical treatment that will increase the efficacy of the clinical treatment and reduce uh, the chances for an overdose or reduce the chances that somebody goes out there and accidentally takes too much fentanyl and dies. And that's what we're talking about. We're talking about life and death stuff here. So, uh, yeah. Thanks, Frank. It's a crisis that the jails are unbelievably inadequately prepared to deal with because that's really not our core mission is drug abuse and fentanyl. It's the incarceration of individuals. Uh, the governor and I talk often about how we are doing you know, too many things that we really are not equipped to do, be it mental health, be it drug addiction. And in and, and Essex County, we're fortunate enough that we have Dr. Anaset and his team and, and individuals who are really dedicated to, to the MAP program and to other things to try to help. But long range, the solution is not going to be 600 correction officers and lieutenants and sergeants and captains to handle this problem. I think the state and the country needs to find out better ways, as Frank said, not to, you know, we, we are probably the biggest provider in the, in the state of New Jersey, and that makes zero sense to me. Well, I'll give you an example. When I, was, when I first became prosecutor, when I was first prosecutor in 2014, I would say about 10% uh, of the, the drugs that came in had fentanyl in it. By the time I left at the end of 2018, about 85% of the, the packets had fentanyl in it. Could you say that again? I beg your pardon? Could you say that again? About 10% in 2014, 10% of the, of the heroin had fentanyl in it. Back in uh, 2018, the end of 2018, 85% of the packets have fentanyl in it. Fentanyl, look, it, it, it's it. I don't have to tell everybody here. You know that it's a synthetic drug. It's cheaper to be made. You need very little of it, little grains of salt or sand, as it, it, you know, as you see it, that gets mixed into the packet. It's a thousand times more powerful. It's what we call a game changer. So when you you know when I'm here, I, I put a smile on my face in the sense that yeah, people go to jail because guess what? When I was prosecutor, I had parents, loved ones call me up saying, "Please keep my loved one in the jail because I know that they were going to live for tomorrow." Okay, because what we have is a problem with continuum of care. That's what that's what this whole conference is about. Is the fact is how can we get effective continuum of care? And you know what? You're not going to be able to do it in ten days. You're not going to be able to do it in 30 days. You're not going to be able to do it in six months. Mm -hmm. And and setting up setting up a good continuum of care with again navigators, as I saw in your pamphlet, and then also as you saw a coaching and peer coaching. That is the continuum that needs to be effective, in my opinion. So, Steve, on the front lines of turning point, what do you see every day? Well, and by the way, in the interest of full disclosure, Steve is originally from Essex County. Yes, yeah. I'm, I'm an Essex County guy. A North Point. Um, I just. That's why we like him, Governor. I just want to uh, share something with uh, the group here. Uh, I buried my daughter on uh, Saturday, this past Saturday. And I still don't know. We still don't know the details, or I know it was drug related. I don't know if it was fentanyl, but it doesn't make any difference to me. You know, she's gone, and uh, I've been sober myself for 34 years. I've been a good example. I've been in uh, part of Turning Point for 25 years, and I couldn't save her. Couldn't save her. You know, she went from up here right to death. You know, she went, for, you know, finished in 
to answer uh, governors, uh, I, I come in in the morning, you know, and I've, I've been doing this for many years now. I actually step over people in my lobby. I do the best I can to, to admit as many people as I can. My friend Jim over there asked me if I had any detox beds available, and I do, because I can't keep people in treatment. Can't keep them. You know, they they come in for one or two days. To, to, you know, and then, uh, like, I'm outside asking people, what happened? You know, why didn't you stay? Or you begged me for a bed a day ago, and now you're leaving treatment. You know, and it, there, it's not the food or the mattress or the pillow sucked or, you know, it's the, the drug is calling them. It's calling them. And it's staying in their system longer. It's harder to detox. And um, just I don't really have an answer for it. All I do is show up each day and try to help as many people as I can. And, and again, I couldn't help my own daughter. Thanks. And thank you, Steve. Thank you for being here. And thank you for your friendship. Brad, could you just talk a little bit about what, what you do? Uh, well, you know, first off, I'd like to say, in my observation, I don't think we have a fentanyl problem. I think we have a society problem. And we've got to start to look at what we're re-entering them into. Because I think the one thing that we all have in common here in this room and out there is that we're all fear-based, doing everything we can to cover it up. And what I'm seeing is, is getting people to, like we teach people how to be successful, we never teach anyone to enjoy what they're doing. You know, where I work on a farm where people come in there and we work, we're not a treatment program, we're a mentorship program. And one of the main things that we try to speak into the One of the main things that we try to do there is I love what they were talking about is being more mindful, being more present. You know, trying to be present for their life, be more in their body because I think the, one of my big problems is I am so forward thinking I'm never in this moment. But this is not a, this is a dis-ease of the mind, you know, and that's the part that I got to look at. I've got to look at what we're re-entering them back into. It's so competitive out there. Everything's going so fast. So at our farm, we have a sign that says, slow variety, slow down. Easy does it. You know, because for me, after being in this field for a little while, I realized my standards for success are something much, much greater than adding titles and finances to me. It's about at the end of the day, I'm looking for some freedom and peace of mind. And I think that's what everyone's looking for deep inside. So that's what we try to add to these people at the program at the farm. So, so thank you, Brian. That's a, that's a values change. So thank you. Marguerite, so at... at at New Hope, IBHC, how has fentanyl changed your protocols? So some of the changes that we're seeing is um, years ago when clients were just using um, opiate pills or heroin, the criteria to start somebody on buprenorphine was 24 hours since your last use and a clinical opiate withdrawal scale greater than 10. Now we're looking at waiting at least 48 to 72 hours we need, or even longer. Um, and it really becomes challenging to engage them in treatment um, when they don't feel good. So the medical director and I have come up with different medications. In certain situations, we're given benzodiazepines prior to, to starting them on the buprenorphine because at this point, we're just trying to keep them in treatment. And like other people had said, it is um, it's very challenging to get them because to stay in a treatment because they don't feel well. And some of the other things I just want to touch on is um, the potency of the fentanyl and um, the like Narcan. They're requiring multiple doses because, um, unfortunately, we have people who use out in our parking lot, and they require multiple doses of Narcan. Um, and also, um, when we do put them on MAT, uh, they require higher doses of MAT versus you know years ago when they were using. Um, you know, just heroin, it would be like a lower dose. Now they're going up higher. So those are a lot of the challenges that we see. So both the additional medication and the percentages of MAT. Yep. Michael, in terms of Newbridge, how has fentanyl sort of changed your protocols day to day? First, I want to say my heart goes out to Steve. Um, he's helped me with close family members. Um, so he knows I know Steve's how Steve's helped everybody. Yeah, he does. 
And um, I didn't expect you today, so I was like, I know he's here. Um, so my heart goes out to you. Uh, you know, I've heard, I was going to say game changer, like it was going to be the first time, and it's like the fourth time I'll say game changer, but what does that mean? And what does that mean to Bergen Newbridge and treatment? Is that all the rules have changed with fentanyl? I know I grew up in an environment when I started this career, it was like, come back when you're ready. And it worked. People really weren't dying. It's like, when you're ready, come back, we'll be here for you. And now it's barrier free access. And another term that I've heard for a long time, but as anybody will tell you that knows me or knows, knows Newbridge, I believe 100% in barrier free access and no wrong door. If you walk in, I don't care what door you walk in at Bergen Newbridge, if you come to get detox and it turns out you don't need detox, then we have short term rehab for you. We have MAT. You heard Dr. Curso before. We, it's a game changer and we, we have changed our rules. Gloria? Uh, and Gloria, so, so Gloria runs a great program in Jersey City, um, most excellent way, and she's grappling with women that many of whom suffer from fentanyl. And so to, to go back to the point that was made earlier, I think by the prosecutor, by Joe and Steve, it's, and, and Frank, it's, it's the wraparound services that you support people with, not just the medication. Right, absolutely. Um, you know, you just, just speak into the mic. I'm sorry. The the question about how fentanyl has altered how I do business, I, I'd like to say that fentanyl is not just the elephant in the room, but it is the urgency of what I do. Um, I house, um, thanks to Frank Mazza, um, male and female ex offenders, and the issue is what's happening to my children at home. And so the effects that uh, fentanyl is having is that it is causing fathers and mothers to wonder, how am I going to save my children? And so to do that, we are raising up fathers and mothers to be peer, to be peer mentors, not peer mentors, but to be mentors for their children. Um, children used to, children, young adults, teens looked for designated drivers. Now they have friends carrying Narcon. That's serious to me. So it, it's understanding the changing world and the prevention. And Steve, you get the award for traveling the furthest. And I just want to say thank you for Hope Sheds Light, which does a great job in the community. Could you just share a little bit for us Yankees, what is Hope Sheds Light? <laughs> yes, Governor, thank you. And it's a privilege for me to be here. Hope Sheds Light is a family-focused nonprofit agency. Our mission is to raise awareness and to educate individuals, families, and the community about the impact of addiction by having the courage to share our personal experiences and by offering our wisdom and strength and providing hope and resources that lead to the long-term recovery of the whole family. Yep. And I emphasize family. My son died two months after I started Hope Sheds Light. There are two other founders, Ron Rosetto and Arvo Prima. Ron lost his son first. He said, Steve, can you help me start a nonprofit? I said, what do you have in mind? He asked the question, he said, Steve, did you have any idea what you were doing as a, you know, as a dad, as a parent, when your son was in the throes of his addiction? My journey with addiction is 27 years, okay? At age 13, my son changed. He went from this beautiful, loving boy to one who was using, breaking up my stuff, stealing things. He became a criminal on paper, but he wasn't, right? He was a sick guy. Nothing I did as a father worked all of a sudden. It was the scariest thing I've ever been through. Scariest thing for Ron. Arvo, the other founder, his son Pavo was still alive at that point. None of us knew what we were doing, so the first idea of hope was to develop a resource guide. Inpatients, outpatients, support groups, all of you good people, so that we could help people get into treatment. And then I said, well, we also need a helpline. So we developed a helpline because I want to make a connection with people right away when they need help. We don't do therapy. We do support. What we do is love. That's what we do, based on experience, okay? The helpline, and that was our original idea, and then I wonder, well, what happens with these blessed people, our kids, when they go into a program, what, what happens then? So we provide support, access, and financial support for people getting into sober living. We now have two recovery centers, one in Toms River and one in, um, you know, Monmouth County now with the help of some really, really wonderful people. And we provide all kinds of activities there, academic and vocational training and, you know, um, wellness workshops. But we have, and it's so important to me that we have family support groups. 
We have a combination, Governor, of families that come to my weekly meetings that have no idea what they're doing, that are concerned about their loved ones who are using yep. fentanyl. Are they going to die, Steve? You know, maybe. But you know what I needed to learn? I needed to learn to be well, whether or not my son was ever going to get well. Does that make sense? And that's what we share at Hope Shares Light. That's what, that's what we help to teach, to share what works and what doesn't work, to love along the way. Um, we have weekly grief and bereavement meetings also for those that have lost a loved one. It's crazy enough when we're going through this and our kids survive, right? How bad is it when they die on us, right? So we get to love them through that. So it's, um, that's really what hope is. It's, 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 a, it, it's peer recovery support. We actually train peer recovery specialists too. So we have people working on our helpline. We have individual yeah. peer recovery specialists and those working for the family because I had no idea what I was doing early on, and with God's grace, I got help from people as smart as you. And it's my privilege to kind of elevate my son's life, to celebrate his life through the service of other people. That's what hope is. Amen. Thank you. So, <laughs> I just want to ask Frank to connect the dots. We have Dr. Anazette and Phil talking about, very honestly and candidly, about the challenges of addiction in the jail, all the things that the jail's dealing with, including mental health, mental illness, et cetera. Talk about the prosecutor saying that there was this exponential rise in, in fentanyl. Talk about Steve saying, I'm walking over bodies. Brad saying, you know, that what is the greater picture? Marguerite talking about how do we keep people in treatment? Michael echoing that we'll move doors move opportunities, Gloria talking about the women and the men that are being provided that we need to be care. And Steve saying, look, I did the best I could, I offered hope. So if we were gonna create, and I've gotta ask my dear friend, um, James over here, um, but Frank, if we were gonna develop a system that integrates the great stuff that, that Phil and Dr. Anazette are doing with law enforcement, with treatment providers and people like Steve, how would it look like as a construct? Well, how would it work? Well, so when you're talking about people coming out of jail, uh, people with addictions and mental health issues, you're talking about people that have needs across all domains, right? Clinical, housing, case management, anything you can think of, they have needs. And the pieces of the puzzle exist in every jurisdiction. They're there. Uh, the problem is the system's disjointed, right? So housing dollars exist in various pots of, uh, pots of nonprofits, governments. Clinical service providers are all competing for the same dollars. They get funded from different streams, so they're providing very similar services. <clears throat> what the system needs is an organization that just holds accountable all of these systems of care, right? So in Hudson County, our reentry program started with the understanding that we are not the provider of any specific service. All we are is a conductor of systems. We get a person, we develop an understanding of what their needs are, what systems they should be tapped into, and then most important, we hold those systems accountable. Even out of the jail, the jail is holding housing systems accountable, the jail is holding clinical systems accountable outside of their walls. And we're trusting that the tools that exist in this room and on this panel are gonna do their jobs. So if you were to design, if you were czar of addiction in the state of New Jersey, yeah. how would you, how, how would you, how, how would you connect, if you will, take out all the, take out housing for a second, take out unemployment, but how would you just connect the acute care facilities the jails, the treatment providers, and organizations like Hope Sheds Light, how would you connect them regionally? You would, you would have to connect them through a stakeholders board, right? You would have to do an assessment of the area. It would have to be local because each local area has different tools. And then you would have to build a board that compromises all of the systems of care. And then at the head of that board would be and we've seen it happen in, in, in other places in accountable care organizations. Yeah. yeah. And, and these accountable care organizations, you know, you, you talked about Medicaid and the, and the insurance stuff before. And, and the reason why uh, these insurance companies become difficult to deal with is because this population all have chronic health issues. <clears throat> and they all use the emergency room 
as their primary care facility and they only use it when they're in crisis, which is an incredibly expensive way to treat, and it's very unhealthy to treat things like diabetes and heart disease. Now, if you had a panel with a federally qualified healthcare center, a housing provider, and, and the emergency room, you could give somebody health insurance by introducing the Medicaid office, then you can teach them how to use that health insurance, and then you can tap them into the primary health care facilities, and then you can make sure that they're routinely checking into those primary health care facilities. And what you will do is you will drive down the cost of delivering health care to that person, and you will increase the efficacy of that health care. And then the insurance companies might turn around and say, <clears throat> you're driving down the cost of providing health care to a large group of people that are costing us more than we thought, Maybe we can work out a way where you take a percentage of that savings and that can fund this system. Uh, and then whoever's at that board takes a piece of that funding, right? The housing network says, okay, we need to fund X amount of units per month. At the end of every year, we want to take that money out. Uh, the government says, we want to be reimbursed for our staff that's delivering Medicaid. Someone like Gloria wants to be reimbursed for her case management services or driving clients places. <clears throat> The government or whoever is holding accountable these systems needs to understand that it's a public-private partnership and that within this public-private partnership, they need to make sure that everybody's working together and that we are achieving uh, and holding accountable the various systems of care. And I think, you know, I don't think there's a magic wand here. I think it's, it's just, that it's just the organization. So, Phil, can you talk a little bit about the challenge between addiction, and then we'll go to James, addiction and mental health and the behavior behind the wall. I, I mean, Doc, I think a lot of our mental health issues are originally, concurrent. yeah, con concurrent with our with our drug abuse and and um, our drug issues within the facility. But we, again, you know, one of the big things that the task force, and, and again, I want to thank the governor for 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 helping lead the charge that we see is that we have a big mental health issue in the jail, a big drug issue in the jail and we need to do more to get those people out of the jail into hospitals into into facilities that can treat them more effectively and i think you know we, we are looking at either you know getting the state involved and helping us build something convert something we have some opportunities i know that the doctor has looked at some stuff within essex county but these people really are not being helped and not the, the, the issues that they have are not being addressed at the So, so the, the most basic point that you're making is if that somebody's one, there's the danger of people that are mentally ill engaging with those that are violent behavior, and that nexus is nothing but toxic, right? Because at the, the highest level. Yeah, at the highest level, because the person who's violent has no understanding of the mental illness of the person who's confronting them, and that's a toxic situation. But it's also your point is is that so then we have to put them into single cells, uh, yep. disciplinary cells, and I think their mental health issues get worse, yes. not better. So the irony is by trying to address their legitimate protecting them. mental health, exactly by protecting them, you're looking at special housing. Ironically, you're exacerbating the exact thing that you're trying to address. So the, but the point you're making is a really basic and important one, is that jails are not the place to provide healing for mental illness. Right? A absolutely. absolutely not. Nor we are not equipped for it. We are, but as the doctor said, we are the largest mental health hospital in the state, and we're the largest drug addiction uh, uh, rehab program in the state. It doesn't make sense. Does anybody want to respond to that? I, I, I will tell you this: that the mental health issue has never been handled right in this country, and especially in this state. It's pretty clear. And the law enforcement, from my standpoint, what really needs to happen is that we need to move upstream. And what, what I tried to do was put the, the psychiatric evaluators into the police departments. They would train the police department so that when, when they come across these individuals, you actually divert them from the, uh, from the hospital and you actually divert them from, uh, from going to jail. And if we put them upstream and we get and we capture them a little bit first and then we can then put them in, into the right facility, we'd be better off. So to me, what we really but need- But that doesn't traditionally happen. What traditionally happens is they go through Dr. Anaset's facility, and then Dr. Anaset is trying to grapple with mental illness, he's trying to grapple with addiction, but they're not getting to Marguerite until after they've been sentenced. And it's not cost-effective at all. 
or a diversionary program, exactly. So what the, the, there doesn't seem to be an integrated evaluation that will determine what is in the best interest, where somebody can get the best healing in the best location. So I, I think it's just as simple as there's a gap in, there's just a limited amount of mental health care, right? So I meet with frontline law enforcement all the time and frontline law enforcement says to me, we would love to use our discretion. We would love not to take the person to the jail. I mean, this population lives in communities that have a high police presence. They're symptomatic. They're not on medications. They're using, so they're high, and they bump up against frontline law enforcement. Now, that's a bad interaction because of all of those variables in combination. And the cop has to remove the person for public safety from the community and says, I would love to take them anywhere but the jail, but I have no place to take them, right? That's why the jail becomes the de facto residential hospital, because there are no clinical options. That happens as a result of things like deinstitutionalization. And so then, or they go to, go ahead, Marguerite. So, so for my organization, we've seen such a need for um, mental health providers. I have, um, we increased, we hired three additional psychiatric APNs, and we have every person who walks through the door is, is having a psychiatric, psychiatric evaluation. Um, so we worked really, really hard also in our other locations, in our outpatient, our halfway, really providing those um, mental health services as long as um, well as MAT services for um, all our individuals, because we see the need um, for that so much. Yeah, but the reality is to go to back to what Frank said and what Dr. Anna said, Phil said, is that if somebody's walking into Essex County Jail at two o'clock in the morning, at two o'clock a.m., and you know they do a basic test to determine someone's mental health acuity, and they determine somebody's at risk or decompose the challenge is where does that to go to frank's point where does that person go and then in addition to that mindful of public security and safety what are the options and then the other problem is also financing because if the person stays within the jail the county pays the entirety of the cost if a person is sent to a facility a mental health facility that's not related to the jail then cms pays the federal government can pay the cost and then um, even on the addiction side where there is no psychiatric illness, so you have your co-occurring, you know, people are using and you have some that are just really addictions. The irony is in this epidemic, people still don't know how to get care. I get calls all the time. He wants help. She wants help. I don't know what to do. So there needs to be education. And I talked about barriers. You see the admission to jail is kind of easy. You know, you just get arrested and you go there. We, we need people to know more about how I mean, the barriers have to be taken down. The stigma has to go away. So Michael talks about the barrier stigma, but there's also the challenge of what happens and to go to back to what Frank said and what happens in terms of mental health and addiction treatment if the jail is in the right place. So if the jail is in the right place, drug court does provide, drug court must refer people to Steve, to Turning Point, must refer people to... to to, to Damon House must refer people to the Hollow or to 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 you know to New Hope. So what? So the question is that drug court could it ever happen outside of drug court? Could it ever happen that a judge makes the decision that when Jim McGreevy is arrested, he comes in and based on a a diagnostic test, you know, maybe he's not most appropriately here. Maybe he should be at turning point, or it should be at New Hope, or it should be at the ABC facility. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Or or maybe you accept the reality of the situation, right? The jail is a healthcare facility. I mean, we can sit around and wait for the clinical world to sort of build out these services, and we open our doors and let people into this sort of ideal situation. Or the jails can sort of understand that 75 to 80% of their inhabitants have these mental health and addiction needs. They are the most in common treatment provider, and they start redefining what they are. For example, in Hudson County, uh, we are the largest residential treatment facility. I mean, we're, we're DMOS certified, level 3.5 care, 240 beds in a dorm-like facility that meets all the regulations. 
we understand that everybody that walks in our walls is not appropriate for that, that there is a reason for jail, there's a punitive reason, and there are people that fall into that. But maybe if jails start understanding that this is what they are and they start altering themselves. Uh, so who pays for that, though, Frank? <clears throat> Okay, so the county has to pay for it. The county who runs the jail has to pay for it. That's like, and I'm like, God bless you. What I'm saying is, is that fair that if you step up to provide treatment, somebody should, you should be rewarded for doing a good thing. I, I agree, and I don't want to get into an argument, but no, no. who's paying for the system outside of the jail? I don't see a line of people lining up right now looking to fund residential hospitals for mental yeah. health and addiction services in the community. I think that's the way to go. But in the meantime, that this is the four corners of reality. This is yep. what it looks no, like. I appreciate your candor. But something is definitely backwards there. If we're, I agree with Frank, but uh, what we're saying basically is the addition criteria for treatment is incarceration and getting arrested. Yep. So. Bill? I, I think, um, Doc, can you hit the mic? Thanks. The, the, I mean, Frank hits the, so many points. I mean, frankly, many of the stakeholders that should be sitting at the table are not sitting at the table. Uh, CMS is not sitting here at the table. Um, well, the federal, federal government wants to duck as long as they can because they don't want to pick up the tab. I know, but see, if you don't have a lobbyist, you're usually out of the running. So it makes tend not to have lobbyists. So um, when the laws were designed in 1965 and CMS, yep. they were purposely excluded. So if an inmate gets arrested and he's incarcerated, shortly after it's reported to the system and his Medicaid is suspended. Now it needs to be reactivated. I for one feel we need more social workers in the system. The social workers actually are the ones that, as Frank is outlining, can create the bridge between all these different entities. Because frankly, we have jobs that are very compartmentalized. Like we have, I have a job and the uh, psychiatrist has a job, but who actually negotiates in between all of these other the spaces. spaces. To, to create these, so I just you know, want to spaces. jump back to Steve. So Steve, if, if you're looking at this in the real world and you're you're providing these help to these families and you're doing grief counseling, what do they want to see? Well, they want to see their loved one as well. That's what they want to see. Yep. They, uh, you know, first and foremost, that's really how most people come to Hope Sheds Light is through their, you know, through their loved one who's sick, right? Um, but they also want to get well themselves. So really what's happening through, you know, through hope is that we're, you know, we talk about recovery every day, as I mentioned, what, what, you know, what it looks like. Um, they're very frustrated with this system, particularly if, if there's mental health and substance abuse, right? Um, I'm also, I'm an attorney by trade is what I do. So I've been I'm through sorry. The, I know. Thank you. <laughs> but I start, I mean, I, changed my whole practice with my son all those years ago, and I started practicing criminal law in a different way, going to judges, and I, I took it upon myself, and I do it every day too, to try to do what the social workers and the doctors and the nurses I, I know should be doing, right? Trying to find out what's behind all of this. The first time I went to the judge, and this was 25 years ago, it was a heroin case, and they said, Mr. Willis, I agree, with you, you know, you know, I'm going to send your client to a substance abuse program. I said, Judge, it, I said, it's not heroin. And he looked at me and I had three heads. He said, what are you talking about? I said, there's anxiety and depression and bipolar and there's anger and resentment. There's all those things that give rise to the use here. I need, Judge, for you to order, if you will, as criminal defense attorney, order my client to get mental health treatment. Can you do that for me? So it started a very different way of practicing law. So what are the families looking for at, you know, through hope? Well, they're looking for some guidance. They're looking for ways to start feeling better. It's so important for us to help families get well. Be what sense does it make if an individual, if their loved one goes to treatment and gets well and the family stays sick, right? Yep. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for saying that. Um, and thank you, Dr. Uh, Anisette. Um, I was a social worker for Family Services for over 30 years before I took an early retirement. I'll be very brief. A six-year-old asked me, um, I was a supervisor, she said, whose fault is it that I'm in foster care? Her parents were incarcerated and could not make the visit. I took an early retirement and created the most excellent way. To this, 
um, as Dr. Anderson is, is saying, we need more social workers. Okay, the system was broke for 30 years, and I'm on a panel today still talking about a sick, broken system. What will it take? Because families are dying, children are dying. What will it take? More conferences, more conversation. It is time for action. Thank you, Governor. Thanks, Gloria. So, you know, I'm trying this, to is, this is my luncheon <laughs> partner, like, you know, <laughs> next time you're buying lunch. Um, but on a serious note, what Gloria is saying is, and, and I think it's been the same discussion, but as I would make an argument from what we heard today, it's probably even gotten worse. Because fentanyl yes. is such a game changer, it's so much faster, so much more toxic, yes. it's so much faster. And then the combined, Phil and Dr. Anazet have been grappling with the whole notion of mental health and addiction and the prison population and people in the prison population now confronting one another, those that are that are mentally ill and those that are violent and those flashpoints. So in the remaining time, I just, you know, and, and I appreciate what Frank said, maybe we just recognize what we have and we deal with it within the financial limitations that we have and, and that's courageous. But is there anything the state could do when I heard, by the way, it's, it's typical Essex County, Frank, when they talk about doing something, I heard them talk about state dollars, but I'm not saying anything. Um, <laughs> Governor Christie used to always say, how early did Joe D call you for his first million? Um, but in any event, but I, on a serious note, so what do you think, what do you think, what do you think we should be doing on a jail by jail basis? And what do you think we should be doing on a regional basis? Uh, Senator Therese uh, Ruiz and Elena talked about, you know, creating a map county by county. But I'd love to hear what we do about the jail, because my sense is, to go back to what Joe said, is that, you know, we, we've got to look further upstream. So what do we what do we do, Doc? Well, well Gov, one, one of the issues that's come up of late, because we had nothing to do during the pandemic, so we started the MAT program. Yep. Um, <laughs> and that was... Because we figured we might as well address the epidemic. And you had, it, you had to employ Pascal. A lot so. of downtime. A lot of downtime. So, but it was funded by the state. Yep. Um, that was the seed that was planted. Yep. And then it grew, it grew and it bloomed into what we have now. So that funding needs to increase. All right. So you increase and, MAT. What do you do about, the, about mental health and MAT? One, one of, one of the um, major moves would be if the Medicaid didn't get suspended when the man got arrested, yep. because technically he's still a President citizen. Biden has actually proposed that in his newest legislation that, to be fair, it would only be resumed one month prior to, to leaving. But so Medicaid would not be in existence during the tenure. So it doesn't do everything, but it. But at least it would cover because then creates the connection. Assigning the case managers to these inmates upon release. Because they can't navigate this system. If we're having a difficult time managing it and we have people and we have the know-how, when they come out of the jail, really, who's going to lead you to those doors? Because I, frankly, have spoken to patients that have called me to say, Doc, I was shamed when I went there. I was ostracized when I went there. I was alienated when I went there. And so a lot of times those are the roadblocks. These are not even financial issues. This is just when the person interacts with whoever the agency they go to how they manage once they leave the facility. And it's a shame when someone's calling to the jail to get more compassion. Well, because the jail's there. The jail's bricks and Well, we're, we're their primary care provider. Yep. James, I, I better call on you because I'll... <laughs> First of all, thank you, Honor, for, uh, Governor, for the, allowing us to be here, Damon House. Um, you know, Damon House, we have MAT. And... You know, being an ASAM 3.5 facility, uh, residential program, it's all about the client-centered collaboration, working on the client meeting the whole need. But also it's about community-centered collaborations and knowing what's out there. And during this pandemic, our outreach at Damon House has greatly increased. Uh, before, people were running the treatment. Now we got to go to them a lot of times and letting them know what's out there. Right. And then having fentanyl test strips and and other things to help them in their journey until they're ready. So Damon House, you know, has been around about 50 years and and we're excited. Right. Oh, sorry. Uh, <laughs> we want to continue to be progressive. Right. Proactive instead of reactive and having the Suboxone, having the methadone. We just added the Vivitrol shot. 
to help them in their journey, but also helping them with their dental, their eyewear, their ID, the holistic client. And then the team of care, as you mentioned, because Damon House is six months now. With treatment, when I started almost 20 years ago, it was 15 to 18 months. So building those collaborations in the community to help them on their journey so they can have long lasting. And I want to leave you with this. The message is always the same, but the methods have to change. We have to change our methods, right? Many of our methods are archaic and people are dying and life is in the balance. Oh, so I have, I have the honor. Um, years ago, we had a grant in, in, uh, uh, in Middlesex County and uh, Eileen Bradley, who's here, uh, my, one of my mentors, allowed us to bring peers into Damon House through a grant. And uh, it was so great, you know, peers uh, are non-clinical. They bridge the gap between uh, the client and you know the, the clinician, and they help them in many different areas. And so we have the opportunity to help them with peer recovery specialists, help them get their you know the hours they need, and help them on their journey to get. And, and this is a, a, a area where your past helps you. Where being a felon, right? I'm 30 years clean, March 20th, 1992, right? Where that helps you, right? You know, where so many things hinder you, your experience helps you in the role, and it's really been beneficial. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. And, and they're doing it at, at our reentry training center, and they're phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. And we've had Senator O'Scanlan come, legislators come and spend time, and it's just so powerful. And it's something that I'd love to do at Essex County Jail at some point is to provide for the opportunity for peer recovery coaching. So the hard thing is on this, and I love what Frank said, it was candid and it was direct. Maybe we just accept what is and change and, 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 and respond to it. But I also think there's a healthy tension with what, what Dr. Anna said and Phil said, maybe we try to look at a different model and maybe it's, we do a couple of things and see what works. So part of that model would look like what, Phil, if you could do anything. If you could have, I think from the MAT program to drug addiction program, there's a lot of stuff we can do in jail. Unfortunately, mental health, it's a lot difficult. We need a hospital setting. Uh, you know, people are fighting for months to get patients into, into Ann Klein. And, um, you know, we have inmates decompensating, if that's the right word. And, and uh, so someone will come out and inspect the, the inmate to see if they're eligible to come to Ann Klein. Well, you know, if we clean the cell and we, may, you know, and, 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 and we afford them an appropriate and what they deserve setting, they come and say, oh, they're, they're, they're okay, they can stay here, they don't meet the criteria. So our officers, you know, so it's almost better to have them smear stuff on their, in their walls and all that before the inspection so that they can get moved up the list to go to Ann Klein, which doesn't make sense. So I think from the mental health perspective, the hospital setting, we need to, you know, that we need to have more Ann Klein's, there needs to be more beds available. I think a lot of stuff we can do in-house, but I do think the mental, the severe mental health stuff, it's very difficult to do inside. Yeah, no, and I, I've been stopping, I see on the doctor's wall, how many patients are waiting to get into Ancline, what the backlog is, is between 18 and 16, it goes back and forth. So it's on... That's, just for, that's, that's great. Just, that's just for our facility. Yeah. And then the entire state, including the state correction system, is, is trying to send people to Ann Klein. So we've made great progress on addiction treatment. I mean, I know what Frank has done and, and, and Hudson, what you've done in Essex, but mental health, your, your point is it's something different and it's a different environment and it needs a different venue. Is that it? Okay. Joe, just on, on and I'm sorry, Dr. Anna said, is there anything else you wanted to? It's just that I wanted to also acknowledge the many community providers that are partnering up with the jails, they're going out of their way now to go to jails. There's many of the providers that are sitting right here. Yep. And they're willing to stretch out their grassroots. A lot of them motivated by some of the same motivations well, people we have. Steve have, yeah. And they're doing what ordinary people wouldn't do. Yeah. Just, they're stretching and they're reaching out. So Sense of it's ministry. great to see that. And right now with Essex, we have over 21 partners. There's other counties in Monmouth and Middlesex. Yep. They're out there, and it's great to see that these folks are not giving up the fight and not leaving even one man behind. Yep, that's what Gloria. So, Joe, in terms of law enforcement, so you were an Ocean County prosecutor for a long period of time. What more should, and it goes back to what Marguerite said earlier, what should law enforcement be doing? 
Well, again, the, my sorry. sympathy goes out because it does look like to me that the, the jails have become, for lack of better words, the dumping ground. And also it looks like the hospitals become the dumping ground. And I'm telling you, in my opinion, we need to, as I would say, capture these people upstream, get them before they're into that system, divert them from those systems. It makes more more sense financially and it makes more sense, more sense for just for those. And how would you identify those people upstream? Well, that's why I was saying if we move it into because the police, usually law enforcement is the first people to kind of stumble across these people on an everyday basis. They need to be trained better to understand how to when they come across this individual that there's a problem here. And then also, if you put these PEZ individuals in the police department a little bit, they'll help the police. Plus, then they can go. Those individuals can go out to the homes. So police being part of the mental health and addiction. Right. What they need to do is understand law enforcement needs to adapt and change. Okay. And as a result, they'll make a difference. So, Steve, and by the way, if anybody ever goes to Turning Point, Steve Delval will buy you the best Dunkin' Donuts in the world. <laughs> um, Steve, so on the ground, and I, I, it was really painful. I was there with you a couple weekends, and I saw you turning people away. It was like the most painful thing in the world. People who had COVID, you were turning away. like, like Yeah, that, that COVID set us back to, tremendously. And even, you know, uh, I... I tell everybody, I've been in recovery for 34 years, and the first thing I was told um, when I got out of the last rehab I was in, I was in many, I was in a state prison system. You know, I did I did everything but die out there, you know, and uh, first thing I was told was to connect with other recovering people, you know, go to meetings, or connect with people, and uh, maybe I stand a chance, you know. And I've done that, and my life has really gotten good. And uh, unfortunately, when COVID came around, I couldn't tell people that anymore, that we're leaving. I'd go outside, and I'd say, what are your plans? Or, well, I'm going to go on some Zooms. And they didn't have the connection like I had. Yeah. And, you know, and I felt, I felt terrible about that. And Michael brought up something before. I used to say to people, uh, you, know, uh, you know, call me when you hit bottom. Today, bottom is death. There's no, you know, people are, are dying left and right. And I get the calls. I get the calls from the families. I get the calls from uh, people that need help. And it's just heartbreaking to me because the governor will tell you, I, I love what I do. Oh. <laughs> and it's really not, it's not uh, work for me because when I'm helping somebody else, I'm really helping myself. Not too long ago, I went to a funeral for a young girl who died of an overdose, and her baby was crawling around the apartment. And it was so sad for me to go kneel down in front of that coffin. And while I was at that coffin, people came up to me and said, you know, 10 years ago, you gave me a bed, and I'm still sober today. Five years ago, you like I had so many, I I was at a funeral feeling good, you know, because of the, 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 you know, every, if, if I get through to one person, it, especially now, because it is it is really difficult now. I mean, we have groups, and the, the guy, guy asked me a question. He says, uh, I heard that one in 35 make it. I said, well, yeah, well, you be the one, right? I mean, uh, and that, I feel that I was the one. So, you know, I thank God for Turning Point and, and Newbridge Medical Centers. Without them, I would be, because I, I have people, you know, we yeah. ask questions like. You do great work. We have, we ask questions, do you have any open wounds or, no, no, I mean, you know, no. They get there, they got bullet holes, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like their fingers hanging off because of, you know, diabetes. And I call my, you know, they take no question. I send them right over to Michael and Michael helps because my goal is to try to help. Those are only Italians from St. Lucie. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Can we give a round of applause for great Steve? <laughs> Brad? Um, I really, um, I love what somebody was saying about stigma. I don't know who that was, but Michael. I think it's really important because we talk about drug court and Judge Sampson in Atlantic City and Joey Gigoli have been changing some of the court systems where it's become recovery court. 
Yes. And I think that's really, really powerful to remember about this is a disease, you know. And, and I think what also what I love what Steve was saying is that the clients that we work with and something that for me, no offense to anybody, but three or four years isn't long term sobriety. Yeah. That's just barely scratching the surface and to really get clients to understand this is long term treatment, it's life long term. And, and this is going to take some time. And also what was Steve was saying is. Everybody that comes in, there is something you have to get, maybe get rid of, right? Because we're always trying to attain something. Addiction's about trying to let go of something. And he said it, it's connection. Sometimes I have to see what am I really connected to. Yeah. But in recovery, what the people we start to work with is they're always trying to get something. I keep stressing to them, like Steve was saying, I had to learn to give something. Once I can get them to start to give something back, they start to get the gold themselves because all of us are working, we're helping, doing things, but a lot of this we're doing for ourselves, right? And it's really important to get those clients to get to that place to go, you have something to give, you have some value. They have to do something, they have to do some actions to get some self-esteem back. So. Thank you. Thank you for that because it's better to give than to receive. Frank? So if I had a magic wand, I think ideally as Bail reform is hit and the census has dropped local jails numbers. Yeah. You know, it's going to move to regionalization. There's not going to be as many correctional facilities. And the ones that empty out, I'd like to see them repurposed. And then we sort of create a system that's dual tracked. We have yep. the system that takes into account the individual needs of the person. The system, the facilities that are repurposed shouldn't be correctional facilities because you're allowed to allow Medicaid into these. They should yep. be run by uh, private clinical operations and held accountable by the government and uh, funded through federal Medicaid and other uh, health insurance. I think that's Great. the direction to go. Smart. Thanks. Marguerite? Um, first of all, thank you for having me. It's really um, an honor to be here and it's um, Treating this population is definitely a passion of mine. Um, you know, just, I just apologize for you having to sit next to Michael, but I mean, <laughs> we tried. To switch over. Um, and like somebody else had said, uh, social workers. I think it's important if if we did have more um, social workers and navigators. Um, specifically in my organization, because like a lot of people had discussed, we work on their um, medical, their um, psychiatric yep. conditions. And so it's really hard. We want to, they have all these barriers, which include housing and so many different things. And sometimes you can't talk to an individual when they have nowhere to go. What did you think about the facility license discussion in the last panel that Deborah Wentz brought up? Um, I don't know if you heard it. That's okay. I, I'm not sure if I did hear it. Okay. <laughs> but it's interesting. She said, you know, you have a license for A, B, C, D, or E. She said you should have a facility license that provides more flexibility for the institution to, to serve those needs. Right. Thank you, Marguerite. Michael? So, uh, James followed up with stigma. And I think, um, yeah, I want to say that it's gotten better, but, like, it hasn't. I mean, there's still so much stigma with this population. And um, I mean, I just look at our waiting room in the morning. All right. It looks like a college classroom. And I'm sure if I asked any of them when they were 15, like, what would you like to do when you grow up? Nobody would have said, I'd like to try that detox over at Bergen. I mean, it's just not what they planned on doing. It is a disease. All right. And um, nobody's ever accused me. Well, the governor hasn't been dramatic, but look at all the miracles just in this room today. All right. I mean, you know, there's... Unfortunately, people are dying, but there's also miracles that are here today. And I think it's very important that we see, that I see everybody walking in that door as a potential miracle. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Our mantra Reverend is miracles Gloria? do happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I won't be a preacher today, but um, I'm still um, stuck on family. Our facility is a family reunification um, facility. That's my pet peeve. And someone made mention of the connectivity for three years. Um, I, although I had a home, I lived at the facility because I needed to know not what I learned in college, but I needed to know what those that had endured the system really needed. And so, if I could, as Frank said, if I had a wand, it would be more housing and more family reunification um, and more of an integrated 
um, continuum of care so that families can heal as opposed to individuals. We divide families by treating one part of the family. Thank you. Thanks for, uh, and Stephen, thank you for, when I hear you and I hear Steve, I just, thank you for your strength and thank you for your hope. Well, Governor, thank you. It's, I mean, it's a privilege to be here. And uh, my blessing, there are so many, but I'm, I'm surrounded by a large group of people through hope that believe that, they, that we don't, you know, we don't have to do this. Mm -hmm. We get to do it. And there's a difference, right? And if we can spend time encouraging individuals and encouraging family members to change, then miracles absolutely do happen. And it's worth doing every day. So thanks for letting me share. Thank you. And before we depart, I ask Reverend Flores to, uh, we're sort of old fashioned, which is what I like. Um, so we, we pray both in the morning and we pray at night and it's just, it's just lifting everyone up, lifting everyone up on this dais. And I really want to thank from, from Phil to Steve. Thank you very much. And thank you for all of you. This was incredible. Um, and basically what we're going to do, yeah, thank you. Look at my friend in the back. She's got her fancy glasses on. But, but what we're going to do is we're going to provide a framework of what the results are for each panel. And we'll write that out, and we're going to send that back to you, and we're going to send that also back to the legislators. And we're going to ask, before we send it to the legislators for a final copy, we'll just ask people for their feedback. So if there's something that, you know, I didn't include or whatever. So, um, and with that, um, I'd ask Reverend to lead us out in prayer. Thank you. I, I want to do an evangelical prayer, but Lacey say only have one minute. So let's do a quick prayer. Lord, thank you. Thank you for for today. Thank you for bringing uh, the legislator to bring the expert in this topic. And thank you for giving to us the wisdom for we can fight this demon in the state of New Jersey. We prayed and you need and we ask to you to continue open door for the New Jersey Reentry Corporation. Uh, continue fire and eliminate this barrier for brothers and sisters who return from prison and jail. And jail. In the name of our Lord, we pray. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.